In the beginning, the Elder Worm created the world of Outramond. She looked at the darkness and said, let there be light, and when the time came for her to return to the stars, she entrusted the world to her children. Our dragon proudly proclaimed that dragons represent scaled perfection. They created the world for their pleasure no matter what their rivals, the fairy lord of the farmers, may claim. For centuries, the victorious Nightsbane has stood at the apex of the world. Vancure hunted princesses, devoured countless knights, and accumulated the greatest horde the world has ever seen. When the time came for him to hibernate, he retreated to his hidden lair in the Albane Mountains, leaving his trusted goblin minions to keep watch during his year-long nap. However, he did not anticipate the extent to which the world of Outramond would change during his sleep. Years later, he was awakened by a rustling sound. Rising and yawning, he mused that there was nothing quite like resting on the spoils of victory after a grand feast. He had not slept so well in centuries. But then, he heard the clink of falling gold and turned to see a human hiding nearby. The man trembled in fear upon seeing him. After a moment's pause, Vancouver recognized the intruder as a human and shouted in anger, accusing him of being a thief. He expelled a burst of fire at the man, who managed to evade it just in time. Vancouver then swung his tail and pinned the man to the wall. Mockingly, he told the man that after 50 years of hibernation, it seemed everyone had forgotten the natural order of things. He addressed the man as his next meal and asked for his name. The man, surprised, asked Vancouver if he could speak. To this, Vancouver responded in the affirmative, adding that he sometimes talked to his breakfast. He demanded the man's name, the man introduced himself as Victor. Vancouver then introduced himself as Vancouver Knightsbane, explaining that his name signified the great calamity of the age and king of the Albane Mountains. However, he permitted Victor to address him as his majesty. He added that his majesty was always italicized, and he could tell the difference. Victor swore it was an honest mistake, but Vancouver doubted this, asking Victor why he thought stealing from him was a good idea. Victor pointed to a rapier and explained that he had been hired to retrieve it, as it was thought to have been lost. Vancouver accused Victor of lying, asserting that Victor must have fought his way through a horde of goblin minions to get there. Victor countered that there had been no goblin activity in the mountains for decades. Vancouver fell silent at this, lifting his head to check for his goblins, surveying his surroundings. Finding no trace of his minions, he became irate, accusing the goblins of cowardice for deserting him while he slept. Vancouver then turned to Victor and asked if he had any minions. Victor confessed that he was once part of an adventuring party, but it hadn't worked out. He claimed he was the only professional with ambitions beyond petty theft. Vancouver expressed agreement, noting the difficulty of finding competent help, advising Victor never to hire goblins. He offered to spare Victor from this mistake. As he was about to toss Victor into his mouth, Victor panicked and warned Vancouver that others would come if he were killed, and no one knew he lived in these mountains. Vancouver responded ominously, promising that they would find out once he set the countryside ablaze. Then, he asked Victor who sent him, because he was curious, and told him that he would eat them after he finished with him. Victor replied that he didn't know and that it was an anonymous request from the local guild hall. The reward was 1,000 gold coins for that rapier. Vancouver told Victor that it was a handsome sum for such a dirty deed. Victor agreed but explained that he primarily took the job for the challenge because he thought he would gain a few levels from it, and maybe even a special perk from the climb. Vancouver, confused, asked if a level was some type of food. Victor explained that levels were powers he gained in classes like Knight, Wizard, or Outlaw, and they granted him additional abilities called perks. He said he gained levels through work, experience, or by defeating enemies. Vancouver told Victor he could not even begin to fathom the number of thieves he had slain and that he had never received any of those levels. Victor replied that perhaps he just didn't know. Suddenly, Vancouver heard a system sound which startled him. The system then popped up, congratulating him for his sheer ego and noble dragon bloodline. It also showed that he had gained a level in the noble class and the old money class perk, which meant double the chance of monsters dropping treasure upon death. Focusing on the old money, Vancouver asked Victor if he self-identified as a monster. Victor replied no. Vancouver sighed in sadness and set Victor on the ground. He then instructed him to return the rapier to its original place and stated that he would personally escort him to the guild hall, so he could see the request for himself. Victor returned the rapier as Vancouver informed him that, as he was short on goblins, Victor would be his new minion until he repaid his life debt. Victor, shocked, protested that he was wholly unsuited for the role. Yet, Vancouver fixed him with a firm gaze and reminded him that he was a dragon, and Victor was now his minion. Victor, seeing many human bones strewn about, fearfully replied that it was a great honor. Vancouver told him that it was very good and that there was a great reward in doing as he wished because any other dragon would have eaten him for his sinful crime and would never have accepted a human into their service, but he was forgiving and merciful. Victor told Vancouver that it was very generous of him, to which he replied that he knew. He then walked towards the exit, causing Victor to sigh in relief. They stopped at the cage's exit and looked outside. 
Vanker ordered Victor to tell him more about those perks. Then, they proceeded to walk out of the cave. The man's name is Victor Dalton. He has been trapped in that fantasy world for two years. When he left the village of Valbin for the mountain, he vowed to return victorious or not at all. But things didn't go as planned. Victor told Vancouver he should venture alone because the city watch had already sounded the alarm at his presence. He pleaded with Vancouver to let him descend, swearing he wouldn't stray too far. Vancouver, however, insisted that a king must show his face to his subjects, so they may remember who rules them. This made Victor worry that soon, his stomach contents might be on display for his subjects too. In the tower, the city watch aimed their weapons at them. The captain ordered everyone to target the dragon and put everything into their shots. They attacked Vancouver, but he simply asked Victor where the guild hall was. Victor pointed out the bell building. With ease, Vancouver slammed his body into the barrier wall to demolish it, then proceeded to fly towards the guild hall while carrying Victor, inciting panic amongst the populace. Vancouver landed on the ground, throwing nearby people aside. He then asked Victor to confirm whether the building they were standing in front of was the guild hall. On his agreement, Vancouver strode towards the building and broke the door to fit himself inside, shocking the inhabitants. A woman at the reception desk asked Victor if it was him, and others questioned whether he had brought a dragon. He remained silent, and Vancouver simply asked the crowd to point out the least expendable among them. A man pointed his spear at Vancouver, teasing Victor about being afraid of a flying lizard. However, this bravado was short-lived as he was soon thrown into the wall. Vancouver sarcastically inquired how their species had avoided extinction so far, as he would never understand. This caused the room to fall silent. Victor mused that he should have kept his expectations in check. Vancouver then threatened to exterminate them all, causing the crowd to flee in fear. They couldn't believe that Victor had abandoned them, especially when they had once considered him a friend. Vancouver then faced Victor and the woman, ordering Victor to do the thing. Victor addressed the woman as Charlene and asked if she was still free on Friday night. However, Charlene could only exclaim about the presence of a dragon in her guild hall. Victor introduced her to King Vancouver Nightspan. She was incredulous that Victor had brought the Red Terror of Midgard, an ancient red dragon, to their village. Victor corrected her by saying that technically, it was Vancouver who had brought him. Vancouver asked Victor who the female manling was and why they needed her. Victor explained that Charlene was the chief of staff at the guild hall and urged her to tell the giant, angry dragon about her role before he decided to eat them. Gathering herself, Charlene informed Vancouver that she managed paperwork on behalf of the Gardamagni Adventure Guild. She received requests from clients and distributed them to adventurers. Vancouver ordered Victor to tell Charlene to read the requests that led him to his domain. Upon hearing this, Victor asked him if he ever spoke to other humans. He replied no and explained that communicating with animals is what a minion is for, which greatly irritated Charlene. She angrily grabbed the quest from the board, while Vancouver asked Victor what the message entailed. She relayed that Louise Marquise de Caravas was offering 1,000 gold coins for the return of her family's lost rapier, last reported in the possession of the Albane Mountain Goblins. Vancouver told Victor that his words seemed truthful, so he would be spared. He added that Charlene too would be spared, if she could inform him where to find the Marquise, as he intended to eat her. This made Victor think that things could only end badly. Charlene responded that they should just leave, then she ordered Victor to hand over his map. She snatched the map from Victor, who was then tasked by Vancouver to explain how it works. Victor explained that nobles, merchants, or groups of peasants send requests to the Adventurers Guild, along with proposed rewards. Since the end of the Century War, most of these tasks involved dealing with monsters or brigands. She added that there were once lucrative requests to take him down years ago, but those stopped when he was declared dead. Vancouver was furious and asked Charlene why he had been declared dead. She explained that a group of adventurers had brought in a red dragon's skull 20 years prior, declaring it was his. He was outraged by this indignity and ordered Victor to inform his primitive species that he, Vancouver Nightspan, was very much alive. This made Victor panic, though he assured Vancouver that the news would spread quickly once he showed a bit of force. Vancouver calmed down and asked Victor about the types of quests an adventurer might receive. Victor, in turn, asked Charlene to read a few quests for their majesty's benefit. She read that trolls had sacked the lands of the Count of Provencal and were currently hiding in the woods of Jevodden. The Count was offering a handsome reward for the extermination of these creatures. This made Vancouver inquire whether he could earn levels for completing such a task. Charlene was taken aback to hear that Vancouver knew about levels. Victor explained that Vancouver had leveled up in the noble class, which left her even more surprised to learn that a dragon could level up. 
He explained that Victor had recently informed him about the existence of this system, and he wanted to know how much humans would get paid for such a quest. Charlene, who was glaring at Victor, replied that the reward was 6,000 gold coins. This prompted Vancouver to ask if he would really receive that much for simply eating trolls. Charlene clarified that it was considered a difficult quest and they would be facing Predanian war trolls. There was a moment of silence, then Vancouver laughed heartily, asking if they were really scared of trolls, which he considered just a snack. He declared that mammals were so weak. Victor responded by suggesting that if it was so easy for him, he should consider an adventuring career and show them how it's done. He contemplated the 6,000 coins for something he usually did for free and questioned if it was the most well-paid request, leaving Victor stunned that he was actually considering it. Charlene informed him that killing the Massaline Kraken would earn 64,000 coins, his pupils morphing into gold coins in shock. Then, he informed Victor of his intent to raise the village to the ground as retribution for their crimes against his royal person. However, he declared that the unclaimed wealth was an even greater crime. He, Banker the Dragon, was ready to solve the problems of the inferior species in exchange for their coins. Upon hearing this, Charlene panicked, expressing her doubt that a dragon could become an adventurer. He confidently reassured her that he was more than qualified. She attempted to reason with him, but he firmly insisted that he was a dragon, and now an adventurer. Furthermore, he warned her that she was beginning to sound like potential prey. To this, she responded that she would register them as a new adventuring company, and that they would need to complete and sign certain forms. He called for Victor, who promptly asked why. He explained that he was officially promoting Victor to the position of his chief of staff and living signature. Victor was to manage the paperwork on his behalf. He assured Victor it was an important responsibility, but he was confident that Victor would handle it well. A system notification then appeared before Victor, indicating that he had leveled up to Monster Squire and Monster Kin. This meant that he could communicate with and understand any monster, and had gained a charisma bonus of plus 20 when interacting with them. He showed the paper with the letters V and V to Charlene, asking if it was a joke or if there was a better option. But Charlene simply pointed to the broken door, causing him to realize that their Friday date was no longer a possibility. He asked Victor for an explanation, but Victor dismissed it as nothing. Charlene expressed to Victor her wish for him to go to hell, although she suspected he was already there. And thus, Vancouver became the first dragon adventurer, leaving Victor to ponder what could possibly go wrong. Later, they were flying in mid-air when he asked Victor what is a lead adventure plate, and mentioned that lead is degrading. Victor replied that every adventurer starts with a lead plate, adding that he had a lead plate too. However, he reminded Victor that Victor was a human and he was a dragon. Nonetheless, Victor informed him that he was a unique case and pleaded for him to forgive his species. A moment later, they arrived at the tribe. He asked Victor if these were the troll woods. Victor confirmed and explained to him that war trolls usually establish camps when they search for one. But he interrupted Victor, stating he would not sully his distinguished scales with troll dung and reminded him yet again that he was a dragon. Then, he gathered his firepower, causing Victor to panic and yell at him to wait. Meanwhile, in the forest, a lady was sitting down, picking flowers. She placed the flower in a basket next to a dead troll's head and a huge knife. Suddenly, she heard something in mid-air. She stood up, turned around, and was amazed to see falling leaves and a shining red light. On his part, he attacked the trolls in the forest with his fire, leading Victor to question what he was doing and telling him it was not eco-friendly at all. The lady, who had been drugged by a man, screamed upon seeing Vancouver in mid-air. On the other hand, he was proudly telling Victor that the troll problem was resolved. Victor complained that he had set the forest on fire, to which he confidently agreed. The trolls were burnt to death and the others tried to escape. Victor commented that it was so one-sided it hurt to watch. But he reminded Victor that he was a dragon and that was what dragons do. He suggested that Victor should pray to him since he sometimes even answers and asked him why he was complaining when he would get paid for something he could have done for free. Victor told him that flying was terrible when held in his palm, especially when he was breathing dragon fire down his neck. He told Victor that his discomfort must be due to his lack of scales and empathized with his situation. But he asked him what he could do about such a birth defect. Victor asked if he could ride on his back instead. He just looked at Victor, who was pleading earnestly, but he just asked Victor what kind of ungrateful demand that was. He told him that when he had found him that morning, Victor was a mere thief, adrift and without purpose. Now, Victor was his chief of staff, which led Victor to sarcastically respond that his trust warmed his frozen heart. He put Victor down on the ground, telling him that he should be grateful and not to demand too much. They were talking without noticing the lady who was amazed to see a dragon and a man praying for mercy. They then checked the system, and Victor said that at least he got a monster squire level out of it. 
he asked Victor what a squire was and if it was a kind of minion. Victor replied affirmatively and explained that it paid just as much. He, having gained a level in nobility, asked why he hadn't received a perk this time. Victor informed him that he only gets one perk every two levels, causing him to ask Victor why only two and who decided that. Victor replied that he thought the gods had decided it, or maybe the farmers, while the lady and the man tried to escape. He called the gods, or farmers, good-for-nothing upstarts and shouted that they always claimed they made the world when everyone knows the dragons did it first. Then he ordered Victor to tell him where he could find and reprimand them. However, Victor replied that he didn't know and that he was not a religious guy, suggesting that perhaps they should ask a bishop. He told Victor they would find that bishop, but only after he recovered what was his, leaving Victor shocked and questioning what he meant. He explained that according to the old money perk, the trolls should have dropped treasures when they died, and he questioned whether Victor expected him to sully himself with ashes. Victor clarified that he was not immune to fire, leading him to retort, by the elder worm, you mammals can't do anything. This comment irritated Victor. He then decided they would delay his gratification until the fires died down. In the meantime, he planned to obtain restitution for his previous employer's crime, to which Victor begrudgingly agreed to look at the map. A short time afterward, they arrived at a castle adorned with a flag featuring a cat in a shoe. He commented to Victor that he wasn't surprised she had lowered herself to hiring thieves, stating he would be bitter too if he lived in a castle with only one tower. The castle guards were surprised to see him approaching. He asked Victor what Marquise meant, to which Victor explained that it meant she was a noble lady. He inquired further if she was a princess or an elf princess, to which Victor responded that he didn't think so, and asked if dragons really kidnap princesses. His reply was sometimes, as the cat's guards began attacking him with arrows. Victor, fearful, asked him if he eats them. He simply swung his tail, sending the cats flying, while asking Victor if he took him for a savage. He replied that he released them back into the wild, so they could produce more princesses. Victor glanced at the collapsed cat's guards, praying to the gods that they weren't endangered. Suddenly, a voice from the tower shouted enough, and the Lady Marquise addressed Victor as Dragon Tamer, questioning their business at her castle. Vancour retorted that she had their relationship backward because he had tamed Victor. He then proudly reintroduced himself and informed her that she had sent ruffians after his silver rapier treasure, interrupting his peaceful nap. As a result, he demanded half her cattle as restitution, alongside the 1,000 gold coins she had offered for his item. She told him that his demand was preposterous, but he retorted that he had to fly for two hours to get there, burn pounds of fat, and smell the dung of her peasants. Victor added that Vancure had also scorched the local woods upon arrival, on the count of Provincle's behest, so she owed him an additional 6,000 coins for that service. Then he displayed his adventurer's tag as proof that he was an adventurer, the greatest her puny race had ever known. She asked him if he would leave her lands at once if she granted his demands. He replied that it depended on whether she had more quests for him. When she stated she didn't, she ordered her guard to bring Count Gilbert for an explanation and told her cook to prepare a feast for King Vancouver. She specified that it was to be a troublesome guest's feast with a special ingredient, to which the guard affirmed he would instruct the cooks to use the maximum dose. Then she told him that they would provide him with a feast and a reward for his noble deed. She expressed hope that he would forgive them for their lack of courtesy. However, he said he would forgive them only if her cattle were good. A moment later, the cats prepared a large feast with plenty of food, prompting him to exclaim that it was a splendid feast and he should visit more often. He then began to eat, just as a man approached them. He asked Victor if this newcomer was part of the feast, to which Victor responded that he was unsure. The man fearfully introduced himself as Gilbert, the Count of Provencal, which led him to ask Gilbert if he was the one who had issued the troll quest. Gilbert replied affirmatively and explained that he had petitioned the Marquise for help to get rid of the trolls before he, the adventurer, had zealously solved the problem. He told Gilbert that he took his duties as an adventurer seriously, and advised Victor that he could eat the leftovers, cautioning him not to claim he was starving his staff. Victor glanced at the disgusting food and realized that Gilbert was incredibly nervous about something. He wondered if the special ingredient the Marquise had mentioned was cyanide or arsenic. Victor then stated that he couldn't partake in his lord's meal, asserting that it was all his. This prompted him to label Victor as a dutiful servant and to inquire if Gilbert had come to deliver his reward. Gilbert pointed to a pile of gold coins and said that, in addition to the Marquise's gift of apology, it was his duty as her vassal to give him the reward. He placed the food suspected of being poisoned in his mouth, referred to Gilbert as a good servant, and ordered Victor to count the coins and not dare to steal any of them. 
As he swallowed the food, Victor assured him not to worry as he regretted stealing from him every day of his life. Suddenly, a system notification appeared in front of him, informing him that he had gained a poison resistance perk by braving the poison. He asked Victor about the poison stuff and wondered if it was a kind of human seasoning. Victor asked if he didn't know what poison was, and he responded that he was aware it didn't harm him. Victor explained that it was a bitter spice used for special occasions and typically reserved for special guests. This led him to ask Victor if he was considered one such guest, to which Victor responded by asking who else he could be referring to. He stated that he didn't taste anything unusual and ordered them to bring him more of this special spice. Victor glanced at Gilbert, fully expecting this outcome, and wondered if they believed they could kill Vancouver as easily as a giant rat. In response, they prepared an enormous amount of food laced with poison, which pleased him greatly. Gilbert fearfully whispered to Victor that he owed him his life. However, Victor simply retorted, with a tinge of anger, that he hoped Gilbert was happy as they had just made Vancouver stronger. A moment later, he was sleeping on the ground next to the bones of the meat he had devoured. On the other hand, Victor was inside the castle, thinking that when the Marquise invited him in for breakfast, he had expected another poisoned meal. However, it was actually a perfectly normal breakfast. He surmised she just wanted someone to rant to while they ate, even as she brandished a weapon at him. She furiously shouted about the humiliation of having a red dragon empty their pantry, take a nap at her front door, and then question why the gods had sent this calamity. She then asked Victor if he was still there. Gilbert confirmed that he was, adding that the poison should have killed Vancouver thrice over by now. When Victor inquired about her abundant supply of poison, she explained it was due to post-war politics. Then she asked him about his level. Upon hearing that he was a level 7, she expressed this belief, stating that a level 7 couldn't possibly tame a dragon. Victor, shocked, asked if he looked like a dragon tamer. He described the dragon as a wrecking ball. Gilbert interjected that Vancouver, the dragon, listened to Victor and that Victor had saved his life. Victor confessed that all he could do was steer Vancouver in a particular direction and hope the dragon wouldn't burn down too many houses. She suggested they could mount an attack while the dragon slept. Victor responded by recommending they offer Vancouver a better perk, or perhaps free levels. A guard, dressed in a suit of armor, moved closer and shouted at Victor to watch his mouth. When asked about his origins, Victor stated that he came from Earth, specifically America, and had been summoned to this world. She then revealed the significance of the Mark of Dice, which she should have recognized. Only someone chosen by the God of Luck could befriend a dragon. This news infuriated Victor. He resented the fact that Vancouver had abducted him and that the world was a hostile place where everything wanted to eat or rob him. He compared it to being stuck in the Middle Ages without the luxury of even taking a bath. He warned them against trying to steal from Vancouver again. Gilbert then asked her why she wanted the rapier in the first place. She confessed that the rapier was a lost family heirloom, but she was clueless as to how it ended up in Vancouver Nightbane's possession. Victor inquired about Vancouver's reputation and learned from her that Vancouver was the most powerful dragon on the continent. A guard added that some believed Vancouver had once devoured a level 70 knight, and that while monsters had been roaming the land since the century war ended, Vancouver could obliterate a forest full of them in a second. She proposed a plan to Victor. Despite the devastating loss of her pantry, they could potentially use the dragon. If Vancouver wanted to be an adventurer, they could send him on a doomed quest to kill the demon king Brandon Mature or the farmers in Prydain. Either Vancouver would succeed, or he would die trying. It was a win-win situation. Victor countered by stating that Vancouver wouldn't take on any task unless there was a substantial reward. He then asked her if she could afford to pay Vancouver should he succeed. She assured Victor that she would inform His Majesty and the Shining Knight who would handle the matter. Victor asked if there were any evildoers in need of a dragonfire reckoning. Gilbert mentioned the Scorcher mercenaries, who had become bandits after the Century War left them jobless. Suddenly, Vancouver's booming voice startled them. He called Victor back, declaring it was time to collect his shiny treasure. Victor realized he had almost forgotten but hoped that the forest fire had died out by now. Victor asked if she have a large, bag-like portion of fire resistance. Her anger flaring at his question, haven't you done enough already? He responded by threatening to reveal to Vancouver that she had more food hidden beneath the castle. Taken aback, she called him a monster. A moment later, the conversation turned. What were you doing with that cattling this morning, Victor? He replied that he had been reprimanding the Marquise for attempting to steal from him, a response that earned Victor a compliment. Good idea, I'd hate to have her as my next dinner guest. Victor then explained that he had found some decent loot left behind by the monsters he had defeated the previous day. He credited his eye for treasure class perk for his ability to identify magical items and determine their value. Victor then listed his new acquisitions, a ring of fire resistance, a horn of wyvern calling, a firebomb necklace, and a pair of solar bracers. The conversation shifted to Victor's new poison resistance perk. 
didn't you say you could only gain a perk every two levels? Victor clarified that this restriction applied only to class perks. Personal perks, such as his poison resistance, could be unlocked by meeting specific, though rare, hidden criteria. Who else but a dragon like me could unlock such a thing? He boasted. He ordered Victor to place the treasures in a bag as they were returning to his hoard and planned to embark on another easy quest. Victor informed him that his survival in the burning forest was due to the Marquise's potion, and inquired about the intended use of the ring and bracers. They are shiny and will look good in my hoard, he responded. Victor suggested he would perform better with the proper equipment, but Vancour dismissed the idea. A ring won't improve your appearance. To me, all manlings look the same. Victor thanked him for the backhanded compliment and explained the practical uses of each item. Fire resistance from the ring, wyvern summoning from the horn, and increased strength in sunlight from the bracers. Vancour interrupted Victor, intrigued by the idea of growing stronger by wearing bracers. Upon learning that the bracers were human-sized and would not fit him, Vancour grew frustrated. Why would my perk deliver human-sized treasure? This is sabotage, a malfunction. Nevertheless, he agreed to loan Victor the items out of his boundless generosity, which Victor gratefully acknowledged. The conversation turned again, this time to Victor's eye for treasure perk. Before Victor could fully explain that it required certain levels to obtain, Vancure interjected with a question, can I have multiple classes at once? Victor confirmed that he could, up to a total cap of 100. Beyond that, one ascends to godhood or something similar. I will reach level 100, and you will become level 99. Vancure declared confidently. He agreed to Victor's suggestion of a new quest, provided it paid well. Victor showed him bounty posters for three bandit leaders, Gustave Lamuriel, Ogron the Ogre, and Francois Vilmain notorious for countless war crimes. The bounties for two of the bandits were 5,000 gold, while the other one was worth 10,000 gold. He also mentioned that Duchess Aelinor of Essekul was offering a reward for their deaths. He asked Victor how much, and Victor replied, 20,000 in total, officially, to which he immediately responded that he will pass. Then he asked Victor what he meant by officially. Victor explained that he was sure the Duchess would offer him a more substantial reward under the table for defeating her enemies. This prompted him to ask why, if the Duchess was willing to offer more, she didn't put it in the request, why under the table, and if it was some kind of magic ritual. Victor explained that it was a way to avoid tax and he told him in a hushed tone that the king takes 10% of any reward offered through the Adventurer's Guild. He exclaimed that it was theft, and it was no wonder he had become a thief, given that his own race was led by a robber. Then, he asked if this under-the-table ritual could help. Victor responded affirmatively and explained that tax evasion was an ancient, respected human tradition. As he was a dragon, Victor assured him that the Duchess would likely offer him a greater reward than she would offer to humans. He shouted that she better do so and ordered Victor to initiate their pursuit of the thieving king. This declaration made Victor sigh in relief because Vancure believed him, giving him hope that he might be able to do some good after all. Night fell on the largest port in the Duchy of Yuskal. Three bandits observed the port, one of them said that all he saw was a breeding ground for weakness. Another man replied that he couldn't have agreed more. Then, he asked the woman if this was the place she wanted them to attack, to which she responded affirmatively. She ordered them to ravage the city, recover her due, and then she would reward them handsomely. She assured them that the demon king, Brandon Mature, would see to it. The man asked the lady if she didn't mind them having a bit of fun with the place first. She replied that they could, as long as they left no survivors, and instructed them to stay in touch. The armored one addressed the man, calling him Vilmain, and asked if there were any formidable defenders. Vilmain, addressing the armored man as Gustave, responded that nobody was at level 20. Gustave expressed disappointment, mentioning that he was beginning to grow bored with killing peasants, and then asked which of them would lead the charge. Suddenly, a voice boomed, me, making them turn around. They saw a massive creature who announced that Ogron would burn the city, and no one would stand in his way. Way. Meanwhile, in the sky, Victor was questioned by Vancure if they had arrived at their destination yet. However, Victor denied this, saying that the ogre, Ogron, had last been seen near Hodimer. This led Vancure questioning Victor about how he could differentiate between their dirty villages, when they all appeared similar to him. In response, Victor simply stated that he believed their next stop would be the right one. Upon being asked why he thought so, Victor responded that it was due to the fires. On the other hand, in the land of Vilmain, Gustave and Ogron were wreaking havoc on the village. Ogron, in a fit of anger, threatened to eat their children. One of the knights, out of fear, urged his comrade to hold the line. 
They needed more time to evacuate, but his comrade asked him to look up, because Ogron had brought a dragon. Vancouver was ready to land, asking Victor for directions. Victor advised him to land near the attackers. The sight of Vancouver stunned the villagers. When he landed, the ground broke due to the force. The bandits shielded their faces to avoid the sand in their eyes, but the villagers began to flee. Ogron, noticing this, labeled them as cowards and stated that dragons were not scary. He questioned the bandits, asking which one of them was Ogron the Ogre. Ogron shouted confidently that he was the one. Despite this proclamation, Vancouver didn't believe him and repeated his question. Victor then pointed to Ogron, affirming that he was indeed the ogre in question. However, Vancouver disagreed, calling Ogron a cyclops instead of an ogre because ogres have two eyes. This statement left Victor stunned, but he confirmed that the creature was indeed Ogron. Upon hearing this, Ogron clarified that he was the only Ogron around, and that he had shed blood for Gardamagni. Yet, instead of rewarding him with gold, the king had given him a dirt farm. Vancouver, still perplexed, asked Victor why Ogron was called an ogre if he was a cyclops. Ogron angrily replied that he was known as Ogron the ogre because he ate people. He then swung his axe at Vancouver, shouting that he was a warrior, and that Vancouver would meet his end. But, much to everyone's surprise, Vancouver simply consumed half of Ogron's body, causing the latter's lower half to collapse to the ground. This left Victor, the villagers, and the remaining bandits in shock. While chewing on Ogron, Vancouver mused that it was quite a satisfying meal. He informed Victor that Cyclops tasted like salty pigs and he desired more. This made Victor worry about the villagers' safety, prompting him to direct Vancouver's attention to the bandits. Considering them a potential dessert, Vancouver grabbed some bandits and happily declared that they tasted like veal. Upon witnessing this, Vilmain panicked and ordered his comrades to retreat, causing Vancouver to shout in annoyance as they fled. The following morning, Vancouver burped contentedly, having overeaten. He lay amongst the debris, informing Victor that he had leveled up and asked about the benefits of these increases. The system showed Vancouver that he had gained a level in the Noble and Snobbery class, which meant he inflicted more damage to, and received less from, non-Noble targets. Victor instructed him to use the command menu to check his stats. Upon being asked if he had not noticed this before, Vancouver shyly confessed that he had, but was merely testing Victor's knowledge. He then declared menu aloud. The system displayed his stats, level 3, noble 3, a party member of V and V, with health points at 5,315, special points at 1,290, strength at 95, vitality at 88, skill at 11, agility at 39, intelligence at 9, charisma at 71, and luck at 39. Vancouver interpreted V and V as double Vancouver. People began to approach him, causing Vancouver to be taken aback. Although they knew that the dragon had annihilated the bandits, the villagers were still terrified, wondering if they were to be the next victims. He told Victor that the ambience felt too heavy and ordered him to sing his praises to cheer up the gloomy manlings. Victor understood, raised his hand, and shouted, Vancouver is the best dragon. Victor then stared at the people, they nodded their heads, indicating their understanding. In response, the crowd joyously shouted that Vancouver was the best dragon, which made him proud. He thanked everyone, believing he deserved the adulation and declared himself as Vancouver, the adventurer. He had come to rescue them and ordered them to bring their cattle. Victor asked the people who was in charge. A man pointed to a girl while explaining that their mayor had been killed, leaving the guild representative as their presumed leader. The girl, Charlene, fearfully denied this, panicking and shouting, it's Vancouver again. Before this, in the guild hall, someone had asked her if she was sure she wanted to leave Valbin. It won't be the same without you, they'd cautioned. But she had insisted, asking the guild to transfer her as far from Vancouver's lair as possible. They had agreed. The person had said they couldn't blame her and asked where she was going. She had happily replied that she was moving to Hodimer, thinking it would be perfect because there she would find a beautiful beach, a peaceful land, and no dragons. But in the end, she was kneeling on the ground, shouting in disbelief, are they kidding me? A few hours later, near the beach, Victor joyfully informed him that Charlene was the acting mayor and the new guild hall manager. Victor introduced a man named Henry Bright, a scholar who wanted to discuss Vancouver's career choices. Charlene, in frustration, told him that on behalf of Hodimer, she regretfully granted him the city's highest honor, the keys. However, he interrupted her, asking about his money before she could finish explaining. Victor assured him it was already covered. She angrily told him she had reported his deed to the Duchess, who would send men-at-arms to deliver his reward. Charlene then told Victor that she could hardly believe what she was saying but they would be offered free lodging for the week at the Guildhall for their exemplary service. When Vancouver asked her if there was a lava bath, she firmly replied no. He told Victor that he couldn't believe his species was so backward and that he would sleep on the warm sand. However, he doubted his lackey shared his quality standards. Victor confirmed that he would make sure to enjoy a good, warm bed. 
Henry then addressed him as Great Bancure, informing him that his friend Victor said he needed advice on the class system. Bancure ordered him to refer to him as His Majesty in italics and asked, What is a friend? Is it some kind of minion? Yet, Henry simply asked him how he had the Super Senses perk. Bancure agreed, acknowledging that he did indeed have the perk and asked Henry how he knew. Charlene explained that Henry was Hodimer's class expert, advising locals on how to develop their classes and stats. Henry interjected, however, expressing his surprise that a dragon could gain classes. It was a whole new discovery. Bancure replied that he didn't know either and asked what exactly the system was. Henry replied that the system was of a supernatural nature, unlocked by the god Dice during its inaugural role. At that time, Dice was still a sentient artifact, and classes symbolized potent roles, granting immense powers to those who could access them. This led him to question Victor, are you sure the dragons didn't create this system? Victor stated that Dice was the first intelligent being to gain a class. In response, Henry noted that even though Dice never claimed to be the system's creator, evidence pointed to it as the first entity to activate the system. He challenged them, asserting that they had no evidence proving dragons hadn't created the system. He hypothesized it was a dragon-crafted system designed to amass wealth and power. Understanding this, he expressed his desire for more levels in the noble class to Henry. However, Henry cautioned him that the noble class was hit or miss, offering very few significant perks, such as a monthly stipend. His eyes sparkled at the mention of free money, prompting him to inquire when he could acquire it. Henry informed him that it would be available at noble level 9. He then asked Henry what else could augment his wealth. Henry suggested merchant or banker roles, which annoyed him. He expressed disdain for the merchant role, dismissing it as work suitable for minions, and pointed out that a dragon does not run a shop. Henry countered by stating that crafter classes often received superior material rewards. He further clarified that classes were categorized into five groups, fighters, spellcasters, rogues, crafters, and monsters. Charlene confessed, albeit unwillingly, that Hodimer needed assistance. She elaborated that the Scorcher bandits, under pressure from the royal army, aimed to steal ships and flee the country. She warned that even after Ogrun's death, they might return. His response was enthusiastic, appreciating the opportunity for free experience and the lack of a need to pursue the bandits. He inquired about a class that could enrich him in a dragon-like manner. Henry proposed the gambler's class, explaining that they possessed intelligence, skill, luck, and several perks conducive to gold farming. Confused, he demanded an explanation for the unfamiliar term. Despite Henry's thorough explanation, he failed to comprehend it, expressing his boredom with a loud shout. He designated Victor as his new class manager, leaving Victor puzzled and questioning his new role. He justified his decision by asserting that, as a dragon, he was too important to concern himself with such details. He then dismissed everyone, telling Victor that he was not paid enough to tolerate such nonsense. Victor countered by saying that things were going well and noted his previous failed interaction with Charlene. He suggested that her presence might present a second chance. Victor's words filled him with joy. He shared his desire to procreate, wishing to place his eggs in a female human. Victor pointed out the inappropriateness of his choice of words. He then advised Victor that he would never succeed without taking a bath. He had been holding back, but now he told Victor frankly that he smelled like dung and would never procreate with that odor. However, as his master, he pledged to endure it and do everything to perpetuate his species. Victor was taken aback, questioning whether he was serious. He affirmed his intentions, stating that this way, he could replenish his stock of minions. Victor, however, vowed not to let any of his future children near him. He then ordered Victor to bathe in the sea for his own good. Victor assured him that he would use the inn's hot baths and thanked him. He made an okay sign, telling Victor to procreate and abstain from sinning any further. Once he was alone, he shouted menu several times to check his profile, exclaiming joyfully that it was addictive. The next day, in the guild hall, Victor was happily washing his body in the room, reflecting on how long it had been since he had taken a warm bath. The recent encounter with the dragon made him believe he'd never be able to relax again. He glanced at his necklace and marveled at how the Gardemagen's guild had promoted them to copper-ranked adventurers. Although he was unsure of what to do with the loot, Bancure insisted on keeping everything, even the most insignificant items. Suddenly, Henry barged into his bathroom, shouting his name and causing him to jump in surprise. Hastily covering his body, Victor demanded to know why Henry had entered his room. Henry replied that he had been studying Victor's case and had become so engrossed that he could no longer wait to discuss it. However, mid-conversation, Henry paused, noticing the tattoo on Victor's shoulder. He asked if it was the mark of the Night Blades, Gardamagna's most dangerous criminal syndicate. Victor looked away, giving a non-committal answer, but Henry pressed him about the Thieves' Guild mark on his shoulder. Victor replied that he had been a legitimate repossessor of private goods before leaving the Guild to become an adventurer. He knew he was only fooling himself by thinking he had truly left the Night Blades. He glared at Henry, warning him to remain silent about his past. 
taken aback, Henry quickly changed the topic, suggesting that Victor's dragon, Vancure, would greatly benefit from Crusader's stats growth and perks, making him nigh undefeatable. Victor questioned whether Henry was serious about making Vancure even more overpowered. When Henry confirmed he was, he further asked if it was not part of his job. Victor admitted it was but clarified that he did not plan on doing it well. He asked Henry not to refer to Vancure as his dragon, as that was making quite an assumption. Despite this, Henry continued to enthuse about the optimization potential. Victor remained skeptical, reminding Henry that Vancure only cared about gold and was already strong enough to treat a Cyclops as casually as one would a chicken nugget. Unless a class that could farm gold without requiring strenuous work was proposed, Victor warned that Vancure would not be interested. Suddenly, a system notification informed Victor that he had gained a level in Monster Squire. He was surprised to learn that as a minion trainer, his minions would now gain 50% more experience when fighting by his side. He wondered aloud how he had managed to level up in Monster Squire. Henry explained that serving the dragon had earned him the Monster Squire class, so naturally, he would gain experience when working on behalf of Vancure. Victor understood that this only confirmed his earlier thoughts. However, he questioned whether the class expected him to befriend more dragons. He informed Henry that Vancure would continue to gain levels in the Noble class until he achieved the stipend perk. After that, he would need a new class better suited for money making. Henry suggested the Gladiator Fighter class, explaining that its perks could provide rewards if the user managed to impress crowds. Given Dragon's high strength and charisma, they could make full use of this class. He pondered whether he should actually share this with Vancure, given that Vancure is a self-centered jerk. However, considering Vancure saved the city, he concluded to label it as Damage Control and consult Henry for the class document. Henry responded affirmatively, indicating that he had some suggestions for him as well. He inquired whether he possessed the claim by Dice perk, as it would imply a 10% greater chance to boost his intelligence and luck with each level, making him a capable spellcaster. Shyly, he asked Henry a somewhat childish question about whether a class could improve his dating life. He added that he was asking on behalf of a friend. Henry replied positively and asked about his friend's charisma. The response was as much as his, causing Henry to label it as average, which hurt his feelings. Nevertheless, Henry suggested the fiendish rake class, discovered by Ludwig Mann. It had demanding entry conditions, including charisma, vitality, and agility scores of 50 each in completing a specific demonic ritual. Hearing this, he dismissed the idea. Subsequently, he covered his body and asked Henry if he had any reservations, to which Henry, noticing his shyness, affirmed. Before leaving, Henry reassured Victor not to worry as he would find the perfect class progression for his friend. This caused Victor to question if everyone on the planet was obsessed with class progression. Suddenly, a system notification appeared, revealing he had received the Observer Personal Perk, which allowed him to instantaneously determine the class levels of anyone he looked at, as long as they were on the same total level as him or lower. If the target was of a higher level, he could only discern their total class level. He reckoned this new perk would be useful. Relaxing in the bath, he was glad to be finally alone without a dragon to manage, if only for a few hours. Suddenly, someone called his name, surprising and irritating him. When he looked towards the door, he was shocked to see Charlene, who angrily asked if she was intruding on his day off. All he could do was question why she was there. She reminded him that she managed the place, which was Hodimer's guild hall and served as the main inn. He conceded but questioned if he hadn't kept the room for a while, designating it as his safe space. Charlene retorted that his privacy was solely due to no one daring to argue with a 60-foot-long dragon outside, and mentioned the destruction of her previous guild hall. Victor countered by arguing that if he hadn't interceded, Vancour would have devastated all of Valbane. Charlene shot back, saying that Vancour had only awakened because he had tried to steal something. Angered, he reminded her that if he hadn't taken that quest, someone else would have, possibly resulting in an even worse outcome. Despite all of Vancura's faults, he had saved the city from bandits, unless she believed the guards could have defeated Ogron the Ogre on their own. Charlene tried to reason with him, but he emphatically asserted that he had done his best given his circumstances, asking what she would have done in his place, leaving her speechless. In the end, she admitted that she couldn't blame him for doing his best when confronted with a giant dragon, acknowledging that the situation had been stressful for her too. Victor replied that now she understood, but Charlene still insisted it was no excuse to laze about all day. She threw him a towel, instructing him to dress and prepare for a task. Grinning, he asked if she had any plans for the evening. She said she had work, to which he suggested he'd be available once the job was completed. She remained silent, causing him to sweat in panic. She then instructed him to go to the basement to exterminate rats, causing him to protest that it was a form of adventurer hazing.
but she insisted. Later, he descended into the basement, torch in hand, ruminating on the lengths he was willing to go for Luff. He searched the basement but found no signs of rats, causing him to question whether she had sent him on a futile mission. Suddenly, he heard someone instructing another to remember that everything is in the heart and to practice the pose with feeling. He spotted five creatures nearby and wondered if they were kobolds. One of the creatures saw him and panicked, declaring there was a human present. Another suggested it was time for their choreography and urged the others to execute it with heart so that the human would cower before them. They began by shouting, We fight for injustice, we live for mayhem, we strike at night, and we thrive in discord. We are the kobold rangers. This left him stunned and confused. The kobolds cheered, boasting that they had mastered their choreography and had taken him aback. They pondered whether they should incorporate the word chaos into their motto for added impact and suggested doom to amplify their message, leaving him as though he were invisible. He noted that Blue's timing seemed off and suggested that, for full effect, they needed a team pet like a white alligator. This remark irritated Blue, who questioned how he dared criticize his performance when mammals could not comprehend true art. He replied that it was simply too modern for his taste. The blue kobold accused him of being an ignorant mammal, proclaiming that the pineapple of wisdom had enlightened them. The black kobold added that he was out of touch and it was time for action. He sighed in frustration, prompting the black kobold to express his desire to attack. However, the red kobold reassured his comrades, insisting that the human understood. He agreed, explaining that he understood them just fine and his monster kin perk was indeed effective. When the kobolds caught a whiff of him, they detected a scent similar to a dragon, which left him surprised since he had just bathed. Despite this, he considered it could be advantageous and announced to the kobolds that he was Victor, Dragon's chief of staff for Vancure, and they should yield or risk being devoured. The kobolds were incredulous about his position as chief of staff, but they felt an intense charisma from him. They concluded they had no other option but to negotiate peace. He demanded their greatest treasure in return for their lives, and the red kobold urged his comrades to quickly retreat into the tunnel. Victor began to feel remorseful, as they seemed as naive as children. They then produced a tablet adorned with a pineapple symbol. He inquired about its nature and whether it was indeed a tablet. The blue kobold confirmed it was the pineapple of wisdom, and the red one added that it contained the universe's darkest secrets. He then realized why the tablet had corrupted them. It wasn't unheard of for items from Earth to end up in Outremont. Still, he wondered what was locked behind the files, assuming he would need passwords to access them. The blue kobold exclaimed that he could harness the power of the pineapple. The kobolds prostrated themselves and pleaded for him to accept them, leaving him astonished. He inquired about where he should take them. The red kobold implored him to allow them to serve his dragon master, acknowledging their lack of professional experience but insisting on their dedication and eagerness to learn. He asked them if they realized Vancouver might consume them. They excitedly responded that for a kobold, there was no greater honor than to be devoured by dragons, and they considered it their duty to serve such majestic creatures. He accepted them as unpaid interns, mentioning it was a stepping stone for their future career advancement. The pink kobold recognized the weight of their new responsibility, and the red one promised not to disappoint their dragon master chief. He pondered that the more he became a lackey, the stronger he grew and wondered how that was even fair. Looking at his system, he saw he had gained two levels in Monster Squire, and monster student, enabling him to learn monster exclusive perks once taught or targeted by them. Moreover, he counted as a monster for class access criteria. Just then, Vancouver called him. He told the kobolds that it was time for their first day on the job. Charlene arrived in the basement begging him to handle the dragon situation before Vancouver destroyed the village. On noticing the kobolds, she questioned their species. He confirmed they were kobolds, not rats, explaining why mousetraps had failed. Later, they emerged from the guild hall to meet Vancouver. On seeing him, Victor realized that while he couldn't breed, he had decided to adopt. The kobolds were thrilled at the sight of a real dragon and marveled at Vancouver's size. They bowed and pleaded for Vancouver to accept them among his retinue. Vancouver assured them of his acceptance and pledged to defend their right to serve him. Victor commented that Vancouver was far ahead of his time. Vancouver urged haste, having detected ruffians in the city and questioned whether he would be rewarded for dispatching them. Victor informed him that he could receive up to a hundred coins per bandit's head and thousands for leaders. As they began their journey, Victor reminded him of their purpose, to increase the size of his horde. Meanwhile, Henry was walking to someone's house, then he called Miss Laver to tell her that he was there, and someone opened the door. Laver sweetly told him that it was kind of him to visit her and that when he informed her he was visiting their beloved Hotemer, she couldn't pass up the opportunity. Henry bowed his head while telling her that it was an honor to meet her in person, 
Then he panicked to pick up his things that had fallen, making Laver laugh while telling him to call her Lucy. She added that while she may represent the Royal University, she never forgot her humble roots. Henry asked Lucy Laver, a scholar of level 15 with spellcaster classes, why she hid most of her classes. She replied that he knew how academic rivalries could get and that she was one of Archmage Nostradame's apprentices. Consequently, many coveted her position and would do anything to take it. She also explained to him that in particular, she studied new fields of spellcasting not yet recognized by the university. She might get in trouble if they were discovered before she published her thesis. She then invited him in, telling him that they could discuss it further inside. Henry went inside and was amazed. The place seemed bigger on the inside than the outside. He asked her if she was using a space alteration spell. She replied that it was the doing of the true owner. She must say that she was one of her mentors, which made Henry comment that her mentor must be a powerful mage. Lucy agreed, stating that she was indeed powerful and that she learned from the best. Henry asked her what a mage of their caliber was doing in their fair city. She replied that her teacher wanted her to keep an eye on a secret project in Hodimer and asked him to keep quiet about her presence there. To this, Henry agreed and assured her that he hadn't told anyone about his visit. He then handed her a scroll, telling her that he thought she would be interested in his discovery. She opened it and saw something about a monster squire class. She told Henry that she had never heard of such a class. Henry explained to her that it was a whole new monster class, and Vancure, the dragon, had gained levels in it. He also informed her that Vancure was not the first case of an intelligent monster gaining levels, but was certainly the first dragon to do so. He wished he could study him further, but guild officer Charlene had warned him that the Duchess would soon send knights after Vancure. She returned the scroll to him, saying that she would not count on knights to deal with Vancure when his name was Knightsbane after all, but they could discuss it in her study because she believed his class research had great potential. He entered the room, telling her that hearing her say it warmed his heart. She told him that she was certain those gentlemen would agree, making Henry ask who these gentlemen were. Suddenly, someone appeared behind him, stunning him. Then Gustave Lamuriel, level 25, knight 20, and heavy knight 4, looked at him, making him realize that Gustave must be Lucy's friend. However, when he looked in front of him, he was gripped by fear when he saw humans hanging on the post, and a man introducing himself as Francois Vilmain, a scorcher captain, alongside his comrade Gustave. Vilmain was level 27, a fallen bishop of death jester 13, outer lar 3, and fencer 7. Then, Vilmain told him that he was certain he had heard a myriad of horrible tales about them and all of them were indeed true. Henry took a seat, fear etched on his face, and inquired what they had done with Miss Laver and whether she was their hostage. However, Vilmain assured him that it was far from the truth as their mistress was Laver herself. She had agreed to let them hide at her place in exchange for assisting her students or, as one might call it, aiding her empirical research. Henry warned Vilmain that his disappearance would raise suspicion if they were to kill him. Yet, Vilmain wryly commented that whether or not people noticed, Henry would still be dead. However, he reassured Henry that they weren't savages and suggested they should have a chat first. Contrary to what Henry might think, they, the Scorchers, did not start out as bandits. They bravely fought for Gardamage during the Century War. Regrettably, with the end of the war, their once respectable occupation of slaughtering people and burning their villages was no longer politically acceptable. He asked Henry, almost incredulously, if he could believe that they were asked to resort to farming like peasants. But luckily for them, Bradon Mora, his dark majesty from Ishafania, offered an alternative. Braddon promised them a comfortable retirement sum and asylum, provided they torched the countryside of Gardamagni and retrieved an artifact on his behalf. Unfortunately for Henry, Hodimer was part of their target, it was nothing personal. However, they encountered a massive problem. Henry questioned if it was Vancure or Knightsbane. Vilmain confirmed his suspicion. It was indeed the giant dragon that consumed their men for breakfast. Not only had Vancure defeated Agron, but the royal army was also hot on their trail. Thus, their financial future appeared bleak. Gustave revealed to Henry that their interrogation of two men provided information that the dragon had a master. Vilmain confessed that they had to use some force until the men disclosed the name, Victor. Gustave noted to Vilmain that it wasn't entirely accurate, as one of the two spilled the beans when he saw his companion being zombified. Vilmain concurred but reminded Gustave that his outlaw soldier had stabbed him afterward. Gustave clarified it was merely a strategy to help him level up. Vilmain felt lucky for a moment, he gained a level from a simple peasant. He nostalgically mentioned missing the good old days when he used to gain experience from killing helpless villagers. Then, Vilmain beckoned Henry, addressing him as a friend, assuring him that they could reach a mutually agreed resolution. However, Henry believed they intended to kill him regardless, questioning why he should share any information. 
Vilmain admitted that they were, indeed, planning to kill him, but he wondered if they needed to use force first. Unlike his comrade, he despised violence and emphasized that he wasn't a savage. Gustave unsheathed his sword and says that the priest of death jester, he was the holiest man present, a worshipper of the god of crime, and he enjoyed his role. This irritated Gustave, who impatiently yelled that he was fed up. He threatened Henry, asking if he would finally talk, or should he remove one of his legs first. Vilmain interjected, assuring Henry that while his death was certain, they could respect a last request if he told them the whole truth. Henry, shaking with fear, asked if they would spare someone if he spoke. Vilmain replied it would depend, but regretfully added that Victor was certainly going to die. Henry then inquired about his house, the repository of all his research. Vilmain asked him if he was ready to betray his friend to save his life's work, expressing respect for such a decision. If a man truly is a man, he argued, he must leave a legacy behind. Vilmain agreed to spare Henry's house and his research. Later, Henry finished sharing all he knew. Vilmain asked him if Victor truly was a Nightblade agent, as it seemed peculiar. Henry clarified that Victor had claimed to have left the group. Vilmain informed Henry that one never truly leaves the Night Blades. He then inquired whether Victor had a weakness and if he was as greedy as the dragon. Henry, visibly nervous, responded that Victor undertakes jobs for Charlene when she requests them. Vilmain acknowledged this useful information and asked Gustave if there was any conceivable way they could best the dragon in combat. Gustave pondered Vancouver's formidable presence and admitted that he didn't think so either. Nonetheless, Gustave assured Vilmain that Vancouver wasn't the brightest. Vilmain activated his power and stated their plan. They would distract Vancouver, raise the town, retrieve the artifact, and then flee on stolen ships. Gustave asked about Vancouver's human partner, to which Vilmain replied they could handle him given they were both twice his level. Vilmain then addressed Henry, stating that while he might not be brave, he believed him to be truthful. He then revealed that Gustave had three levels in Turncoat, a class whose initial perk, Falseness, conceals Turncoat levels from detection perks like Henry's. The second perk is named Traitor's Joy. Gustave told Henry that as a class scholar, he must already know what this perk does. Henry confirmed that it allowed the user to gain experience whenever they broke a promise. Vilmain reminded Henry of Gustave's savagery, guessing his house would likely burn like the rest. Gustave, readying his sword to kill Henry, told Vilmain that he'd merely relayed his own sentiments. But before Gustave's blade could sever Henry's head, Vilmain called out for him to stop and wait. Gustave questioned Vilmain, arguing that Henry was of no further use to them. However, Vilmain retorted that he could think of one more use for Henry. Meanwhile, the eyes of the dead men hanging on the posts rose as Vilmain claimed Henry had just one use left. Henry cried out in pain as a powerful green light emanated from inside the room. Elsewhere, Lucy asked her mistress if it was wise to leave those two in charge and offered to retrieve the artifact herself. The lady responded that there was no need, they were expendable, unlike her. Given Lucy's history with dragons, she didn't consider her to be reliable. Lucy was taken aback and informed her mistress that she believed she had atoned for her past mistake. The lady corrected her, saying that she had assumed wrongly. She then expressed her concerns about Nightsbane's return and its potential impact on her operations. She ordered Lucy to keep her informed of Vancouver's movements but not to intervene unless expressly instructed to do so. Furthermore, she urged Lucy not to disappoint her. Lucy acquiesced, saying as you wish, before her mistress disappeared, leaving Lucy to reflect on how her job seemed to be getting harder each day. His name is Vancouver Nightsbane. Like all great worms, he was mindful of preserving wildlife, and he was careful to maintain the population of princesses, allowing them to grow into queens and produce more princesses. However, there was one species he intended to hunt to extinction. The yellow bandits alerted him to their presence. The yellow cobbled pointed at the bandit, reinforcing Vancouver's belief that bandits were the weeds of the animal kingdom. He swung his axe, aiming to decapitate the bandit, but the bandit dodged his attack. Vancouver lacked respect for the environment, as it did not reciprocate his regard. He glanced at the cobbled pursuing the fleeing bandit before calling out to Victor. Engaged in combat with the bandit himself, Victor acknowledged Vancouver's call. Vancouver complained that his axe was not functioning properly. However, Victor suggested that he only needed to swing it down once the bandit was immobilized, reminding him to kill with style to impress his fans and unlock the gladiator class. Vancouver referred to the bandit as a mammal and inquired if he was familiar with the dragon equivalent of pain. With a furious heave, he lifted his axe to strike the bandit declaring pain to be a birth defect. He succeeded in eliminating the bandit using his axe and raised it triumphantly while the kobolds cheered. Victor asked him if it was true that dragons perceived pain as a birth defect. The system indicated that Vancouver had advanced a level in both the gladiator 
and Arena Warrior classes, granting him an immediate medium proficiency and 1.5 times damage boost with all melee weapons. He responded that only mammals experience pain and questioned Victor on whether he needed to wield the axe to acquire new gladiator levels, as he found it impractical. Victor assured him that it was not necessary, explaining that he simply needed to demonstrate his combat prowess while continuously swinging the axe. Suddenly, Vancouver split a nearby tree in half. The falling trunk struck his head, disorienting him and stunning his minions. He tossed the axe aside in frustration, condemning the human-made axes and venting about his lack of financial gain despite his successful fights. Victor pointed out that the old money system was not designed to work with humans, likely to discourage nobles from exploiting their peasants. Victor examined the few coins and knives they'd collected, considering the loot minimal but better than nothing. However, Vancouver declared that it was insufficient for his horde and called for the next challenge. The Yellow Cobbled informed him that he'd exterminated all the enemies in the area, leading Vancouver to question whether there would be no further opportunities for leveling up or gold acquisition that day. Victor suggested they could sell their spoils and even reinvest the earnings for better equipment. Confused, Vancouver asked Victor to explain the concept of investing. Victor defined investing as exchanging gold for something of higher value, which shocked Vancouver. The thought of parting with his gold horrified him. Victor attempted to alleviate his concerns, explaining that the gold was being traded for something of greater worth. Visibly distressed at the thought of relinquishing his gold, Vancouver questioned Victor's health, suggesting his lack of breeding had harmful effects on his cognitive abilities. Vancouver asked Victor what sane mind would part with gold. Realizing his explanation might be too complex, Victor conceded it might be a difficult concept to grasp. Vancouver admitted to understanding the value of the bandit's belongings, only to be interrupted by Victor, who reminded him of his role as Vancouver's treasurer and horde manager. Vancouver vehemently disagreed, forbidding Victor from touching his hoard. He reminded Victor sternly that selling was a task for minions, which included him and the cobbles. Vancouver decided that they would discard anything not shiny enough for his hoard, excluding gold and jewels. To motivate Victor, Vancouver promised to allow him to retain one-tenth of the profits, a revelation that moved the cobbles to tears as they inquired about their potential payment. Victor informed him that he found it hard to believe he was more generous than the king himself. He declared with pride, stating that he swears to him that VNV shall never pay taxes to the extortionist. He then sternly instructed Victor not to give away any money, not to invest, and that the glorious name of V&V cannot be associated with such insanity. Moreover, he informed him that they would sell the corpses because he was tired of eating humans all the time. This left him perplexed and he inquired about the cause of death of these corpses. He then simply asked Victor if his kind doesn't hunt monsters, collect their corpses, and sell their parts. Victor acknowledged this but clarified that they only sell the monster parts. He asked Victor what they do with the humans, to which Victor replied that he didn't know and that they just leave them behind for animals to consume. Now that he had given it some thought, Victor conceded that it wasn't very sanitary. He informed Victor that he didn't want to give away anything anymore and instructed him to find a way to profit from his surplus of snacks. Victor questioned him, asking if he wanted him to open a shop where he could sell junk and corpses, and inquired if there was anything else. He told Victor that it was a lot of work, but since he was his chief of staff, he would find time between preparing his class progression and training the cobbles. Victor questioned him, asking if he wanted him to teach classes to the cobbles. He reminded Victor that he failed to grasp his grand vision for V and V, which was an adventure party of minions, trained from the egg and working till death to fulfill a quest. He also informed Victor that shopkeepers sold junk and meat in every one of their backward villages, filling chests with gold, and that everyone worked together to build the greatest treasure that will ever be his hoard. His eyes glinted with the luster of gold coins, which left Victor speechless. Later, in the village, on the street, a man called out to everyone, inviting them to check out the best options at Runewell Company. Suddenly, Vancouver landed near the man, causing the people to freeze mid-motion. Then, the man yelled in fear that the dragon had returned. Victor questioned the man if they were looking to sell stuff and a few lying corpses, but the man declined. Victor asked him why, and the man replied that he was unsure if he would get a fair price. However, Vancouver confidently told the man that those boots were priceless and were the most expensive boots in the world. The man fearfully examined the boots and agreed. Then, Victor asked him if he knew of anyone who would be interested in buying their loot. The man replied that the priests of Shesha, the goddess of commerce, might be willing to negotiate with the likes of them. Furthermore, the temple also deals with corpses. Victor expressed his disbelief that the man wouldn't buy their stuff and he felt like an outcast. He informed Victor that they were too affluent for them, but at least he would have a talk with their gods and hopefully, they would see reason and grant him a perk at every level. Then Victor told him that he had an ability that let him learn monsters' abilities and thought that if they taught him or if he survived their attacks, he might possess a useful one. 
he asked Victor if he would breathe fire too if he were incinerated, and if that was what he wanted. Victor told him, on second thought, that he may have been too hasty and asked him to forget he had said anything. However, he told Victor that only if he became a powerful chief of staff on his own would he continue to work hard for his personal gain. Then he asked Victor about the sweet pink and blue cobbles. Victor replied that he had sent them to the local blacksmith because he thought the scorchers were torching the countryside in search of something in hot emmer, and he wanted to be prepared. He asked what that something was and if it was a treasure. Victor replied that he didn't know, that it may have no strategic value, and uttered Brad on Mora and more, making him think it was interesting without understanding the words. Victor asked him if he was really listening, but the Red Cobble just shyly told that Victor had figured out the Scorcher's plan, and that their chief of staff was so smart that they wouldn't fail him. The Black Cobbled shyly stated that one day, he too would be chief of staff. However, the Yellow Cobbled shouted that he was first. He told the Cobbolds not to argue anymore before the Chief of Staff and to remember the protocol. Victor asked him what protocol, and he replied that it was the Minion Protocol. Then he explained that the Chief of Staff was the highest echelon of the Minion food chain, second only to their Monster Lord, and that it required 50% strength, 50% cunning, and 200% loyalty. Victor shyly told him that he was now exaggerating. But the Cobbolds admired him and told him that he underestimated his importance in the food chain. He told Victor that he was only beneath him in the preciousness hierarchy and was even above princesses. Then he explained that each member of the chain could eat those below them, and if he and Victor were starving, they could consume minions as emergency rations, making the cobbled shout that it would be an honor to feed him. Victor asked him if that meant he considered him a potential meal. He replied that it wouldn't happen unless they had no food or minions available. He reassured Victor that it would never occur because the world was full of dragon food. But just in case, he told Victor to start recruiting, to which Victor agreed as it was better to be safe than sorry. A moment later, in the blacksmith's store, Victor asked the cobolds if they had finished and if it had gone well. The blue cobolds told Victor that the manling smith didn't understand their language at first and was mean, but he became friendly when they showed him a drawing of their majesty, Vancure. Then they handed Victor a scroll, telling him that they had given Smith his letter and Smith had given them this one in return. Victor read it and told them that Smith was going to make the magical ring he had requested for free and praised them for a job well done, which thrilled the cobolds. Vancure thought Smith was a wise manling and that he should be spared. He then shouted orders at his minions, which hyped up the cobolds, even though they didn't know what it was about. Then he ordered them to gather the corpses of his previous victims and reminded them that no coin was too small to make, as he always said. Later, he told Victor that if he understood correctly, his kind worshipped those so-called gods like minions worship their dragon master. Victor replied that it was sort of true, and asked him back if dragons didn't worship, even to secure a good afterlife. He told Victor that such an idea appeals only to creatures fragile enough to die. They honor the Elder Worm, mother of their race, but as a parent, not a master. The man asked Victor if he had a moment to discuss the Prophet Orknoob, and if he wanted salvation in a new world. Victor replied, no and told the man to get lost. However, the man held his hand and told him that he could feel his ice sky level was medium. Victor told the man that he was claimed and tried to reason out. But the man told him that if he signed up to the esoteric order of the new world, he was guaranteed to be reincarnated on the mythical island of Japan where every girl is a waifu. He angrily pulled his hand back while telling the man to get off him. He didn't even have North and South America right on their map. Vanker ordered the cobolds to defend his chief of staff from that rabble. Then the cobolds pinned the man down on the ground, making the man shout for help. He asked Victor what it was, and Victor replied that it was a money scam. He had lived on Earth, and it was nothing like he just said. That made him say it was good, meaning it was an extra body to sell. Victor was shocked to hear this and asked him if he could spare the man. The man was just a nuisance. He knew that the guy might be annoying, but he didn't deserve to die either. Vancouver told him that getting rid of nuisances was more than a pleasure, it was a duty. But he had been a good minion, so he would indulge him because his generosity knew no limits. A moment later, they arrived at the place. Vancouver tried to go inside using the door, but he didn't fit, causing the wall to break. He angrily ordered Victor to tell the architects to build a bigger door. Victor fearfully replied, sure, and asked him if he could avoid causing the place to fall on them, the poor mortals. But he just asked him, why does your species have to be so small? Then Victor told him to allow him to present him with the gods of Outramond. But he just laughed and told Victor that they weren't so mighty if they had to share the same lair. Victor replied that obviously, they were but a shadow of his majesty's glory. He introduced Mithras, the god of the sun, order, medicine, and justice, then Leon, goddess of glory, nobility, strength, and art, then Isengrim, the god of the hunt and animals, then Cybele, the goddess of plants, knowledge, and pleasure, then Seng, the goddess of water, travel, dreams, and alcohol, then Moonman, the god of chaos, madness, and the moon. 
They also have Camilla, the goddess of plagues, vermin, darkness, and death. Then Death Jester, the god of crime, air, and illusions. Then Varen, the goddess of fire, war, tyranny, and machines. Then Shesha, the goddess of commerce, language, and snakes. Then Sabler, the destroyer, and finally Dice, the random number god. Victor fiercely looked at the dice, making him notice it and told him that he did not like that dice god. Victor replied that the dice god, Dimwit, had summoned him to Outramon without asking and since it unlocked the system first, everyone worshipped it. It's almost as popular as Mithras. But Vancouver just laughed and told him, as if the dragon didn't make that system first. He asked, why is that one so savage and is that god poor? Victor replied that Sabler supports Ishvania, Gardamagna's rival country, and people pray against Sabler there. He asked Victor how much Sabler was worth because he could hunt him down for the right price. Victor replied that he didn't think picking a fight with a god was a good idea, even for him. But he just asked, why? He added that he eats his wormy kind whenever they enter his cave. Victor agreed but told him that the Sabler worm is level 100 and turned the southern continent into a desert. Also, nobody puts a bounty on a god's head. This made him say that it was saddening. A lady greets them and asks if they have come to make an offering. He asks Victor what an offering is, and Victor replies to him that he gives money to the church as an offer to the gods, in place of fealty. He looks at Victor, determined, but Victor tells him that he can't be a god, not unless he reaches level 100 first. Then Victor tells the lady that they have bandit corpses outside and asks if the church of Mithras will take them. The lady replies that they can burn the corpses so they don't rise as spontaneous undead, and it is free of charge. Then another lady tells him that otherwise, Sybil's priesthood can bury them in the forest, so they can return to nature. Vancouver asks them why it is free and if they will not pay him for the transportation service, but the lady asks him back why they would pay for a public service. He tells them that they suffered significant expenses in the course of their deadification. Victor tells him that it isn't a real word, but he says that it is because he said it. The lady tells him that they do not pay people to gather corpses and if they want to be paid instead of doing good, they should go to Shesha. He asks where, and the lady points to the god, but then Victor notices Charlene there praying. He walks closer to her and asks her what she is doing there. She replies that she was praying earlier because Vancouver almost caused the temple to collapse. He asks her why she was praying to Shesha because he didn't expect her to worship the goddess of commerce, but she explains that it is more of a business deal because, unlike the other gods, Lady Shesha trades her miracles according to the market's rules. He thinks that at least they are honest and asks her how much it would cost to be transported back to his homeworld. The lady tells him to let her ask the goddess, and she will provide a price. Then Shesha shows two billion, making him shocked and he thinks that it is armed robbery. The lady explains to him that he gets a 20% reduction if he takes the premium worshipper annual subscription, and 30% if he becomes a priest. Vancouver tells the lady that his minion has no intention of leaving his current, fulfilling job, to which Victor agrees and tells the lady that they are there to sell their loot and eight bandit corpses. He asks him why only eight and Victor reminds him that he ate the others, to which he agrees. The lady tells them that they can buy the corpses to make fertilizer and she would give one gold piece per corpse. Vancouver says he wants double, but the lady sticks to one. He increases to triple, making Victor tell him that he was supposed to go lower in a negotiation. Vancouver tells them that it is only if they lack confidence, but he is a dragon so he knows his net worth. The lady firmly tells him that, dragon or not, the market absolutely sticks to one. Suddenly, someone excuses himself and tells them that he heard their argument. Then asks if they are looking to sell fresh corpses because the church of Camilla would be happy to oblige. He asks Victor who Camilla is, and Victor replies that she was one of the Dread Three. He also explains that Varen, Camilla, and Death Jester were a trio of evil adventurers before ascending to godhood, and like Sabler, people are too scared of them to ban their worship. The man tells them that he resents the evil label and explains that their goddess is simply misunderstood. Victor asks the man if Camilla didn't unleash the Red Death Plague that turned people into vampires. The man replies that it was only to prevent overpopulation, and the vampires played a critical role in winning the Century War. He then asks if they have heard of the Undeathreal Revolution, making the Shesha representative say here we go again. Charlene tells the man that she has and that necromancers buy corpses, turn them into mindless zombies, then put them to work. The man explains that it is a promising young industry, albeit scorned by the masses. The man also tells them that in time, people will see the benefits of enslaving the dead and tells them to imagine zombies laboring the fields or fearless skeletons saving helpless orphans from forest fires. Victor questioned him, asking if he desired service from decaying corpses. He responded, explaining that undead minions are seen as a status symbol amongst dragons. They don't flee, aren't tempted by wealth, and almost match the longevity of dragons. The man suggested to Victor, considering his status, that he could potentially become a necromancer and enter the market himself. He asked Victor if he was capable of raising the dead. 
Victor confirmed his abilities, but voiced his discomfort with them. Vancouver advised Victor to change his perspective for his own benefit. A woman interjected, mentioning their goddess, Shesha, and her reservations about the long-term consequences of mass necromancy. The man vehemently defended undead labor, disregarding the opinions of those attempting to suppress undead enterprises due to unproven negative environmental effects. Vancouver, addressing the man as corpseling, inquired about the cost per body. The man offered 50 gold coins per corpse if a binding contract was signed to allow them to turn the bodies into undead. The agreement was made immediately. Afterwards, outside, the man complimented the quality of the corpses and expressed his satisfaction with the transaction. Victor confessed his unease at selling corpses for post-mortem labor to a necromancer. Vancouver asked Victor why he felt this way when there's great joy in seeing one's wealth increase. He then instructed the man to give his chief of staff his fee of four coins. Victor questioned why he received only four coins when he thought he was supposed to receive a tenth of the sales, which should be forty. Vancouver claimed Victor's calculations were incorrect, reminding him he had said one one-tenth, which Victor interpreted as a tenth of a tenth. Vancouver confirmed and asked Victor if he wanted less. Victor declined stating the offer was already too generous. The man thanked them for supporting their country's modernization and asked for a blood signature on the bottom of the page. Upon providing his signature, Victor received a notification that he had gained the dead friend's personal perk, making mindless undead neutral to him unless provoked, and increasing his charisma when interacting with the undead or Camilla worshippers by five points. Vancouver mentioned his new perk and asked Victor if he had gained one as well. Victor admitted that he had, expressing his deep shame for the perk. As he was examining the perk, a woman named Charlene tapped his shoulder, requesting a moment to discuss a favor. He consented, asking her to explain the problem. She handed him a note, explaining that Henry was missing. His house had been ransacked and the note was left behind. Victor read it. It was from Scorcher Francois Villemain, proposing a negotiation for Henry's release, along with a ransom in gold, in exchange for mercy from King Vancouver Knightsbane. Victor noticed coordinates for a meeting point included in the letter. Charlene admitted she had hoped Shesha could help locate Henry, but the cost was too steep, even for the guild. Victor asked why she had made a gold offering to Shesha if she couldn't afford her services. She clarified it was a private donation. Vancouver voiced his indifference to the idea of being bribed for forgiveness, but Victor noted that the meeting point was far from Hodimer and likely a trap. Vancouver retorted, questioning if they are facing him, and tells what can they do. Victor agreed, suspecting a potential city raid in their absence. Charlene reprimanded Victor for his insensitive speculations about Henry's fate. Victor, flustered, insisted he didn't mean to cause upset, and was merely suggesting a worst-case scenario. He sought assurance from Vancouver that they would rescue Henry from the Scorchers. Vancouver confirmed their intention to save Henry, reasoning that the bounties won't claim themselves. Later, one of the kobolds happily told Victor that the blacksmith had sent them the gift he asked for. They then walked closer to him while dragging a large object. He replied that it was perfect, and he was just taking stock of their other magical items. They had a firebomb necklace that allowed him to cast the spell fireball a limited number of times, and the solar bracers increased his strength stat under the sun. There was also a ring of fire resistance, which halved fire damage, and the horn of wyvern calling. Victor used the horn, thinking it was time to get his own mini dragon. A small red dragon emerged, surprising him. Excited, he asked it if he could ride on its back. Suddenly, Vancouver arrived and accused him of betrayal, freezing Victor and the kobolds in fear. Vancouver furiously told him that he had turned his back on him for just five minutes, and he had cheated on him with a wyvern right after he had given him custody of their first minions. Panicking and fearful, Victor tried to explain to Vancouver that he was just testing the horn. One of the kobolds begged them to stop fighting, but Vancouver angrily interrupted, asking if it was because she would let him ride on her back. Victor admitted that the thought had crossed his mind. Vancouver told him that he knew his species had a shameful fixation on dragon riding, but he could never allow that. What mattered was that he was a dirty, shameless master chaser. He pointed to the necklace as proof, but Victor corrected him, saying it was not a necklace but a ring for him. Vancouver was taken aback and asked Victor if it was truly for him. Victor confirmed that it was a dragon-sized ring of invisibility, and explained that he just needed to say blink while wearing it to become invisible. Feeling regretful, Vancouver asked why he had made him doubt him, admitting he could have eaten him. From the kobold's point of view, it was a touching scene. Victor then placed the ring on Vancouver's finger, and a system notification informed him that by strengthening his bond with his vassal, he had gained two levels in Noble and Noblesse Oblige. This meant he gained a temporary boost of plus five to all his statistics when defending his vassals from their enemies. Upon saying the word blink, Vancouver became invisible, causing him to panic. He told Victor he couldn't see himself. Victor confirmed that he had indeed become invisible. One of the kobolds tapped Victor's shoulder to tell him something was wrong. 
Victor looked around and saw violet smoke surrounding them. He wondered what it was, considering it might be an evening fog. But knowing it was the middle of the day, he suspected it was a spell. Suddenly, one of the kobolds told him that the town was under attack by the Scorcher. The rangers were ready to strike, and he agreed that they should go. Vancouver, flying high in the sky, ordered them to move forward. However, he was disoriented because he couldn't see his body. He asked Victor how to turn off the invisibility, but Victor had disappeared, leaving him in panic. Meanwhile, Victor was running toward the town, unable to see his way through the fog. He called for the kobolds, asking if they could hear him, but he didn't hear anything in return. He figured the fog probably muffled the sound, but at least he could see the guild hall from there. Then he saw someone release the fog and greet the villagers. He introduced himself as Francois Vilmain and assured everyone that they came in peace, making him think it was really bad. Vilmain informed the people in the guild hall that if they opened the door and allowed them to ransack the guild hall, they would leave them unharmed. This left Charlene and the others stunned in fear. Gustave instructed Vilmain to move aside because he planned to break the door down. But Vilmain mentioned that there was no need because he could just set the place on fire with a spell and cook them alive. Gustave responded that it was not fair because Vilmain would get all the experience. Vilmain told Gustave that he thought it was fair, but then he stopped when he noticed someone and shouted that it was the Dragon Master. Victor realized that a sneak attack was no longer an option and there was no way he could confront those guys alone. His only option left was to stall. He complimented them on the nice spell and asked if it was disorienting fog. Vilmain replied that he expected a knight blade to recognize it and that his fell bishop class enabled him to cast powerful spells by using a sacrifice's HP. Like dead Henry over there, they had hoped he would leave the town to rescue him. But he didn't. Vilmain then labeled him an honorless friend. Victor thought Vilmain was not wrong because he was a friend, which meant he recognized when a scheme didn't add up. He told Vilmain that he was trying to lure the heroes away from the town, which was outlaw trick number one, and questioned him on why they were besieging Hodimer at all. Vilmain explained that Lord Brad on Mora of Ishfania had asked them to recover a magical pineapple hidden in the city, and not even a dragon tamer like him could prevent them from retrieving it. Victor wondered if Vilmain was referring to the tablet and why they would want it, but he understood that it didn't matter now. If they truly believed he was Vancouver's master, it would suffice. Then he took out the horn and warned them to surrender so he wouldn't have to use the horn of dragon binding to summon Vancouver. However, Vilmain told him that his eye for treasure perk indicated that the trinket couldn't bind a true dragon. Gustave approached Victor, shouting that enough had been said and that they should slay him and end the nonsense. Victor shouted that they were at a loss and that he would summon Vancouver. He blew the horn, summoning the dragon. The bandits fled, causing Vilmain to become angry, declaring that it wasn't a dragon and that it was a trick. Victor commanded his dragon to attack. It launched toward Gustave, who was shocked because he had another pet. However, he merely stepped on Gustave's head and launched an attack on Vilmain. Vilmain blocked the attack and smirked at him, saying that he had chosen death. This left him stunned in fear. Then, Vilmain swung his sword upwards, sending him flying back. He managed to regain his balance, knowing that there was no way he could win against the two in a fight as they were each twice his level. But for the sake of the people still trapped in the guild hall and for Charlene, he had to try. Vilmain dismounted his horse and mentioned that Victor only wanted to delay them until his dragon arrived. Vilmain then approached him, pulling out a gun and warning him that he wouldn't live long enough for that to happen because, as they say, one should never bring a knife to a gunfight. Victor recognized the flintlock in Vilmain's hand and called him out on it, labeling it as cheating. As his eyes darted to Charlene in the guild hall, fear evident on her face, Vilmain retorted that once Victor was gone, he could simply lie and declare a fair victory. He pulled the trigger suddenly, forcing Victor to yell at Charlene to duck for cover. Simultaneously, he leaped away, urging everyone else to do the same. The projectile shattered the guildhall window, terrifying Charlene and the children. Vilmain seized the opportunity to launch himself at Victor, complimenting his courage. Miraculously, Victor managed to parry the attack while Vilmain boasted about his superior level. As he nervously blocked Vilmain's strikes, Victor conceded to the man's advantage but observed that most of his skill set was long-ranged. Disarming Vilmain, Victor unleashed his own assault, noting that Vilmain's long-range prowess wasn't quite suited for close-quarters combat. As Vilmain's sword tumbled through the air and embedded itself into the ground, Vilmain crumpled onto his knees, dropping his firearm. Mortally wounded, he collapsed while Victor declared that, as promised, he would claim a fair fight. Gustave, witnessing this, calls Vilmain a fool. As the dragon launches at Gustave, with a swift motion, he severed Victor's dragon, approaching him menacingly while Victor stood petrified in shock. Gustave, rage written on his face, vowed to demonstrate Victor's worthlessness without his dragon. Victor could sense the imminent danger, but he was relieved to still possess his firebomb necklace. 
he launched a fireball at Gustave, who easily deflected it while ordering Vilmain to cast a spell and wrap things up. Victor whipped around in response to this and saw Vilmain, shaky but determined, aiming his gun at him, prepared to fire. Just as things seemed dire, the kobolds arrived and engaged Vilmain. Amid the chaos, one of them queried if the others could sense something unusual. In response, the blue one expressed affirmation, feeling an increase in power. An automated system message congratulated the monster squire for his ambush, awarding a level up for each of the kobolds. Elated, he congratulated his allies, oblivious to the impending assault. Gustave's attack sent him flying, all the while grumbling about the number of reptiles Victor commanded and labeling Vilmain a weakling. The sight of Gustave terrified the kobolds who watched as Gustave unleashed his revenge, decimating the blue and yellow kobolds. In fear and fury, the remaining kobolds vowed retaliation, only to be flung aside by Gustave's power. Victor was trembling with anger when he saw two kobolds die in front of him, leaving others injured. Gustave asked Vilmain if he could walk. Vilmain replied that he had used up all his spell power, so he needed assistance. However, Gustave simply replied that it was a pity. He then raised his sword in the air and proclaimed more experience for himself. With a swift movement, he cut off Vilmain's head and started walking towards Victor. Victor heard something, which made him wonder if it was his heartbeat. When Gustave got close, he called Victor a dragon tamer. He raised his sword, telling Victor it was his time to die. This made Victor wonder if this was the end, if this was how he would die again. But suddenly, something squeezed Gustave as if he was fruit in a blender, leaving him shaking and shocked. Vancouver then told him that he had finally found him and that he could not see where he was going. He asked him how to turn it off. Victor replied that he needed to say Blink again. Vancouver couldn't believe it and shouted Blink, making his invisibility vanish. He happily declared that this was much better and that, at last, he was ready to fight the bandits. Victor couldn't believe that Vancouver had destroyed all of them and didn't even notice them before. But he was relieved that Vancouver had saved the city and him, even though he couldn't save everyone. The pink cobbled cried out that Yellow had been the best minion of all and that she should have been the one to die. The red one suggested they should sell their corpses, as that would have been their wish. The black one said that this way, they would forever be part of their majesty's horde. Victor looked at them sadly, but was shocked when a system notification informed him he had gained seven levels in Monster Squire, Monster Life Force, Red Dragon, which means his type changed to humanoid and dragon. He also gained immunity to drain, paralysis, fatigue, instant death, and disease, as well as resistance to dire and aging, vulnerability to frost, fairy and dragon slayer. Moreover, he gained monster rider, which meant he could ride monsters with medium proficiency without any penalty while fighting mounted. He could also use his own or his mount's agility for checks, whichever was higher. Lastly, he gained monster insight, which meant he could observe a monster and learn about their strengths and weaknesses. Charlene rushed out of the guild hall and asked if he was okay. He told her he was alive, and she gave him a healing potion. Vancouver asked the remaining bandits where they were and reassured them that he didn't bite, he burned. Charlene told Victor that he had been foolish but incredibly brave. He told her he couldn't abandon her, making her shyly thank him. He then told Charlene he had been wanting to ask her something. When Charlene sweetly asked him what it was, he asked her if she wanted to breathe, leaving her stunned. On the other hand, Vancouver went back to the town. He was upset that it took the whole night but was glad that he finally beat all of the manling's bandits. Suddenly, a system message popped up congratulating him for beating the Scorcher. So, he gained four levels in Gladiator and Crowd Favorite. This means he got a random boost when he impressed a crowd during a fight. Plus, he had a small chance of getting an item if the crowd cheered for him. He was happy that he could get an item if he impressed his fans because he could gain more for his horde. Then the system showed that he also gained super crit. This meant double the chances of his physical attacks causing critical hits. He wondered what a critical hit was. Suddenly, he heard a horse coming towards him and someone shouted, Halt, in the name of the king. A lady stopped in front of him. She found out that it was true that Hodimer was taken by a great red dragon. He proudly said that he was indeed great and introduced himself as Vancouver, Knightsbane, first of his name, the great disaster of that age, and king of the Albane Mountains. But the lady told him there was no king of the mountain. She introduced herself as Duchess Eleanor of Uskal, the second cousin of the king, but he cut her off by saying she was not a princess. This made her angry and she asked what he meant. Angrily, he told her she was not a princess, so she was not worth his time. She said she was of royal blood, but he just called Victor and said the food was talking back. She showed him a poster and told him he was wanted for destruction in Hodimer and Valbane. A bounty of 120,000 gold coins had been put on him. Vancouver was shocked to hear the price and told her to cancel it. 
she was mad and asked if he denied the charges against him. He said no, but added he was worth more, at least 1 million, and that was him being modest. Then he told her to tell her human king to fix his net worth. The knight shouted at him that he dared to insult the god-chosen king of Gardamage. He ordered him to say sorry right away, but Vancure just spread his wings and asked why he would say sorry. They should say sorry to him because just being weak in his presence was an insult. Then he angrily told them he was a dragon and that their tiny gods answer to him. They paid him to kill their kind. Plus, he saved the town from bad manlings. They would give him a reward for his help. But the lady yelled that she had enough and ordered the knights to kill him. A knight ran at him to attack, but he just put his hand on the duchess and pushed her away like a bug. He looked down and was glad that he finally saw a reward. He picked up the gold necklace and the system showed that he turned on crowd favorite. For making fun of the food, he gained the taunt personal perk. This means his taunts may make their targets go berserk. He raised his hand and asked who he should poke next. The people ran away in fear while he was poking and attacking the knights. Meanwhile, in the guild hall, Victor couldn't believe it. He never thought she would agree to go out with him, let alone sleep together. He said sorry to her for being so blunt earlier, but she said she kind of liked people who were straight to the point. Then the system message popped up, showing them that they gained the personal perk, Romantic. This means they got a plus 5 charisma bonus when talking to the opposite sex. Charlene was shocked to see it and asked why the price was so low. This made him ask her what she meant. She said that at the temple, she paid the goddess Shesha to make her dating life better and the price surprised her. He asked her what she meant by it, and she said she didn't think it was really important. But he asked her how much it cost. She said it was 50 coins, making him shocked. He asked if it was worth 50 coins. She said it was not her fault if he was easy. He reminded her that she agreed to it too. Later, when they got dressed, she asked him, where do we go from here? He replied that now their quest was over, Vancouver would likely take him back to his mountain. She said she didn't know and that she was supposed to stay in Hotimer. Then she asked if they would keep in touch. As he opened the door, he thought it was the end of his dating life. But just as he was about to leave, she called out to him. Sweetly, she wished him good luck. He smiled, wished her good luck too, and then shut the door. The cobbled saw him and asked if he was done breeding. They suggested a new generation would help with the minion shortage, which made him wonder if they were serious. He greeted a man named Jules and asked if he was there for business. Jules said yes and told him his minions informed him that he planned to recycle half their team. He agreed and asked Jules if there was a way to bring them back to life, truly to life. Jules replied that true resurrection was beyond his or anyone else's power he knew. Jules then asked if he was under level 20 because it was easier to unlock new classes before that threshold. He said he had reached level 17 the previous day, and Jules told him he could become a necromancer and raise them as sentient undead. He then asked Jules if he could do this himself. Jules said he only raised non-intelligent undead for legal reasons, but he could guide him to his first necromancer level. The Red Cobble told him not to do it because they had gladly given their lives for him. He explained that they saved his life, so he owed them at least that much. He then pointed his hand at the yellow and blue cobolds, activating something that caused a circle around the dead cobolds to light up. The dead cobold was engulfed in blue fire while Jules shouted at him to use the power, the unlimited power. A system message appeared, showing that he had gained a level in Necromancer and Animate Dead. This meant he could revive corpses as undead with a touch and by sacrificing money or items. He could bring a living being back as an intelligent undead, keeping both the original soul and class levels. The funds needed to revive someone depended on the soul's value. The dead cobolds turned into skeletons and stood up, which made him ask if they were alright. They stared at them in shock. Suddenly, they shouted brains, and lunged at them, causing him to panic and ask if the perk had failed. To his surprise, the dead cobolds laughed, and the blue one told him they were just joking. They were the same, except they could see their own clavicles. The orange one added that his new voice was awesome and they had met their doom, making the other cobolds happy that they were back. They hugged him, making him glad they had survived. He thought maybe things wouldn't be so bad after all. Suddenly, something was thrown through the window and he heard Vancouver calling him. Jules checked it and saw that it was another corpse. He remarked that their partnership kept getting better. He went outside, and Vancouver proudly showed him the gold the knights had given him. Vancouver explained that he finally understood the concept of giving and pointed with his finger. He said it was a magic finger because each time he poked someone with it, he got treasures and levels. He happily told Victor that it was time to return to his horde and ordered him to gather the other minions. They were leaving at sundown. Victor told him that Duchess Aelinor of Uskal was supposed to lead that band of knights. He asked if perhaps they should check on her for a reward. Vancouver remembered her and told Victor he had eaten her. Victor was stunned and shocked. 
He asked Vancouver why he ate the quest giver, the king's cousin, and why he did such a thing. Vancouver replied that she was annoying, wouldn't pay him, and wasn't a princess. Also, he was trying to be the best dragon adventurer in the world and all he received was criticism. Vancouver told him not to look at him like that, saying there were plenty of knights around for a barbecue if he was hungry. He looked up and asked the gods, why me? Later, on Vancouver's mountain, a sign warns everyone of a dragon. It tells people they don't have any hope and should turn around. Vancouver sleeps soundly atop his gold. Meanwhile, Victor tells someone to leave, asking if they miss the signposts. The person questions if it is a dragon's lair. Victor says yes and warns the person that they stand no chance. All the while, Vancouver grows angry at the noise. Suddenly, a loud noise startles him. Victor commands his kobolds to fire. Vancouver rises, asking Victor what's going on. Victor explains that a dragon slayer is the cause. Vancouver, annoyed, peeks outside and sees an even bigger group this time. Yet, he finds it amusing. When someone attacks him with a bolt of lightning, it simply bounces off. He asks Victor if they should have learned their lesson after past defeats. Victor replies that the reward for Vancouver's capture is high, and their hideout is well known. He takes a deep breath and roars, causing the mountain to tremble and people to flee. Seeing them trapped in the snow, he declares the problem solved. A message informs him he's leveled up, making him happy. He had needed this new level to get a nice bonus. Victor warns him that this can't continue, that despite their warnings, people keep coming. The kobolds are worn out and can't repeat their new slogan in peace. He tells Victor he's as annoyed as him, but can't stop people from getting themselves killed. Victor expresses his frustration at having to kill these fools and suggests they move. This annoys Vancouver, who asks Victor if he doesn't appreciate having shelter and a great view. Victor complains about the cold and the lack of food variety. Plus, the cave won't hold all their treasures for much longer. Vancouver concedes Victor has a point. Yet, he'd have more treasure if his guild halls hadn't suddenly emptied. Victor reminds him that he ate the last quest giver. Vancouver argues the man refused to pay him. Victor agrees but mentions she was royal kin, which means no quests for a while. However, they could always find treasure in a dungeon for a new lair. Victor explains most local dungeons are looted, but not those near the Ishfanian border. Vancouver wonders which dungeon can hold his growing hoard. After some thought, Victor suggests the underwater city of Meropes, home to mermaids. But Vancouver wants a warmer, inland location. Victor recommends the Antlion Pit, located in a dry desert, but a cobbled warns them of needle-shooting cacti there. Vancouver shouts next. Victor then suggests a castle in a volcano. Intrigued, Vancouver asks about the amount of lava. Victor explains he's unsure but the castle of Murmurin has a spooky reputation. It was an Ishfanian Inquisition fortress, then the lair of a lick. The demon king Brandon Mora sent General Furibin to claim the castle during the century law, and the Inquisition fought the lick general. But Vancouver interrupts him after 20 words. Confused, Victor asks what he means. Vancouver explains he tunes out after 20 boring words, though gold, treasure, and money don't count. Victor let out a tired sigh and told him that the lick living in the castle is bad. But killing it is good and comes with a great prize. Vancouver asked Victor what he meant by a prize. Victor shared that the Inquisition stored their wealth in a vault under the castle. The place called Gardamagni also gives the lands around the castle, even though they have long been empty. But the Red Cobbled told him that it wasn't really empty. He explained that many burrows made their homes near the castle, including their own. The Black One told him that there are many minions in that area. The Blue One also said that there's a village. He asked how the village stayed safe. The red one answered that the old one said it was due to Bad Moon Mojo. The pink one told him that they ate all the explorers for miles. Vancouver snaps his fingers and said that there would be no more thieves and that they had won him over. He then told his minions to get ready because castles are the new caves. This made the kobolds happy and excited. Victor told him that the lick had killed every explorer trying to hunt it down. But he simply asked Victor if a lick is a type of undead. Victor told him that a lick is the most powerful of the undead. They are spellcasters who turn to dark magic to live longer. Just like Gustave and Vilmain, Furibin serves Brad on Mora, the king of the demons in Ishfania. But he simply asked, who cares? And told Victor that he would beat the lick like the rest of their weak kind. He then told Victor that they should move his treasure to his new castle. This made Victor ask him how they would move all that gold. He told him to find a bag. Victor asked why they would need a bag for the entire horde. But he said to find a very big bag unless he had a better idea. Because gold can't fly. Victor looked at the kobolds and thought that maybe it could fly. He thought he saw something on the tablet. He then picked up the pineapple of wisdom, or the tablet. Vancouver told him that it didn't look like any vegetable he had ever seen. Victor said that it was more like a record. He looked at the tablet and found plans for flying machines in the files he could open. He was quite sure that this was why the Scorcher wanted it. He told them that they didn't have the tech to build a real blimp. But if they all worked together, Vancouver cut him off and said his job was to watch over the project. 
he knew where they could find the workers. This left Victor surprised and puzzled. One hour later, they were in the city of Valbane. The people were shocked to see that Vancure was back. Vancure landed and called the people peasants. This scared them, and they started to cry. The kobolds laughed while Victor hid his face. Then Vancure told everyone that they would work for him. He paid them with his heartfelt thanks. This made Victor say sorry to the people over and over. Then the people started to work together. The kobolds watched them work. One of them asked another if they said they would leave the region forever when it was done. His friend said that this thought gave her strength. A few hours later, it was done. Victor told him that they should see if the thing could fly. Vancure replied with confidence that it would. Vancure blew it up and it flew high, leaving the people amazed because they had done it. The pink one told Victor that they were so high that she could barely see the ground. Victor admitted that it was a great sight. Vancure gave the order to set sail from Murmurant onward to his new castle. They saluted in agreement. Then they started to fly away while the people cheered and celebrated because they had left. A few moments later, they arrived at the region bordering Murmurin, Ishfania, and Garda Magni. Vancouver told Victor it was strange, he remembered flying over that region two centuries ago, and it looked much greener. Victor expressed surprise that they managed to reach the place safely. Blue happily shouted that only their chief of staff could harness the Pineapple of Wisdom's true power, and it worked on the first try. Victor asked them if they meant the first attempt after they had crashed the eight prototypes. He explained that it probably would have been more if not for his new intelligence points. Vancouver asked him if it was the dungeon, and Victor replied affirmatively, adding that it was the castle of Murmurin. Vancouver looked around and saw a tower, creatures, and lava, but he was delighted and told Victor it was perfect. It had lava and towers, and with the village nearby, they had a food stockpile for winter. It was the ideal place to stash a horde. Victor agreed but reminded him that the Lick, who currently owns the castle, must have seen them coming. Vancor corrected Victor, stating it was the previous owner. He asked what his name was again. Victor, shocked, replied that his name was Furibun. Vancouver then flew towards the castle, ordering Victor to announce his presence to Furibun. Victor shouted Furibun's name, telling him that Majesty Vancouver Knightsbane, King of Albane Mountain and the greatest adventurer ever, wished to speak with him. Vancouver reminded Victor not to forget the great calamity of that age, a title he had worked hard for, which annoyed Victor. However, Furibun didn't respond, and Victor informed Vancouver he didn't think Furibun heard him. Suddenly, Furibun emerged from the mid-air portals, angrily asking what all the racket was about. The system showed Victor that Furibun was level 58, which seemed insanely high to him. Furibun asked if they were King Vancouver's Knightsbane and Victor Dalton. Victor asked Furibun how he knew their names and if he was expecting them. Vancouver told Furibun that indeed, he was a king and he wanted his crown. Furibun replied that he had been expecting them. His master, Brandon Mora, had warned him they had destroyed his agents in Hodimer and stolen the Pineapple of Wisdom. He gave them a choice, return the device to its rightful owner or perish in his dungeon. He admitted he preferred the latter as he had devised many new traps and death pits for adventurers, but none had dared to visit. They were stunned by Furibun's words. Victor sarcastically told Furibun that he guessed death traps were his hobby. Furibun, annoyed by this, asked if he was a sarcastic mortal. Then, Furibun attacked Victor with a black curse. The kobolds panicked and anxiously called for their chief, but Victor managed to keep his balance and tauntingly told Furibun it was a nice spell, shocking the kobolds. Furibun was also taken aback and asked him how he was still standing. Victor replied, Thanks to my monster squire class, I've just learned a perk called Black Curse. The system showed him that he had learned the monster perk, Black Curse. It meant curse effect, ADSP, single spell, and removes all buffs, reduces all stats by one stage minus five, and prevents the victim from recovering HP as long as the curse remains. Then Victor attacked Furibun using Black Curse. He hit him, but he just said, A monster squire trying to fight me with his own perk is cute. Vancouver furiously shouted at Furibun, stop bullying my minions. To attack my chief of staff is to disrespect me. But Furibun just launched an attack at him, saying, if you wish to fight me, I agree. I will take back the pineapple. But Vancouver just poked him and he was thrown back to his castle. Vancouver furiously looked at Furibun, who was dead and in pieces on the ground. The system showed him that he had gained a level in Gladiator. The kobolds cheered for him for being the best dragon, while Victor was shocked. He asked Victor where is the treasure, Furibun should have dropped it. But Victor told him, Furibun is not dead. Vancouver replied, Furibun is dead. He was undead, and he was dead before I killed him. Victor explained, Furibun is a lick. His soul is held inside a container that allows him to revive at will. Suddenly, Furibun was intact again. He furiously asked Vancouver, how dare you touch me? I will turn your hide into a carpet. Vancouver responded, how dare you survive my poke? Now, I will need to use my full hand. Furibun activated his greater fire resistance, magic ward, stone ward, hasten, and pestilence shield. He told Vancouver, I can't wait to turn you into a handbag. 
Vanquer replied, as if you can. A dragon has no weaknesses. Furibon used his crimson shield and said, You say a dragon has no weaknesses. What about your horde? Vancouver shouted, Don't you dare touch my horde. But Furibon had a better idea. He used Transmute Gold to lead and attacked Vancouver's horde. The gold turned into ashes, stunning Victor and the cobbles. Vancouver angrily looked at his horde and touched it, but it turned to ashes. Victor shook in fear and called for Vancouver. Furibon laughed, I've lived for centuries and I've never seen a dragon make that face. Victor told the gods, this won't end well. We have to flee. Vancouver's eyes filled with anger. Victor saw this and told the cobbles, steer the balloon away. We must leave now. Fly for your lives. Vancouver faced Furibon furiously, but Furibon just said, now that I've taken what you value most, should we make a deal? Return the pineapple at once and I will change your gold back. But a powerful light flashed in front of Furibon and the volcano erupted, causing ocean waves to rise. The system showed that Vancouver was in a berserk state. Furibon tried to say, maybe this was a mistake. But Vancouver just punched Furibon, throwing him into the lava of the volcano. He then released a powerful fire and burned down the castle and the creatures leaving the lava. He shouted Furibon's name in anger while the volcano exploded uncontrollably. The fearful cobbles asked their chief, Victor, for orders. But Victor, also in fear, ordered them, never say the L word in Vancouver's presence ever again. Later, Victor noticed that things had been this way for two hours, and he doubted that Vancouver would cool off anytime soon. Therefore, he released the anchor from the ground. The pink cobbled asked him if their majesty would be alright. He replied that he thought Vancouver would calm down. When that happened, they would provide their full emotional support. Additionally, they decided not to mention the incident again, a point the cobbles agreed upon. He then gazed at the ashes of gold and wondered what they could do with them. They decided to descend from the ship while Yellow suggested to Victor that maybe an alchemist could restore the ashes to their original state. Pink chimed in, hinting that someone from their old warren might assist, reminding him that their family lived nearby. He ordered them to inquire with their family about any known alchemists, as he would inspect the village in the meantime. Pink, however, insisted they couldn't leave Vancouver in his hour of need. Victor pointed to the erupting volcano and reassured them, saying that restoring the horde was their best option. He suggested they should head to their warren for help, as it was their mission. The cobbles wondered if he planned to replace them, and if their lives would have meaning should more competent cobbles be found. He reassured them he wasn't replacing anyone. Then, he remembered they should begin recruiting in case Vancouver got hungry. A plan formed in his mind, and he proudly promoted the cobbles from interns to minion lieutenants, the elite of the elite. He then ordered them to recruit more interns, accepting only the best because the honor of Vancouver demanded it. Overwhelmed with joy, the cobbles saluted him and enthusiastically agreed. They then happily set off to recruit, leaving Victor with the thought that Cobbles, and even Vancouver, could be quite adorable at times. He began to walk, acknowledging that life could become chaotic, but he thought he could adapt. Later, he arrived at the Murmurin Gate and saw an abundance of sheep, which made him wonder why there were so many. He felt uneasy about the place and questioned if its name was Moon Mojo. Suddenly, a house door swung open, surprising him. A man and a lady greeted him. The man introduced himself as Kwasan and his sister as Chocolatine. Chocolatine welcomed him to Murmurin, asking if he came to hunt the dragon that was frightening their livestock. He responded by asking if they were vampires by any chance. Kwasan, while shielding his sister, hastily assured Victor they were not vampires because they found the concept tasteless and the sun was up. He then asked Victor why he made such an accusation. Victor remembered he had monster insight. He noticed that Kwasan de Jevadin was a werewolf, a humanoid beast. He was resilient against moon, beast, madness, and fairy attacks, but weak against silver, manslayer, and beast slayer attacks. He also seemed a bit rough, especially if the name Jevadin was mentioned. Mentioning Jevadin made him quite upset, almost as much as if someone were to date his sister. The werewolf Chocolatine de Jevadin has the same strength and weaknesses as her older brother. She is a priestess of the beast god, Isengrim. She may look sweet and innocent, but she's far from it. She wonders if she should cook her prey in stew or pepper sauce. When a man named Kwasan saw they were werewolves, he was shocked and fell to the ground. He thought he might be one of them because he looked familiar. Chocolatine used her magic to scan a man named Victor. She told her brother it was okay because Victor was also a monster, a mix of humanoid and dragon. Kwasan thought Victor was a homeless traveler who would not be missed. He helped Victor up from the ground. Victor was afraid they were going to kill him, but Kwasan assured him that they wouldn't. Kwasan explained that the villagers wanted to sacrifice someone to the Moon Man, believing a dragon's rampage was punishment for their tardiness. Kwasan shouted that they could drop their disguises because Victor was also a monster. The disguised villagers, who were actually monsters, were disappointed because they lost their dinner. When Victor saw a huge humanoid monster holding a lady, he trembled in fear. 
the lady asked the huge man, Rolo, if Victor was a newcomer. Rolo wondered if Victor was a farmer because he needed help in the fields. The lady didn't think so, but suggested welcoming him anyway. The houses, which were also monsters, moved, causing Victor to be shocked. Victor saw a person named Saverus and asked a sheepman if it was her. Saverus recognized Victor and told him it had been a while. Victor happily told her he still had the mark of the thieves' guilt. Saverus expressed regret that he had left them because he was a good repossessor. Victor told her his last theft had not gone well and asked what she was doing there. Saverus explained that the Nightblades Guild Masters sent her to establish a warehouse. She wondered if Victor had always been a disguised dragon monster. Victor explained his change was recent and asked if this was a secret monster community. Quasin explained that they disguised themselves to fool wandering adventurers so they wouldn't be killed. Chocolatine added that they would kill them in their sleep. They even had a school to teach mimics to blend in. Quasin wondered if Victor was related to a certain dragon, as he was a dragon type. Victor explained that they had come to take over a castle, but the owner tricked his master, who didn't take it well. Quasin told him to get in, and said that Furibin had been a cave troll in life. Undeath hadn't improved his attitude. Moreover, Furibin left them alone, so they didn't bother him. But Furibin grew angry when they killed adventurers before he could. He speculated that Furibin was bored and lonely in his castle. Saverus asked if it was true that he had fed the Duchess of Uskal to a dragon, which excited Chocolatine. She asked if he really did it, but he replied that he didn't, Vancouver had eaten her on his own. Quasin took his sister aside and welcomed Victor to their community. He then asked how long Victor planned to stay. Victor replied that he didn't know, he guessed he'd stay as long as the dragon did. This prompted Quasin to ask if Victor might show him around because they were new there too. Quasin also said that they used to live in the woods of Jevodden in Gardamagni, the best hunting grounds they'd ever had. He recalled that times were good, they had plenty of food, which they shared with local trolls. This made him wonder if Quasin was referring to the woods of Jevodden, the forest Vancouver had burned down. As Quasin was explaining this, he mentioned that the burning occurred after some human and his red dragon pet had arrived. Quasin swore that if they found them, he would kill them. Meanwhile, he began sweating in fear, confusing Saverus. Suddenly, Chocolatine told her brother that it was Victor. Victor tried to escape, saying it was a beautiful day outside and a shame he had to leave. As he ran, Quasin furiously chased him, and Chocolatine excitedly told him to come back, as he wouldn't outrun her brother. This frightened Victor and made him call for Vancouver. Hours later, at the crater, Vancouver was catching his breath, as was Furibin, who was sweating in fear. He furiously ordered Furibin to come out and die again, calling him a cowardly mage. But Furibin, who was inside his castle shielded, replied that he'd never come out because his castle was burned. Furibin was reminded angrily that he had poisoned Vancouver's horde. And Furibin retaliated by reminding him that he had been poked in the face and called Vancouver an arrogant lizard. He angrily flew away, swearing to Furibin that he would find a way in, and when he did, he would take the castle and Furibin's silly crown. Furibin retorted, telling him to try over his undead body. He responded that he would do so with pleasure. He knew it might have started as a quest, but now it was a war, the War of the Horde. He remembered his poor horde and decided he needed to take care of it. Surely, his trusty minions had put it somewhere safe. He then flew towards their ship and saw that his horde was safe, but he couldn't find any of his minions. He wondered if they'd run away like goblins, but he was sure that Victor wouldn't do that because Victor loved him too much. He must have wandered somewhere close. On the other hand, the humanoid monsters were raising their torches and pitchforks in anger. Quasin looked satisfied, observing the octopus casting a spell, while Saverus and the lady were stunned, watching the crying Victor. Vancouver thought Victor was alright. Victor, who was tied to a tree, shouted that their world sucked. Victor told them he was not a virgin and felt worthless as a sacrifice. Chocolatine asked her brother if it was a smart idea given that Victor was an ally of the dragon, which was already angry. However, Quasin reminded his sister that Victor had burned down their previous house, causing Chocolatine to voice her fear of him destroying their current home. The lady agreed with Chocolatine, deeming the idea stupid and, not to mention, barbaric. Saverus also concurred, expressing his belief that Victor was simply following the dragon's orders. In response, Victor, raising his voice, confirmed he was compelled to watch as Vancouver wreaked havoc. Quasin explained that after their home was devastated by the dragon, the Adventurer's Guild confirmed Victor, as the dragon's human partner, had led the creature to their forest. He also reiterated that Vancouver had caused the destruction independently. Despite this, an agitated Quasin insisted that Victor had still led Vancouver to their home and shared his despair at seeing all his livestock perish, his house burn down, and democracy's triumph. Saverus apologized to Victor because he couldn't do anything, and Victor asked if Saverus wasn't going to untie him. Saverus, however, responded that such an act would endanger his life. Victor sighed in defeat, musing that Saverus hadn't changed and it was true that people's lives flash before their eyes at the end. 
he remembered it had been only two years since he arrived in Outremont. Previously, he was an average student studying economics in Chicago, naive, burdened with student debt, and full of hope. Then, he heard a girl from his campus, whom he shared several classes with, crying out for help. Believing it was his chance to be a hero, he ran to her aid. But it ended poorly when the assailant stabbed him and the girl fled, leaving him wounded and crying out for help. He drew parallels to Japanese novels where the protagonist dies at the beginning, either by murder or hit by truck con, but he had experienced both. The next thing he knew, he woke up in a pitch black room. He had read enough to know what to expect. A beautiful goddess was supposed to ask him to save a fantasy world. But instead, he received a dice that ordered him to roll it. Confused, Victor asked why, and the dice introduced itself as the god of random numbers and demanded him to roll it. When Victor questioned the purpose, the dice, annoyed, explained it was for his afterlife and commanded him to roll again. Victor obliged and rolled the dice, realizing his retirement in the fantasy world wouldn't proceed as he expected. The dice informed him he had rolled a three, which meant he would be reincarnated in Outramon with only his clothes and his mark. A blinding light appeared beneath him, shocking him, then swallowed him whole. As he shouted in disbelief, the dice simply retorted that as a god, it didn't have to make sense. A system then revealed he had gained the claim by dice trait, meaning when he levels up, he has an additional 10% chance to gain a skill or luck points, and his chances of inflicting or receiving a critical hit are doubled. He found himself in the kingdom of Gardamagni, knowing nothing about this new world, not even the language, but he learned quickly. While they wielded axes and swords, all he had were a shirt and pants, which he lost, leaving him with nothing. He managed to reach a city named Noblecor, but nobody would help him. He lay shivering on the ground, wondering if anyone had spare clothes, but the passersby just glanced at him and continued walking. Suddenly, he heard someone call out to him. Looking towards the alley, he asked the person if they spoke English. The person behind the door told him to lower his voice and admitted to speaking a bit of his language. They also identified him as a new claim by observing the mark on his arm. Confused, Victor asked what claim meant. The person explained that a claim was someone chosen by the gods and reincarnated in their world. When Victor asked if there were others like him, the person revealed there were thousands and they were hailed as Gardamagna's heroes. Shining Knight Kia was the most renowned, but the ones chosen by the dice, like him, were deemed unlucky. They added that it was the work of the God of Luck, who summoned people at random. Saverus then told him that they could discuss that inside, after he put on some clothes. He introduced himself as Saverus. Victor Dalton, stunned at first, smiled and introduced himself. Saverus asked him if he was looking for a job, since he was new in town, and one of his guys had fallen down the stairs after talking to the wrong people. Victor asked Saverus if it was an honest job, but Saverus replied that he couldn't promise that. He would, however, ensure food, a roof, and friends in low places. Feeling desperate, Victor decided to become a thief. He joined the Nightblades, Gardamagna's greatest thief and assassin guild. Under Saverus's supervision, Victor learned the local tongue and realized that this lifestyle had its benefits. He developed a talent for lock picking, gaining the supernatural ability to pick locks. Additionally, he learned to pickpocket undetected, given a successful skill check. He also developed an eye for treasure, which allowed him to identify the properties of any item within his line of sight instantly. Moreover, he became a master with daggers and knives, doubling the damage and increasing the chances of inflicting critical hits by 10%. However, Victor soon realized that a thief's life was a dead-end job. He would either end up in jail or dead. After two years, he contemplated a career change. Saverus asked if he really wanted to leave, especially since he was their best earner. Victor replied that he had no choice, as the new boss seemed more interested in assassinations than income distribution. Saverus understood, noting the new guildmaster's bloodthirsty tendencies. Victor told Saverus that staying would likely force him into the assassin profession, a line he wasn't willing to cross. Saverus, however, cautioned that one could only retire from the Nightblades in a coffin. This prompted Victor to ask if Saverus planned to betray him. Saverus assured him that he was a friend and made him an offer, leave by dawn, and he would pretend Victor had been hanged by the city watch. Grateful, Victor thanked Saverus. Saverus raised his mug in a toast, warning Victor not to return, or he would have to kill him to save face. He liked Victor, but not enough to die for him. Victor thought this was fair, acknowledging that he owed Saverus one. That night, he left Noblecore and never looked back. Victor decided to become an adventurer, like the knights of old, seeking a fresh start. Valbane's adventurer guild was recruiting, so he headed there. Charlene registered him as an independent adventurer. Victor thanked her for overlooking his past, and Charlene replied that everyone deserved a second chance, even thieves. She then asked which quest he wanted to tackle first. He pointed at a quest with a rapier symbol and inquired about it. 
Charlene replied that it had been sitting there for a while, but he was welcome to try it. Reading the quest, he realized he just had to climb a mountain and recover a lost sword. He thought it would be easy, but he ended up tied to a tree. Something huge appeared in the sky, and people were yelling at him to stop burning houses. He was paralyzed with fear, much like the humanoid monsters that were also staring at the sky. A gigantic octopus-like creature emerged, and a man yelled out for the moon child to accept their sacrifice of flesh and blood. In that moment, Victor did the only thing he could, he called for help. Desperate, he repeatedly cried out for Vancouver's assistance. Suddenly, the enormous humanoid monster roared loudly, causing them to scream in fear. Quasin shielded his little sister, afraid, but Chocolatine thought it was quite beautiful. The humanoid monsters were frozen in terror. Victor developed a headache from looking at it, but his system indicated that his charisma check was successful and he'd managed to prevent insanity. The gigantic octopus spotted them and angrily asked why it was them again and when it would end. The octopus man identified it as the mighty child of the moon man and pleaded with it to accept their sacrifice as reparation for their wrongdoings. However, it was irritated and hit the stage, telling the man that he couldn't understand his squishy tongue movements. Skin back, but one day he would lose his restraint. The octopus man announced to the people that the moon beast was responding to them, mere mortals. Victor wondered if they couldn't comprehend what it was saying and noticed that it didn't seem pleased to be there either. Then, he told it he wanted to clarify he was not involved in creating this chaos. This prompted it to ask him if he spoke Arlaihian. He confirmed that he did, explaining that he could understand it thanks to his monster kin perk. This revelation caused the octopus man to panic, amazed that Victor could comprehend the moon beast without going mad. Victor informed it that since he could also comprehend its speech, he wanted to express how unappetizing it was. This shocked it, and it asked him why he would eat it when it didn't even have pseudopods. It went on to express disgust at his moving gametes and said he looked like a tumor with his large, repugnant hair. Victor agreed and admitted that having hair was almost as awful as being tied to a tree, and threatened with death. However, it assured him that it would reveal what was truly horrific. Then it began to recount that it was minding its own business, enjoying its once in an eon vacation before the stars aligned and it had to return to work. It was on the verge of devouring a tasty telepathic spider when someone teleported it just as it had its meal in its tendrils and threw a screaming human child at it. Then it angrily informed him that this happened every single moon cycle. This revelation made Victor understand why it was so frustrated. Victor suggested it could eat them instead of him, but Saverus cautioned Victor not to involve them. It explained that the Moon Man was a neglectful god, so his children had to care for his few cults. It just wished they would stop summoning it all the time. It was unsure where they got the idea that the Moon Man required live sacrifices. Victor speculated that it was likely because they couldn't understand what it was saying. He offered to help make them stop if it wished. It agreed and asked if he could. Victor replied that it would have to spare him first. Without hesitation, it agreed and cut the ropes holding him. Freed from the tree, Victor asked what its name was. It revealed its name to be Tholgathar. Meanwhile, Kwasan accused Victor of being the stranger who burnt down their home and insisted that someone should intervene. However, the octopus man denied his plea because the moon beast had spared the sacrifice to serve as its spokesperson. Victor then relayed that Fulgathar stated moonly sacrifices were unnecessary to show devotion to its ancestor. The people were silent momentarily, but suddenly, the octopus man tearfully asked Victor how they could honor the moon man. Victor asked Fulgathar what they should replace the sacrifice with. Fulgathar responded that they must moonwalk every full moon and then consume their own fecal matter. Victor questioned whether they really needed to do this, to which Fulgathar jokingly responded no. Fulgathar then instructed him to tell them to pray to the moon man for insight by reading forbidden texts under the moonlight, and to stop practicing cannibalism. Victor relayed Fulgathar's instructions, stressing that consuming sentient beings was considered a sin in the moon man's eyes. One of the people asked about cousin marriages and if they were still allowed. Fulgathar responded no, but marriages with in-laws were okay. Victor informed them that they should not have sexual relations with their own blood relatives. He shouted to the crowd that repeated summoning also prevented Fulgathar from guiding other civilizations to greatness, and that they had reached sufficient enlightenment to govern themselves. Fulgathar agreed and asked if they were finished. Victor reassured him that he believed they'd leave him alone from now on. In gratitude, Fulgathar asked him to extend his hand, so he could bestow a reward on behalf of his father. This made Victor think that something good had indeed come out of the chaos. Fulgather placed a moon symbol on his arm, and the system showed him that he was blessed by a star spawn of the moon man. This granted him the moon man's claim, meaning when he leveled up, he had an additional 10% chance of gaining a charisma point. 
Furthermore, he gained immunity to madness and mood effects except those caused by the Moon Man and his servants. Fulgather asked him if he'd like a job since he'd been seeking a chief of staff to lead his minions. He responded, feeling flattered, but explained that he was already committed to a dragon. Fulgather told him that dragons are prestigious, but they underpay their minions. He admitted to Fulgather that he had no idea about the pay but claimed it wasn't all bad, and he liked the other minions. Fulgather told him if he changed his mind, he should visit him on the moon then slowly faded away. This caused panic, prompting questions about what to do next. Fulgather replied dismissively, fend for yourself. The system showed that he gained two levels in Monster Squire and Rally Minions. This means by uttering a commanding statement, like die to them, or die to me, he could increase his minion stats by one stage, plus five, for a short duration. The lady told Victor she was glad everything ended without anyone dying. Saverus commended him, saying he didn't understand half of what happened, but he handled it like a champ. However, Kwasan expressed his discontent and threatened Victor, saying if the Moon Man wouldn't do it, he would take matters into his own hands. This declaration caused Chocolatine to yell at his brother to stop. Victor jumped at Saverus while Octopus Man warned Kwasan not to harm their god's prophet. The lady urged Kwasan to stop his madness. Suddenly, the other werewolves howled, drawing everyone's attention to the sky. Vancure arrived, calling out to Victor. Victor, relieved, confessed that he'd never been happier to see him. He told Victor that he'd felt aimless without his presence, and asked about the newcomers, wondering if they were new minions. Kwasan, enraged, accused him of destroying their home, while Victor explained that they were survivors from the woods of Jevaden, which he'd burned. He referred to the werewolves as wolflings and demanded an apology. When a confused Kwasan asked why, he explained that if they had perished in the fire, he would have gained more treasure. Therefore, they should all apologize by becoming his new minions. Kwasan tried to reason with him, but he cut him off, declaring that he was a dragon who'd never tasted wolf before. He asked Victor if a wolf could be considered food. Victor responded that it depends and asked Kwasan if he saw himself as food. Kwasan conceded, suggesting that the excuse of simply following orders might have validity, causing Victor to confirm he was indeed correct. Kwasan then pleaded with Vancure not to eat them. Vancure, while feasting on a sheep, told Kwasan he wouldn't eat them unless they ran out of sheep. He then turned to Victor, telling him he must become a wizard. Confused, Victor asked him what a wizard was, but Vancure just stated his desire to be a wizard with a pointy hat, claiming he couldn't break the magical barrier protecting the Lick's castle, nor cure his horde unless he became a wizard. He asserted that they must destroy the evil Furibin for the sake of all hordes, present and future. Furibin, he claimed, was the greatest threat to the dragon's way of life since gold-eating insects. Victor questioned whether such insects existed, and Vancure confirmed they did. He had thought being an adventurer was all about increasing the size of his horde, but he now realized there were threats to all hordes lurking in the dark that he must eliminate. Victor wondered if this was a hero's speech and if Vancure was genuinely ready to fight for the side of good. However, Vancure described Furibun as a cruel, heartless monster who reveled in taking everything of value and turning it into lead. He implored Victor to envision a world without gold if Furibun's spell spread beyond his castle. Disappointed, Victor sighed and reflected that Vancure was likely not turning to the side of good, and he should have known better. Vancure insisted to Victor that he could not, and neither could Victor, live in a world without gold. He declared Furibun evil, needing to be stopped. They would break the magical barrier, clear the dungeon, and destroy the lick once and for all. Vancure released a powerful stream of fire into the air and ordered Victor to gather the minions for the next day, for tomorrow they were going to war. A moment later, a poster depicting Vancure ordering everyone to join the war against Furibun to save baby coins was stood up by the villagers. Vancure told Victor that the enemy was out there, plotting the destruction of gold itself, and only he could stop him. Victor asked him if he was alright, but he just questioned Victor about the location of the Kobold Rangers. Victor replied that he had sent them to recruit new minions. He was praised by Vancure because he believed the more minions they had to throw at the lick, the better. He then told Victor that he was now his military advisor, and as such, he should gather information about that dungeon, including every trap and every defender. This left Victor stunned in fear. However, he also informed Victor that he would research ways for him to become a wizard stronger than the evil Furibun, who must be destroyed. Victor had never seen Vancure so serious and focused. It was downright scary. Victor then asked the villagers what they knew about the Lick's lair. Chocolatine replied that they didn't know much except that it was crawling with fiends and the undead. Kwasan asked if dragons could even become wizards. Vancure responded that dragons could become anything, but Victor informed him that taking levels in the wizard was suboptimal for him and it would take half a century of study to approach Furibun's expertise. Vancure told Victor that 50 years was just a nap's length for him. Victor agreed, but warned Vancure that he would be an old man by then. 
he suggested hiring a professional wizard, but Vancure dismissed this idea, claiming he wouldn't rely on a minion for hire to win his battles. He said his gold was ill, and so was he, and that only taking revenge on Furibon could cure him. Victor assured him that his horde was not totally gone because most of his assets were just frozen. However, Vancure furiously exhaled fire while declaring that a horde must have gold in it, or it isn't shiny enough. He declared himself the great calamity of the age, stating that no one could mock him and laugh. Furibon had made him feel like a pauper, and for that, Furibon had to die. Chocolatine asked him if Furibon shouldn't become deader while Quasin laughed at Victor on the side. He replied that it was a same difference and if he couldn't burn Furibon in the dragon's way, he would do whatever it took to destroy him. Victor suggested an easier solution than studying for years to become a wizard. This piqued Vancouver's interest. Victor explained about a class called Witch Hunter, which specializes in killing spellcasters and fiends. With enough levels and charisma points, he could break the castle's barrier. Vancouver was curious as to how charisma was related to breaking the barrier. Chocolatine explained that most classes' abilities revolved around specific stats. Intelligence was for wizards, luck for gamblers, and charisma for witch hunters. She added that dragons were super charming, which is why everybody loved them. He proudly agreed and said it was obvious. Victor added that charisma also represents willpower, and witch hunters could dispel magic or rain holy judgment on their enemies, but he would need to use special points to fuel those abilities. He opened his status by shouting menu and revealed to Victor that his charisma was 79. Chocolatine and Victor were shocked. Victor informed him that his score was three times greater than his own, leading Vancure to declare that everybody loved him. Victor told him that to unlock the class, they needed to find a spellcaster or demon for him to slay. Vancure furiously ordered Victor to find him a witch resembling Furibon who he reiterated was evil and needed to be destroyed. Quasin informed Victor that they didn't have many witch-like spellcasters in town, except for Allison, who had druid levels. However, Chocolatine panicked and insisted they were not going to harm Allison, as she was her best friend. Then, Chocolatine told them that she had a better idea and that they could summon demons as practice dummies. Victor asked what she meant by summoning demons. She replied that they were demon spellcasters and she summoned them, Vancouver murdered them, and she harvested the body parts afterward. But her brother told her that they were not sacrificing sheep to summon demons and then kill them because it was too dangerous. However, Chocolatine told her brother that everybody wins with that method and they get meat, experience, fertilizer for the farm and more. Vancouver asked Victor if he could get witch hunter levels with that method. Victor replied, technically yes, but summoning demons just to kill them sounds like prank calling hell itself. Vancouver asked Victor if he could see that they could both gain levels from it. I kill the demons, revive them as undead, and then we turn them into minions, so nothing is wasted, he said. Victor replied that it was cruel but effective and asked him what his intelligence score was. He replied that his intelligence score was 14 and he started at 9. Then asked Victor why he had asked. Victor replied that he shuddered to imagine what he'll think up with more points. Vancouver told Victor that he would let the demons use their perks on him first, so he could learn them like Furibin's curse, but Victor replied that he would rather not. Quas unhappily told Vancouver that it was a great idea while imagining Victor being hit by the demon, making Victor tell Quasan that he was really getting on his nerves. Chocolatine told Victor that it was okay because a quick prayer to her god, Isengrim, and he'll be fine. But he asked her if her god was even okay with that scheme because he thought he was one of the nicest gods. Chocolatine replied that, of course, her god was nice and in Commandment 7, they respect the hunt which means they should hunt to feed or thin the herd but never for profit or pleasure, and never to extinction. Except demons and undead because demons and undead can be hunted for pleasure, for profit and to be made extinct. Victor asked Quasan if Chocolatine was always like this and Quasan replied that it was her on a good day while Vancure happily agreed with her because of the profit. A few minutes later, Chocolatine was done drawing the symbol on the sand and put the sheep in the center. Then Chocolatine shouted to summon a lesser demon. The sheep transformed into a powerful demon who welcomed them to Hell's Witch customer service and asked them what he could do for them. He asked if they wanted to sell their souls for magical power or some other thing. But then Vancure released a fireball toward the demon making the demon panic and ask what was happening. Then, Vancure burned the demon to death making it shout in pain while Quasun, Victor, and Chocolatine watched. Vancure happily told them that demons are very fragile and not only did he gain a level, but both his old money and crowd favorite perks activated. A few minutes later, Vancure gained a level in Witch Hunter and Spell Purge which means by exhausting one spell point per second, he can radiate a field of anti-magic energy that automatically cancels any spell in its range, including his own. His charisma score must be higher than the spell's effective level, spell tier plus main stat value of the spellcaster at the time of casting to cancel it. Quasin told Victor that he wonders if the eternal forces of hell might take issue with that training method. 
Victor asked Kwasun back if he thought so and used his animate dead power. Chocolatine asked Vancure if he could leave a bit more meat next time because she really wanted to try cooking a demon's heart with beans and Vancure told her to summon another dummy, and he would fulfill her wish. And so, for the first time in his life, Vancure Nightsbane started to train seriously while Victor revived the demon who was asking him for brains and he firmly replied, no. At the castle, Furibon laughed with joy. At last, his brew was complete. He poured the brew into a glass and sipped it slowly. It made him so happy because it was perfect. Then he began to walk, thinking about how he hadn't tasted coffee since he turned into an undead. But the sight brought back fond memories. For him, being a dungeon master wasn't just a job. It was a way of life, and it required a lot of skill. He also had a deep love for animals and an impressive amount of patience. But when a good trap finally worked, the screams of each victim made all the hard work worthwhile. One of his knights greeted him with a good morning. He responded and asked about the death traps. The knight said they were ready for adventurers, but the black beast had not been fed. Furibon told his knight this was good news. Hunger would make the beast more fierce. Suddenly, he heard someone shouting his name over and over. He looked out the window, wondering what was happening. He noticed an invisibility perch. Vancouver slammed his whole body against the barrier, yelling Furibon's name angrily. Furibon cracked his coffee glass in shock as he glared at Vancouver, thinking of him as a dreadful lizard. Vancouver flew back to the barrier, stared at it furiously, and used a purge spell to try to break it. Meanwhile, the villagers shouted at Furibon, telling him to be ashamed and screaming, save the baby coins, and down with Furibon. The villagers rallied together, throwing rocks at the castle and demanding justice for the horde. Furibon, trembling, placed the broken glass on the window ledge. He wondered if they had to do this every day. Angrily, he ordered his knight to send in the ninjas. The knight asked which ninjas, and Furibon shouted back, the imp ninjas. Make them scatter that crowd. Moments later, the ninjas appeared and attacked the villagers, who cried out for Vancouver's help. Vancouver told Furibon that he wouldn't escape justice forever, even as the ninjas assaulted the villagers. Furibon thought about how this annoying dragon had gained new levels. He wondered how Vancouver met the requirements for a purge spell. At this rate, Vancouver would soon be strong enough to break his barrier. Vancouver growled at the ninjas in anger. He attacked them, but they quickly retreated. He asked furiously if all of the Lick Furibon's army were cowards. Victor asked him how the day's attack went, and he replied that it was a stalemate. Then, the Red Cobbles reported to him. As their chief had requested, they had gathered all the cobbles they could find. He laughed, telling Victor that he was proud of his efforts and that he had acted like a true chief of staff. He remembered the day Victor begged to be his minion forever and was amazed by his growth. But Victor said that wasn't how he remembered their first meeting, making him tell Victor that his version was now the official one. Then, he asked Victor if those cobbles were battle-tested. But Victor replied, not yet, and they made them unpaid interns. He said it was excellent and that they would be on probation and under his responsibility. Then he opened his wing and asked the new kobolds if they shone brightly enough to be part of his horde. The kobolds were amazed. He then asked them if they had what it took to become a true minion. If so, they should join the war against Furibon, making the kobolds cheer happily for their majesty. He also told them that he and Victor would return to training. In the meantime, they must weaken the Lick's morale and remind Furibon of his inevitable destruction each minute of his short remaining on life. The kobolds immediately agreed. Furibon furiously told Vancouver that he would pay for that annoyance and then angrily punched the wall. Suddenly, someone asked, who dares to disturb the demon king of Ishfania, the legendary, and the inimitable Brandon Mora? Furibon shatteringly called Mora, your majesty. And Mora noticed that it was his minion and asked, who is the fairest of them all? Furibon replied, your majesty, making Mora agree and say, who else but me? He then told him to look at his perfect cashmere clothes, the softness of his skin. Furibon told Mora that as he knew, he was currently besieged and asked when he could expect reinforcements. But Mora asked him why and replied, never, making Furibon shocked and trying to reason. Mora told him that his grand corridor would be held in a few weeks, and he wanted all his minions to applaud him after he inevitably won. Furibon asked him if he was invited, but Mora replied that he was not, not until his task was finished, and ordered him to bring his pineapple of wisdom. Mora also told him that the pineapple of wisdom was very important to his next military campaign, and that he was very upset when the Scorcher couldn't bring it to him. He then told Furibon not to contact him until he had recovered his treasure, and brought Worm's hide too because he needed new shoes. Furibon sighed and said that it would be done, then hung up. Suddenly, someone told Mora that it was unwise to leave Vancouver's Nightsbane, unattended. The lady also told him that Vancouver was a powerful adversary, as the loss of their agents in Hodimer could attest. Mora agreed but asked the lady what that reptile could possibly do to defeat Furibon, and that the bag of bones was past his prime, yet more than powerful enough to do his will. 
Also, in any case, he had more important matters to deal with and asked her if he should wear gold or silver for his triumph because gold was a classic, but silver went better with his hair. The lady thought Mora was an arrogant fool, but Mora had his uses, and as long as he and the mortals kept fighting, they would win in the end. On the other hand, Furibin knew that he had kept that border free of paladins for a century, but that was the thanks he got, making him wonder why he was taking orders from that Mora brat again. He poked the enhanced scrying while thinking that maybe he should move on to a new dungeon after it. He then ordered the mirror to show him who guarded the Pineapple of Wisdom. It showed Victor, who was busy doing something, making him wonder what Victor knew. He then smiled, thinking that it was finally time to pay Victor another visit. Meanwhile, in the village, the demon pleaded with Vancouver not to kill him. Despite the pleas, Vancouver lunged forward, launching his sharp nail at the demon and poking it to death. This sudden action caused the ravens to flee in fear, taking refuge in the nearby trees. From the demon's lifeless body, a treasure emerged. However, Chocolatine interjected, informing Vancouver that she was out of smaller allies to summon. She asked if they should now move on to more formidable ones. Vancouver declined, stating that he could never grow tired of accumulating wealth, but admitted that level grinding was indeed tiring. This confession made Chocolatine pout, and she explained her need for more corpses to feed the pigs. Suddenly, Victor arrived, inquiring if Vancouver had finished bullying Satan. Vancouver mentioned to Victor his struggles with achieving the 11th level of Witch Hunter, questioning if the system was broken. Victor explained that experience penalties increased with each level. Killing weaker creatures was beneficial before level 20, but after this point, the system rewarded fighting against opponents who posed a genuine threat. Vancouver asked Victor if this meant he was stuck at level 10 in the Witch Hunter class until he managed to destroy Furibun, who he insisted was evil and must be destroyed. Exhausted, Victor agreed, requesting Vancouver to show him his new skills. Meanwhile, Chocolatine busied herself with something nearby. Vancouver opened his menu and displayed it to Victor, leading Victor to comment that witch burning enhanced his fire attacks, allowing them to bypass magical resistance and inflict bonus holy damage. With pride, Vancouver announced that his breath would now burn like the heart of the sun. Victor, however, highlighted that his lesser magic resistance would enable him to shrug off weaker spells, while Hunter's resolve would help him resist mind control spells. He voiced his doubt about the exorcism perk, deeming it useless. Still, Victor corrected him, saying that it allowed him to cast tier 1 exorcism spells, though he was not yet the ultimate anti-magic tank. Confused, Vancouver asked what a tank was, expressing that it sounded formidable. Victor clarified that it meant nobody could hit harder than him. Victor passed his coffee to his assistant while disclosing that he had asked Kwasan to send villagers with the highest classes to assist with the raid, a dryad, and an iron golem. Vancouver, however, declined the iron golem, arguing that they couldn't eat it if they ran out of food. Victor was shocked, stating that iron golems were strong and could help hunt food. Still, Vancouver insisted that they were not hunting weaklings, but Furibun, whom he reiterated was evil and must be destroyed. Victor questioned Vancouver on whether it was necessary to repeat this mantra each time Furibun was mentioned. Vancouver responded affirmatively, stating it was war, and everyone must be aware. Chocolatine chimed in, stating that Rolo cultivated the best ingredients and crafted superior tools. She also referred to Allison as her best friend. Vancouver responded that minion nepotism wouldn't be tolerated but he would give them a chance, expressing hope that the Dryad would provide enough sustenance for two. Shortly after, Rolo arrived with Allison, who was joyously welcomed by Chocolatine. Victor greeted them, expressing gratitude towards Allison for defending him during the sacrifice ordeal. Allison confessed that she had to intervene as human sacrifices were barbaric, and she apologized for not doing more to prevent the situation. Victor comforted her, assuring her that everything had worked out in the end. Despite this, he admitted that instances like this made him miss his home in the United States. When asked if he was from New York, Victor clarified that he hailed from Chicago and asked how she knew. Victor then had a sudden realization, questioning Allison if he had been reincarnated, and Allison reciprocated the question, asking if he too was from Earth. She mentioned that while she was not human, she couldn't complain because her new body was significantly better. Victor queried about her original location, to which she revealed that she was from Morocco, but also half Spanish on her mother's side. This statement left Rolo, Chocolatine, and Vancouver confused. Victor noticed something on her and asked if it was the symbol of Cybel, the goddess of pleasure and fertility. Allison affirmed, revealing the symbol, and explained that while many associate Cybel solely with pleasure and fertility, she was also the goddess of the forest and knowledge. Victor apologized to Allison, mentioning his lack of religiosity, but Chocolatine reminded him that the Moon Man had chosen him as his prophet. Allison told him that she was content with her own beliefs before she met a foolish end. A wondrous goddess appeared to her, asking, Allison, do you want to live again and restore the land? 
She didn't decline and now, she aids Rolo with his eco-farming work. Although she was a car engineer in her past life and golems aren't quite like cars, she copes while Chocolatine exclaims that Rolo is at level 67, fully committed to farming. Victor can hardly believe it, as Rolo has more levels than the Dazzling Knight. Allison proudly said that Rolo declines to advance in anything but farming until his goal is achieved. Then Rolo shared his dream to restore the Red Desert to its former green glory. Vancour felt vindicated because that area was indeed greener a few centuries back. Rolo mentioned that it was before the Sublaris dried it out. Allison added that an elf empire ruled the southern continent before it fell to Sabler, the destroyer's followers. These Sublaris caused a magical disaster that turned their empire into a desert, including the province of Ishfania. This allowed the demon king Brandon and his allies to seize control. Presently, the regions resembling the world's Iberia and Africa are barren sands. Victor queried if she meant the world's Iberia, and Allison confirmed. She asked if he hadn't seen a full map of Outramon yet. He replied he'd only seen Gardamagni and Ishfania. Allison then showed him a map of the Mistral continent, including Gardamagni and Ishfania. He observed it looked similar to a rough map of Europe with some errors and asked if it was what he thought. She clarified that Outramond is a magic mirror of Earth but with significant differences, like an Atlantis-like continent, a flying Malta, and more. Vancouver told Victor their conversation should focus on their future roles as bodyguards, not on idle chatter. Victor agreed anxiously and asked Allison about her level. She replied that she was level 24, mainly a druid and vestal. Victor was relieved as she could heal them during their dungeon assault. But she explained that as a dryad, she couldn't physically travel more than a mile from her orchard without weakening. Vancour told her she was dismissed, but she reminded him he hadn't hired her yet. Regardless, he told her she was discharged from being emergency food and was now just food. Chocolatine mentioned that Allison could cast many helpful spells, even if she couldn't move far, and Rolo could create various items. Almost anything could be a farming tool if one tried hard enough, armor, scythes, cannons, and more. But he informed her this changes everything. He then appointed Rolo as his chief armorer and Allison as his granary keeper since she couldn't move. Both Allison and Rolo agreed, with Rolo saying he'd start working after feeding the chickens. Victor asked Allison if she'd like to get a drink sometime, as he'd love to catch up with another Earth native. Allison responded that it would be on his dime. Vancouver asked Victor to clarify if he hadn't been with Charlene, and Victor admitted it's hard to maintain a relationship living in different countries. He found Allison nice as well. Vancouver then advised Victor to woo her with his wealth and dazzle her with his gold in the dragon way, but to verify her financial standing first to avoid entrusting his eggs to a poor mate. When Victor asked if he only dated the rich, Vancouver questioned why he would share his hoard with another dragon, causing more competition later. He explained that breeding was for creatures like Victor who died often and needed to keep their species from extinction. Victor agreed, and mentioned that Chocolatine and Quasin both had class levels that could be helpful for the dungeon. He detailed that Chocolatine could serve as a healer, and they could use Quasin as bait for traps since he disliked him. Vancouver agreed, saying it was a suitable plan. Shortly after, he was thrilled to find he gained a level in Noble and Stipend, which meant he would receive a monthly allowance of 400 gold coins times his total level. He excitedly exclaimed his hoard was growing again. However, Furibin used his transmute gold to lead spell, turning his gold to dust, which threw him into a panic. Furibin taunted him, calling him a slow-witted lizard, and claimed that silence truly was golden. Victor tried to tell him to use the spell purse, but his advice was drowned out by Vancouver's rage as he lunged towards Furibin. Furibin teleported and disappeared just before Vancouver could hit him, causing Vancouver to strike the ground and make it burst. He then told Victor there would be no more training. The next day, they would finally tackle the dungeon. A moment later, the villagers lit a torch and constructed a large doll of Furibin. The war was brewing in Murmurin, and fire ignited the hearts of its soldiers. Vancouver glared furiously at Rolo, who was busily crafting a weapon for their war the following day. In his anger, Vancouver incinerated the doll of Furibin while his followers cheered him on. Meanwhile, Victor secured a new war headquarters. He asked Saberus if the house was haunted. Saberus informed him that he had heard tales of a dark wizard performing disturbing experiments in the basement. But the house had been empty for years, so he should be fine. Victor confessed to Saberus that he found this information far from reassuring. But it was preferable to sleeping in a frosty mountain cave. He snapped his fingers, remarking to Saverus that at least the only undead present were those he himself had raised, and commanded them to tidy up and remove the spider webs. The undead demons began cleaning the house. As they did so, Victor questioned Saverus about whether they might encounter any ghosts in the living room. 
Saberus admitted he wasn't certain, then he understood Victor's joke. Victor expressed how much he missed having someone to laugh at his weak jokes, and Saberus confessed that things hadn't been the same since Victor's departure, with the Nightblades losing their way after that laver woman took charge. Victor responded that this seemed quite normal to him. Saverus concurred but added that they had never upset Gardamagna's government. Currently, there were discussions of supplying the Scorchers and Ishvania with weapons. However, Victor pointed out that Vancure had dismissed that plan. Victor then used his Hellfire ability to light the fireplace, commenting to Saverus that at least these new perks were useful. Saverus offered to make an omelette for dinner, which Victor accepted. Saverus then sat on the couch, asking Victor to give him a minute. Victor inquired if Saverus needed some privacy, but Saverus denied it, saying he could cook anywhere. Suddenly, Victor heard the treasure chest stir. Something inside communicated that it was indeed a treasure chest. Victor informed it that adventurers these days were cautious of mimic chests, and suggested it try becoming a sword. He added that it should remain silent, as speaking would give it away. The chest asked if a shiny sword counted as treasure, to which Victor replied that adventurers could not resist the allure of a big sword, especially if it was embedded in stone. The chest transformed into a beautiful sword, but Victor advised that it was too shiny. It then morphed into a small dagger, which Victor approved of, reminding it not to eat anything in the village. The dagger approached him as Victor told Saverus he thought he had acquired a pet. When Saverus, who was cooking an egg, asked what he intended to name it, Victor suggested Vancure Jr., which astonished Saverus. The system then congratulated Victor on his instruction, announcing that Vancure Jr. had leveled up in fencing. Victor was stunned by this and couldn't believe it, but Saverus merely stated he was going to look for a frying pan. Soon after, Quasin knocked on the door and entered the house, calling for Victor and asking if anyone was home. Upon noticing a sword stuck in the ground, Quasin reached out to grab it, saying come to Papa Quasin. Suddenly, the sword opened its eyes and bit Quasim. Victor appreciated his new guard, the Mimic, and Saverus remarked that there was nothing better than a warm meal after a day of leveling up. He then asked Victor how many new levels he had achieved. As Saverus handed him an omelette, the system showed Victor that Victor Minion Dolphin was at level 26, with Outlaw 5, Monster Squire 14, and Necromancer 7. The system also indicated that, having met the entry requirements, he could convert some of his levels into promoted monster classes. His stats would remain unchanged, but his perks would be affected. Moreover, he could combine Monster Squire and Necromancer into Death Knight, or Outlaw and Necromancer into Reaper. He told Saverus that his total level was 26, but even the system called him a minion. He then asked if he had ever heard of the Death Knight or Reapers. Saverus replied affirmatively and explained that Death Knights were undead commanders and tough warriors, and Reapers were thieves of souls. Furthermore, the god Death Jester was a Reaper, who had killed so many people with his side that it had transformed into an artifact. Victor knew that since the monster, Squire, was too useful to sacrifice, he believed it was time to adopt a new class. He then combined his outlaw and necromancer skills, thus his level was transformed into reaper levels. His lockpick could now open any lock on a successful skill check, even magical ones, and he was always considered an invited guest to any magically protected location. His knife master ability was replaced with Scythe Lord, which granted him perfect proficiency with scythes, three times damage plus a 30% critical hit rate. Now, scythes also served as staves for the purpose of spellcasting. His dead divination ability was replaced with Helheim. If he killed with a scythe, he trapped the victim's soul in his weapon. Lastly, his life spell was replaced with Steel Life. When he inflicted damage with a scythe, he regained health points equal to half the damage inflicted. Quasan asked him if he hadn't heard the news and told him that a mimic had bitten him and ran away. Victor responded, saying it was unfortunate and asked Quasan why he was there. Quasan explained that since Vancure had claimed the town, he needed Victor's guidance on governing matters. Vancure had a war to prepare for, so he told him to consult his chief of staff. Vancure had his sister summon a demon and ate it, which led Victor to question if he was essentially their mayor now. Quasin informed him that the Moon Man's cult also sought his divine guidance. He advised Victor not to feel too pressured because, after all, he was the one who brought Vancure there. However, Victor told Quasin not to be upset either, since he would be scouting the dungeon for them the next day. His sister would stay back as a rogue class while he would scout for traps ahead. Upon hearing this, Quasan became annoyed and stated he was a ranger, not a trap finder, and his duty was to hunt beasts, not disarm traps. Victor replied that he understood, but his intention was to scout for traps by triggering them. He added, perhaps next time Quasan wouldn't try to sacrifice his future commanding officer to a cult. Quasan called him a petty snake, but Victor retorted that, as his friend once told him, he wished Quasan would go to hell but he believed he was already there. 
Victor then asked Saverus if she knew whether Allison was single. Saverus asked if he was referring to the Cybel priestess and asked if he was interested in asking her out. Victor responded that he had a thing for someone else, but she lived in another country and he didn't think a long-distance relationship would work out. Saverus advised him that it likely wouldn't work with Allison either and suggested he consider Chocolatine instead, as she was a lovely girl. Victor queried if she meant Chocolatine Psycho, who had fed demons to her pigs and intended to use the rest to make pies. Saverus argued this demonstrated her gentle nature and kindness. Suddenly, the doorbell rang loudly, causing Victor to wonder who could be visiting at such an hour. As he walked towards the door, he asked Saverus what she had against Allison. Saverus replied that she had nothing against her, but she was struggling to tell Victor what Allison truly was. Victor wondered why the undead servants weren't answering the door. Upon opening the door, he was shocked to find Furibin standing there. Furibin quickly used the ice chains and accelerated silent spells. A chain wrapped around Victor and a tape covered his mouth. Furibin grabbed his tablet and announced that he was taking it, stating he could kill Victor, but the dragon wouldn't approve. Saverus rushed towards them, but before he could reach them, Furibin teleported away with Victor, saying Vancure's despair was his joy. Meanwhile, in a nearby village, Vancure was peacefully resting when Saverus called his name in panic. He asked what he needed and was shocked to hear that the Lick had kidnapped Victor. He immediately ordered everyone to gather and announced that Victor was the crown jewel of his horde. They would march on the castle, retrieve Victor, and destroy the Lick once and for all. The kobolds shouted in agreement to rescue their chief. Rolo and Allison were also ready to save Victor. Chocolatine seemed excited because she was hungry, not the same as his brother. The octopus man urged his team to rescue the prophet, and Saverus was ready to save her friend. Dankura then ordered everyone to move towards their victory. They proceeded towards the castle to rescue Victor. In the War of Horde, conflict stirs. The vile Furibin has kidnapped Lord Victor, first among all minions. The Lick's evil has swept across the land, corrupting all that is pure and bright, yet hope remains. The Golem, Rolo, has forged a dragon-sized ring of elemental resistance and a formidable scythe. Into these, he poured potent magical protections and his frustration from working excessive hours. A final alliance of minions marches against Furibin on the slopes of his fiery mountain. The noble King Vancura leads the charge, resolved to put an end to the Lick once and for all. Furibin must fall. The secondary minions guide the unpaid kobolds onward. They are determined to rescue their chief, Victor. Furibin's undead knights advance to thwart them, but a massive creature leaps towards a knight. Rolo, along with another giant figure, defeats the knight while Allison and a few kobold females heal their injured allies. King Vancura's arrival prompts cheers from the kobolds. Chocolatine happily informs her brother they are airborne, but Kwasan feels nauseous and is on the verge of vomiting. Vancura, taken aback, warns Kwasan that if he vomits on his hand, he will be demoted from meat shield to mere meat. He says this while disregarding the enemy before him. As the enemy approaches, he folds his wings around his body, surprising them. He then takes flight, bypassing them to reach Furibin's castle. Upon breaking Furibin's barrier, he lands and commands Kwasan to disable the traps while he takes on the defenders. He adds that Kwasan should be prepared to die if necessary. Kwasan suggests skipping that last part, but Vancure insists. Chocolatine uses her fire amp, region, and strength up to support him. Then, the system alerts Vancure that his fire attacks will inflict 20% more damage for 5 minutes, his strength will be enhanced for 10 minutes, and he will recover 1 divided by 16th of his health every minute for 5 minutes. He instructs Chocolatine to follow him, but she thinks her brother went left and asks if they should track him. Vancure disagrees, explaining they would be playing into Furibin's hands. They will find his chief of staff the Dragon Way. With a shout of the word blink, he disappears, leaving the undead knight astonished. He then lunges at the knight in the door, tearing it down without Chocolatine's assistance. Inside the castle, Victor hangs upside down from the ceiling. Bound by ropes, Furibin lounges in his chair, singing. Suddenly, Vancure crashes through the wall, seemingly invisible. Furibin informs Vancure that invisibility spells are useless against him and laments that Vancure avoided his traps. However, they can now have a proper confrontation. Vancure glares at Furibin, who only laughs. Furibin triumphantly declares that he has succeeded. Despite his sacrifices and losses, he has retrieved his beloved minion and can now unleash his most powerful undead creation. Furibin instructs his monstrous black beast to strike fear into the hearts of his enemies while Chocolatine watches. A large creature emerges from behind Furibin. Chocolatine thinks it's adorable and asks if they can keep it. Furibin, however, commands Vancure and his undead to fight for his amusement. The monster just lingered behind him, refusing to attack Vancure. This prompted Furibin to wonder why his undead wasn't fighting. Had it somehow broken? Vancure, having realized the issue, informed Furibin that his pet was unable to overcome the effects of his invisible blink-blink ring. Furibin, however, disagreed and activated a powerful magical scan. 
the system revealed that they were perceived as deceased comrades, indicating that the mindless undead wouldn't attack them unless provoked first. Additionally, they received a charisma bonus of plus 5 when interacting with the undead or followers of Camilla. Furibon was taken aback by this revelation and inquired if all of them were similarly affected. Victor echoed his question, turning to Chocolatine and asking if she also had this ability. A proud Chocolatine responded by querying how he thought she had managed to dispose of the demon bodies. Victor then conveyed to Furibon that a true dragon never knows defeat, explaining how he had trained for days in preparation for that battle. Furibon, however, informed him that he was too late to intervene, as he had already dispatched the Pineapple of Wisdom to his master, Brandon Mora. When asked why he would concern himself with a mere vegetable when his diet consisted solely of meat, Furibon retorted by questioning if Vanker truly was not after the pineapple. Furibon then pondered why Vancouver was present when he hadn't intervened to prevent his master from devastating Guard Magni. Vancouver revealed that he knew of Furibon's malevolent plan, to infect the world's gold with lead sickness, thereby extinguishing the dragon's way of life forever. Furibon denied such an accusation, asserting it made no sense, and questioned Vancouver's original motives for visiting and whether he intended to seal the Hellgate in the basement, like the other inept adventurers. While hanging upside down from the ceiling, Victor asked Furibon if a door to hell existed in his basement. Furibon confirmed the presence of one and then questioned Victor's reasons for visiting his castle if not to seal it. Victor responded that they needed a larger lair to store Vancouver's treasure, as their previous cave had become too cramped. Furibon, in anger, demanded to know if Vancouver had attacked him and attempted to seize his home simply to find a location for his gold. Vancouver countered that a dragon does not visit the bank. When Furibon asked why he didn't simply bury his gold in his backyard, Vancouver launched a surprise attack to free Victor. Following this, he said Blink to reveal his invisibility while the system informed him that his witch-burning perk had proven highly effective. Checking on Victor's well-being, he saw Victor, who had fallen face first to the ground, assure him that he was fine and express his gratitude. However, Victor was petrified when he heard Vancouver declare him the crown jewel of his horde and his loyal servant promising to never leave him in Furibon's custody and never to let him go. Victor was filled with fear at the realization that he would be trapped with the dragon for the rest of his life. Chocolatine commented to Victor on how swift the encounter had been and that she barely had the opportunity to fight. However, Furibon abruptly ascended into the air, gathering his power to launch an attack. In response, Victor panicked, grabbed Chocolatine, and yelled a warning to his comrades. Furibon assaulted Vancouver with his ancient meteor power, which Vancouver failed to evade, resulting in a loud explosion. Despite the system indicating that he had taken damage, Vancouver defiantly commanded the system to revise its poor judgment. Furibon confessed that he had overseen the decaying ruin for a hundred years, progressively weakening the Hellgate seal while amassing traps and monsters. All this in anticipation of a powerful adventurer challenging his might. Yet, the one who perishes merely desired a larger cave for his horde. Vancouver retaliated by attacking Furibon with fire, boasting that his was the largest horde in the world. Furibon remained unmoved, activating his Zawarudo power, causing the fire to freeze just before reaching him. He then triggered his accelerated ice amp and ice storm abilities and unleashed them towards Vancouver. The system informed Vancouver that his ring of elemental resistance had halved the frost damage. Meanwhile, Victor and Chocolatine darted towards a large hole, with Furibon urging Vancouver to cease their game. They turned to watch the fight and witnessed Furibon furiously informing Vancouver that he swore to the Twelve Gods, he wouldn't relinquish his castle. In a teasing manner, Vancouver informed Furibon that, if that were the case, he was doomed to die in disappointment. On the other hand, in the dungeon, Kwasan moved to the side to avoid flowing lava. He then jumped onto a handle attached to the wall, swinging to avoid arrows, before diving into an ocean teeming with hungry sharks. After a moment, he climbed up a wall, exhausted but knew he was close to his destination. Spotting an exit sign nearby, he joyfully opened it, only to be greeted by a blast of fire. Trapped against a broken wall, Furibon taunted Vancouver for missing a shot and crushing one of his own minions. Vancouver, unconcerned, claimed that nothing of value had been lost. Furibon warned Vancouver that it was now his turn to attack. Using a spell called Black Curse and an accelerated superflare, Furibon attacked Vancouver. A system alert told Vancouver that all enhancements had been removed and all his stats had dropped by five stages. He could no longer recover his health while the Black Curse was active. Furibon asked him if he had had enough, but Vancouver retaliated by punching Furibon with his arena warrior fist, challenging Furibon to respond in kind. 
However, Furibon used a crimson shield to protect himself, telling Vancure his attacks were futile. Victor noticed Furibon holding his own against Vancure and feared that Furibon might actually win. He told his companion, Chocolatine, they needed to do something. Chocolatine suggested casting support spells. Upon seeing her weapon, Victor asked if it was a scythe. She confirmed that it was, and explained that Rollo crafted it for him because Victor had ordered a necromancer's staff. She added that Rollo wouldn't make anything that couldn't be used for farming. Victor, happy that he had leveled up his Reaper class and could now cast spells using scythes, grabs Chocolatine's scythe. He asked if she could enhance Vancouver's abilities while he distracted Furibun, to which she agreed. Victor attacked Furibun using a power called Chill. As Chocolatine was about to break Vancouver's curse, Furibun used his silence power to stop her, leaving Victor shocked. Victor realized his necromancy spells were too weak to affect Furibun, and that he would only hinder Vancouver in a melee fight. He then observed Furibun's pet, planning his next move. In a burst of anger, Vancouver attacked Furibun with fire again, slowly cracking Furibun's shield. Furibun threatened that he would turn their castle into a crater before surrendering it. Furibun then used his triplicata power to release two replicas of himself. Despite Furibun's intimidation, Vancouver remained defiant, insisting that his plans to destroy the gold would fail. Furibun countered by claiming that gold was nothing compared to the power of magic. Unfazed, Vancouver asked Furibun what magic meant to a witch hunter and used his spell Perch. The system showed Vancouver a successful charisma check, which lifted the black curse. Vancouver then swung his tail at the Furibun replicas, shattering them, and started walking towards Furibun. Furibun warned Vancouver that he would run out of SP before he depleted his, but Vancouver simply challenged Furibun to try and catch him, relentlessly attacking Furibun who continuously used teleport to evade. Vancouver furiously punched at Furibun, calling him an undead fly and chastising him for continually avoiding the fight. Furibun told Vancouver to surrender, claiming that his brute strength was no match for his magic. Suddenly, Vancouver's large pet leapt towards Furibun, biting and shaking him like a toy bone. Victor felt relieved, his monster rider ability had proven useful after all. Then, Victor praised it for being a good creature and ordered it to toss Furibun the bone to its father, Vancouver. It tossed Furibun to Vancouver, and Furibun tried to use his teleportation. However, he stopped when he saw Vancouver releasing smoke and anger. He praised Victor and told him that he knew he must be reeling from the Lick's torments, but he performed admirably. Victor told him that Furibun didn't really torment him. Furibun was actually quite chatty in a creepy, undead way. He thought Furibun was experiencing a mid-on-life crisis. Hearing this, Furibun told Vancouver to kill him because the day couldn't get any worse. He told Furibun that he would kill him after they found his phylactery. Furibun called him a fool because his phylactery was in another castle. Even if he destroyed his current body, his soul would return to it safely. He would revive, and when he did, he would rain spells upon him until they all died. Victor told Furibun that he almost sympathized with him until those last words. He said he would kill all of them and asked him if he had ever heard of the Helmine perk. Furibun replied that of course he knew and explained that it allowed reapers to trap souls inside their sides. Realizing this, Furibun stopped in shock. Victor told him that they should test it out. Then, Victor jumped towards him while he was trying to use his teleportation power and emergency teleportation power. But he didn't escape and was hit by Victor's scythe. Furibun was trapped inside the scythe. Vancouver happily shouted that Furibun's evil would never taint his wealth again and Victor said Furibun's silent screams were sweet. Chocolatine jumped with joy because she could speak again, while her brother was trapped and calling for help. The system showed Vancouver that by sealing the evil Furibun in his minion's weapon and claiming the castle of Murmurin as his dungeon, he gained a level in the Dragon Kaiser class. As the dungeon owner of the castle of Murmurin, he could instantly teleport anywhere within the castle's confines and navigate inside with perfect awareness of his path. He told them that all that was left was finding a cure for his horde. Victor told him that he had negated the Lick's spells with Spell Purge, so he should be able to cancel all of them. He was stunned to hear this, knowing that it meant he could cure lead sickness. Victor smiled at the joyful Vancure, while Chocolatine helped her brother from behind. Thus, Furibin, enemy of all that was golden, was destroyed. The forces of greed prevailed, and the dragon's way of life ended. Peace also returned to Murmurin, through the blessing of King Vancouver's spell Purge. His wealth was returned to him, one great horde to bind them all, and Lord Victor alone carried the burden of keeping the impoverished Furibin sealed. Then, a great feast was ordered, sheep were eaten, and demons were summoned using their entrails. But they too were eaten. The Pink Ranger was tasked by King Vancouver himself to write the glorious chronicles of the war against the evil Furibin. 
he wrote that may their majesty's glory shine through the ages to come. So, remember that in the darkest times, even in the face of the most sinister of evil, the wealthy always win. But on the other hand, Mora and the lady were together. Mora was happily looking at the pineapple wisdom and saying that the primates would never see that coming. Mora was looking at the details of how to build an airplane, ending the story with a question. Did they really win? The next day, the kobolds and villagers began to repair the castle. In the basement, Victor knew there was one thing every adventurer looked forward to after defeating a dangerous boss, something even more blissful than gaining new levels. His system showed he had gained two levels in Monster Squire and Reaper each. He also got a Mook promotion, meaning he could help his minions evolve into stronger forms if certain hidden conditions were met. Moreover, he had Necromancy too, allowing him to learn and cast Necromancy spells up to Tier 2, replacing Necromancy 1. Suddenly, he heard a loud explosion, and the basement door was broken down. Vancouver's eyes lit up when he saw a lot of gold inside. He jumped towards it immediately, declaring it his own. Victor was amazed to see how much gold Furibon had stashed beneath his castle. Vancouver dove into the mountain of gold, happily telling Victor they should add his old hoard to this new one and watch them grow. Victor agreed, but he noticed something behind him and asked what it was. Then, he walked closer to another large door, sealed by a magic spell. Vancouver wondered if it could be a double vault, or double the treasure, but Victor told him he thought it was the Hellgate Furibon had warned them about. The pink cobbled admitted she didn't recognize the language, but Chocolatine said she did. It was written in ancient elf, she explained. She touched the door and told them the word said, Beyond these doors lies the domain of the archdevil Isabel Mora. May these bindings never break, or Ishfania will know endless hell. Quasan asked if Isabel was the mother of the demon king Brandon Mora. Victor replied that Furibon probably intended to weaken the bindings and summon a demon army on his master's behalf. Chocolatine excitedly suggested to Vancouver that they could break the seals themselves, and he could slaughter the demons as they emerged. However, Vancouver declined, saying he had enough adventurers bothering him in his old dungeon, and he didn't want his vault open to paupers. Now that Furibon was defeated, they could focus on what truly mattered. His sweet stipend provided him with more gold, the higher his level, so they must increase it. Chocolatine pouted in disappointment, but her brother Kwasun agreed with Vancouver. Victor suggested the easiest way to increase his level would be to undertake a new quest, but they should secure the barony first. When Vancouver asked what a barony was, Victor explained that Gardamagni had promised that whoever destroyed Furibon could claim the surrounding lands, known as a barony. Victor then showed him a poster, which stated, Get Furibon dead or deader, and told him he was now officially the Baron of Murmurin. Vancouver said the titles King of the Albane Mountains and Baron of Murmurin didn't sound harmonious to him. He asked if Baron King Vancouver or Barking Vancouver would sound good. The Pink Cobbled suggested that an emperor was above a king which surprised Vancouver, who believed nothing was above a king. Victor tiredly thought, here we go again. Then Vancouver announced, I shall henceforth be known as His Majesty Vancouver Knightsbane, first of his name, great calamity of this age, an emperor of Murmurin and the Albane Mountains. Today shall be Vancouver Day, where we celebrate the destruction of Furibon. We will raise a statue of me, bigger than the gods, in the werewolf village. Victor said public works were nice, but what about actual laws? At the same time, Kwasan asked his little sister if she could reinforce the door, to which Chocolatine sadly replied that she could. Vancouver told Victor that there was no greater crime than separating a dragon from his hard-earned hoard. So, his first commandment would be the abolition of taxes. When Victor asked him to clarify, Vancouver said he was turning Murmurin into a tax haven. There would be no taxes, instead, he would take a daily tribute of sheep and cattle. Victor mused that this would likely mean saying goodbye to public services, while the pink cobbled wrote down the new laws Vancouver wanted. Vancouver also told Victor that his second commandment would be the banishment of all lead in his empire, as lead was the work of Furibon and thus forbidden. Victor clarified that the plumbing was made of copper. Vancouver continued, declaring that his third commandment would be to do the thing. When Victor asked him to clarify, Vancouver did not respond. He snatched Victor's scythe, informing him it was a non-dragon task because he was preoccupied with counting his coins for slaying liches to oversee minion affairs. Therefore, Victor, the minion, was promoted to his chief dragon advisor and doer of tasks. Victor questioned if this meant he would continue the tedious work while the dragon reaped the rewards, but he was simply cautioned not to misuse his privileges. His first duty as the chief dragon advisor would be to find a new quest involving a princess. The dragon needed a princess for his upcoming bragging day, to present as the crowning jewel of his hoard. Victor sarcastically asked if every day was a bragging day for the dragon, 
but he clarified that Bragging Day was an ancient dragon custom, a day for a dragon to display his hoard to rivals. It would be followed by a grand feast and the release of the princess into the wild to mature into a queen, showing his respect for nature. When Victor inquired about the number of dragons involved, he said, no offense, but there were already many minions to manage. The dragon replied he would invite his family and all the dragons he had kept contact with, estimating a gathering of no more than 200. This left Victor shocked. He climbed the castle's roof, dropped his scythe, and shouted 200 in shock, startling the kobolds working outside. Victor agonized over how he was supposed to feed 200 dragons, foreseeing doom. Suddenly, a system alert informed him that he had reached the level 30 class cap, and he couldn't gain more levels unless he used a crest. He could still earn personal perks through special deeds, leaving him wondering what a crest was. He realized this was a problem for later, as was the dragon overpopulation issue. Something else was nagging at him. He shook his scythe, summoning Furibon. Annoyed, Furibon asked what he wanted. He asked Furibon why his master desired the Pineapple of Wisdom. But Furibon retorted, asking why he should tell him when he despised both him and the dragon. He threatened Furibon, stating he'd give the scythe to Vancouver if he didn't cooperate. This would sentence Furibon to an eternity as part of the dragon's horde, forced to watch the dragon revel in his gold and endure his nonsense. Furibon called him a monster. He retorted that he was part humanoid, part dragon, and demanded Furibon spill everything. Furibon sighed, explaining that during the Century War, King Mora allied with the fairy lords of the Farmers to battle the Holy Kingdom of Gardamagni. They were defeated, and the Farmers retreated to their homeland of Prydain, beyond the sea. Mora feared a retaliatory invasion from Gardamagna's crusaders. One day, a witch named Mel Odeus offered Mora a device containing schematics from Earth's storage world, secrets of weapons capable of destroying Gardamagni. Rebels stole the device and escaped across the border. When Mora's agents finally caught up with them near Hodimer, monsters had already run off with the device. He declared, blessed are the cobbled rangers, but Furibon informed him that he was too late to prevent his master's plan. Once Mora unlocks the device's secrets, his dragon, and all of Outramond, will know the terror of fire. He responded to Furibon with sarcasm, inquiring about the woman Odeus and her intentions. Furibon admitted ignorance, explaining that he serves his master unquestioningly, much like him. He then suggested to Furibon that the Adventurers Guild should probably be informed about this mess. The Red Cabold asked Victor if he was alright, noting his apparent anxiety. Unexpectedly, the Blue Cabold yelled treasure, startling him. He questioned whether his new sword had just spoken. The Red Cabold identified the sword as a mimic and asked why it hadn't bitten him. Victor explained that Junior, the mimic, was well behaved, and he praised it, causing it to beam with happiness. The system then revealed to him that he could promote Vancure Junior and the Red Cabold to more powerful forms. This information startled him, and he ordered Blue to hand Junior over and Red to approach. When Red asked him what he required, he answered that he was merely testing something. He then touched Junior and Red, and was taken aback as Red sprouted wings and Junior evolved into a four-legged creature. The system then updated him, the Red Cabold had been promoted to a Dracobold and Junior to an Excalitrap. This transformation delighted him, and he mused that no adventurer could resist the allure of the Excalitrap. Seeing Red happily flying around, Victor felt like a Pokémon master while Blue expressed his desire for shoulder spikes. As twilight fell, they held Vancouver's coronation. It took Rolo the entire afternoon to craft Vancouver's crown because it had to be dragon-sized. Rolo approached him, presenting a gleaming crown. He praised it, calling it pure perfection. The system updated him again by establishing his rule over the Murmurin region. His noble class evolved into an emperor class. However, the system warned him that if he cannot defend his title from challengers, he will lose access to the emperor class perks, only regaining them if he successfully defends his position. His currency also changed to Born in the Purple, tripling his chances of acquiring treasure from defeated monsters. His snobbery trait evolved into For the Emperor, granting his soldiers and vassals a stat bonus in battle equal to his base charisma divided by 10. His Aristoradar ability became Dynasty, allowing him to bestow one noble level onto others at will, though they would need to level up the class independently thereafter. He announced his new status, I am Emperor Vancouver Knightsbane, ruler of all I see. He commanded his subjects to praise him. The villagers and kobolds joyfully hailed him as the greatest dragon. Thus, Murmurin became their home, all while remaining unaware that Odeus was watching their every move. Meanwhile, a woman pondered whether she was dead. She remembered being struck by a truck and was curious about a particular light. It was the year 1291 in the heavenly realm of Mithras. A girl named Kiyabikel found herself seated on a chair, her gaze drawn to the light. Then, a man introduced himself as Mithras, the god of the sun, law healing, and justice. A lady then introduced herself as Leon, the goddess of glory, nobility, art, and strength. She informed Kia that they were two of the twelve gods of Outramond. 
Mithras revealed to her that Earth had a twin, a world that relied on magic instead of science, a world in desperate need of heroes. Leon explained that Kia had met an untimely death on Earth before fulfilling her destiny, but they were offering her a new opportunity for life in Outramond. Joyfully, she asked them if they could reincarnate her in another world. Leon confirmed it was possible, but warned her against choosing to become a farmer or a dragon. She detailed that farmers lacked souls and dragons were forbidden until the end of time. Mithras added that the people of Outramon were endangered by an ancient adversary, the soulless farmer fairy lords who hunted mortals for sport and created life solely to enslave it. Leon spoke of the farmer tyrants who once ruled out Ramon with an iron fist, alongside their dragon rivals, before their fellow deity Dice intervened. The mortals overthrew the farmers with the gods' support and the power of the classes. However, the most powerful among them, King Balor, sought to revive that dark era. The holy kingdom of Gardamagni faced potential destruction. If Kia chose to protect the innocent against Balor, they would grant her a new life and powerful boons. Disturbed, Kia questioned why Mithras and Leon wouldn't intervene directly. They confessed their limitations, revealing that another god, Sabler the World Eater, supported the farmer's vile actions. They also admitted that they, as gods, had agreed not to combat on Outramon following a divine war that nearly led to its destruction. Instead, they guided and empowered reincarnated mortals, the claimed. Leon elaborated that they had reincarnated numerous other humans from Earth. Together, they would form a grand crusade to defeat King Balor. Feeling overwhelmed, Kia confessed that she felt ordinary, without notable achievements or education. What made her special? The two gods exchanged glances. Leon admitted she lacked the heart to explain the truth to Kia, leaving Mithras to break the news. As the god of justice, he was bound by honesty. He informed Kia that their situation was dire, and while she was mediocre yet acceptable, the true heroes had already been reincarnated. Balor had either killed them or they had failed to defeat him. Now, they were grasping at straws, accepting anyone with even a hint of good karma. Their hope was that if quality had failed, perhaps quantity would succeed. Kia was hurt by the revelation, but Mithras assured her that she might yet prove to be a competent hero with some luck, albeit an unlikely scenario. Leon emphasized that there was no pressure, nothing personal. Mithras promised they would provide as much support as possible. Resigned, Kia agreed to undertake the task, prompting them to send her off. The system displayed her new status, she gained a level in Paladin, received the Holy Champion class perk, and the personal perks claimed by Mithras and claimed by Leon. As a Holy Champion, she would gain advanced proficiency with swords and spears, a 10% increase in critical hits, and her attacks would inflict additional holy damage. Being claimed by Mithras meant that when she leveled up, she would have an additional 10% chance to gain a point in Charisma, or strength, and she would be immune to all fire and holy effects, except those caused by Mithras or his servants. Claimed by Leon granted her an additional 10% chance to gain a vitality, or skill point when leveling up, and a 30% experience bonus whenever she completed a quest or slew a monster. Despite the gods' assurances, Kia couldn't shake the feeling that they saw her as merely mediocre and passable. In 1299, after Mithras, Golden Fields, and the final battle of the Century War, she ran towards Balor, determined to show her worth. Alongside a knight and her ally, they eliminated Balor's minions. She then confidently launched an attack on King Balor, using all her power. Indeed, she proved to the gods what she was capable of. After defeating Balor, people started calling her the Shining Knight. The King of Gardamagni granted her nobility and hailed her as a hero. She was showered with gold and rewards. Her story, however, ended there. In 1301, three days after Emperor Vancouver's coronation, someone rudely urged her to rise. Her maid attempted to discourage the intruder, explaining that the Shining Knight wasn't feeling well. But the man insisted, revealing that he was her teammate and had seen her in the most embarrassing situations. She instructed her maid to let him in. Upon entry, the man, noticing it was already afternoon, questioned the source of a peculiar odor. Drowsily, she asked her teammate what the matter was, only to receive an accusatory question of whether she was drunk. She admitted to having a bit too much wine the night before and asked for a moment to recover. After a quick recovery, she greeted her teammate as Kevin. He corrected her, reminding her that he preferred to be referred to as Ice Guy in Nostradame, as he had been reincarnated as an elf. Kevin pointed out her unusual drinking habit, but she dismissed it, stating that she had nothing better to do. With most monsters no longer presenting a challenge due to her high level and the country enjoying peace, all she did these days was inaugurate libraries. She compared her current situation to a gamer who had already beaten the final boss and was now stuck in the epilogue, which she loathed. She offered Kevin a drink, but he clarified that he was there on business. Expectantly, she asked if the king had finally given her permission to pursue Brandon Mora or the serving farmers in Prydain. 
However, Kevin denied it, mentioning that they couldn't afford a war at the moment. Disappointed, she asked why he was there. Kevin informed her of a powerful red worm named Vancouver Nightsbane causing chaos in the south. This creature had previously earned the title of Terror of Midgard before Balor, and was believed to be dead. Overjoyed, she grabbed her sword, thrilled at the prospect of facing a worthy opponent. She asked Kevin about the strength of Vancouver. Kevin warned her that Vancouver didn't gain the title of Nightsbane for minor offenses, explaining that he was considered the greatest calamity of the age before King Balor's reign. Nonetheless, she eagerly asked for Vancouver's location. Kevin cautioned her that the situation was more complex than she assumed and urged her to read the provided documents. She read it and found herself confused about the meaning. VNV Adventure Company. Why Emperor Vancouver? Emperor of what? She questioned if it was a village. However, Kevin explained that Vancouver was also the emperor of a volcano. He further elucidated that Vancouver is a dragon adventurer with class levels. She understood that dragons possess souls, enabling them to gain levels, unlike the farmers. Kevin informed her that, as far as they knew, the human partner, Victor Dalton, introduced Vancouver to levels and quests. Since Victor acquired the Monster Squire class, it was likely that he had traded his soul to the dragon for power. Following this, the pair ransacked the Marquise of Carabas, seeking gold and cows. They then took over the village of Hodimer, formed an army of monsters, and devoured the Duchess of Uskal when she tried to interfere. Subsequently, they reanimated their victims as undead. She told Kevin that events seemed to have escalated rapidly, to which Kevin responded that this was only one of the reports he received. He noted conflicting statements, the locals of Hodimer had mixed feelings about the duo, stating that they were saved from the scorcher at the cost of property damage. Furthermore, local guild officers claimed that the Duchess had refused to pay Vancouver for the bandit hunt, leading to a fight. The necromancy incidents were, surprisingly, legal under new undead labor laws. She asked Kevin if this meant they were either fiendish villains or destructive idiots. Kevin suggested that perhaps they were both. He then reminded her about the black worm in the swamps. When she inquired if he was referring to the one who attempted to raise princesses in captivity, he confirmed and informed her that common sense doesn't apply to dragons. They are immensely powerful and have previously battled the farmers for control of the Outramond in ancient times, until the fairies bribed them with gold. She asked Kevin about the king's thoughts. Kevin reported that the king advised them to do nothing, as Murmurin was Brandon Mora's territory. By defeating Furibon and claiming the area, Vancouver had practically declared war on him. In the king's eyes, regardless of who prevailed, it would mean one less problem for them. So far, Vancouver had only requested payment for services rendered. Kevin warned her to consider the possibility of Vancouver intimidating towns into giving him gold. Kevin also shared a report stating that Victor Dalton was a former Knight Blade, a criminal. His apprentice, Lucy, had already suggested they investigate. The Gardamagna's adventurer guild planned to send a representative, but she had a desire for adventure herself. She interrupted him, announcing that she would personally investigate them. Within an hour, she would be prepared to fly to Murmurin. She planned to confront and deal with the dragon once and for all. As she left, Kevin waved her goodbye. At Vancouver Castle, he asked the kobolds who were presenting their jobs if they could call it a castle. He told them that he demanded at least seven towers with pointed roofs, to which they immediately agreed. The kobolds happily walked away. Victor and Jules arrived, and Furibon, who was in the scythe, sadly looked at his beautiful castle, which had changed a lot. Victor told Vancouver that he saw him enjoying his new lair. Vancouver invited Victor to join him because the lava bath's temperature was just right and suggested he should try it. Victor replied that, even though he was now immune to fire, he preferred a hot water bath. He asked Vancouver if he remembered Jules, the man to whom they sold their corpses in Hodimer. Then Jules told him that he came as soon as he heard of his great victory and sensed an opportunity. He told Jules that he was correct because they had many corpses worth buying. Jules told Victor that he was pleased to learn that he had embraced the virtues of the undead. Victor informed Jules that they were about to host 200 dragons and needed as many workers as possible for the farm. Jules understood Victor and offered them a more long-term partnership and proposed settling in Murmurin. But Vancouver told Jules that a dragon doesn't turn away good minions, so he should have joined them earlier instead of staying in his backward village. Jules replied that he hadn't understood his vision back then and asked how he could resist the call of a tax-free country open to the idea of mass zombification. He told Jules seriously that he was in need of his other services because his defenseless horde had been treacherously attacked by Furibon not long ago. Victor told him that he had given Jules the Pink Ranger's book and they used mimic presses to print it. He told Victor that he had done a good job and his horde needed to learn how to defend itself. Then, he asked if magic could help with it. Jules showed a bag of gold coins, explaining that he believed he had a solution. Jules used his magic, and the gold coins slowly formed something. 
A moment later, he made an animate golem using gold and said he could imbue his horde with the spell, allowing it to protect itself from thieves. Vancouver was thrilled, so he promoted Jules to be on the same level as the kobold rangers in the food chain. Now that he knew his horde would be safe in his absence, they could hunt princesses with a clear mind. Jules laughed at his words, while Victor was shocked and asked what he meant by princesses. He replied that he heard his rival Icefang caught twins, so they needed three princesses for his bragging day. Victor said he understood because Vancouver could do anything, but Victor told him that they had more pressing problems to address about his bragging day. The minions were trying to build irrigation canals for agriculture, but they had few plants capable of thriving in the sandy soil. He asked Victor who cared, saying his guests would eat sheep and maybe have wolfling croissants for dessert. But Victor asked him how they would feed the sheep when he alone ate 10 of them a day, and 200 dragons would need more. He corrected Victor, saying the right way to say it was sheep with an S. Jules tried to correct him by saying the plural of sheep is still sheep, but he told them that he was a dragon and would say sheeps or it would be sheep. He did tell Jules that he had a point, and ordered him to summon more demon appetizers because they were plentiful, albeit bitter to the taste. Victor told him that at that rate, they would depopulate hell faster than heaven ever did, and they needed more resources to import food for his feast. Jules suggested that since Vancouver forbade taxes and guarded the castle's underground vault, he could keep his citizens' valuables safe from thieves there, but for a price. Victor asked Jules if he was suggesting that they become a tax haven for food. Vancouver said it was a brilliant idea and that he would gladly protect his minions' treasures from the furibans of the world. All his dead minions would also be reanimated to work as sentient undead, just like the cobbled rangers. There was no need for death to end their fulfilling jobs. This made Victor ask if he could be excluded from that decree because he would rather not retire as a zombie. But he told Victor that he wouldn't die under his watch because he was too precious to him. Victor thanked him but reminded him that he would still die of old age eventually. Vancouver was frustrated to hear this and asked Victor how manlings could be so fragile. Then he told Victor to find a way to become immortal because he still had much work to do. Later, Victor was in the desert while sitting on Furibin's huge dock. He thought Vancouver was actually concerned about him. But Furibin just laughed at him and told him that his naivety made him want to throw up. But he teasingly asked Furibin how he could throw up without a body. Furibin said it was a low blow. They were walking when the cobbles noticed him. He asked Furibin if it rattled his bones, and Furibin replied that he hated him so much. The dog sat down happily and asked the rangers if there was any news to report that day. Junior Vancouver told him it was a tasty treasure. The rangers reported there had been a fight at the tavern, but Mimixord had eaten the person causing the trouble. He asked what they meant by Mimixord while patting it, and the Red Ranger told him they were still teaching at the transformation sequence. Savarus was waiting for him at the town's entrance with a newcomer. Allison had a problem with a demon at the temple. He replied okay, saying he'd deal with the demon first. Later, he arrived at the temple. Allison waved her hand and told Victor that Chocolatine had summoned a friend in the temple and it wouldn't leave. Chocolatine told him she swore it was an accident. She had meant to summon a sacrificial imp as usual, but a major demon came through instead. He looked around and told them to let him see it. Then, they walked closer to the temple where the demon Chocolatine had summoned was. The demon asked him if he was the local authority, the Grand Dragon Vizier Victor Dalton. He told it to just call him Victor and asked who it was and what it wanted. It replied that it was the manager at Infercorp. Malfacent and 300 demons had gone missing after using his summoning line, so he was sent to investigate. The system showed that Malfacent was a bug demon. It was strong against unholy, frost, water, physical, disease, poison, critical hits, petrify, and bug, but weak against fire, holy, demon slayer, and bug slayer. Also, it was a demon with unconventional ideas sent to investigate the demon slaughterhouse and manager of one of Hell's corporations, Intercorp a business mindful of post-mortem customer safety. Victor hesitantly told Mafacent that his kind had suffered a dragon accident, and then they were recycled. But Mafacent told him he didn't understand. Suddenly, Chocolatine happily told Mafacent that they had killed them all, and then raised them as undead slaves. This made Allison and Victor panic. Mafacent angrily asked her what she had done and Victor panicky replied that they kinda needed the experience and money. Mafacent told him that mortals say hell is other people, but they are wrong because hell is people like him. Then Mafacent cleared his throat and told Victor that hell needs people like him. People who care about the bottom line and mortals who are ready to get their hands dirty for the greater good. He asked Mafacent if he wasn't mad, but Mafacent asked him to call him Malfi and told him that he thought he was just a bothersome demon hunter, but he showed the qualities of a good business partner. Chocolatine asked Malfi if this meant they could continue summoning demons for food, but Allison told them not to do it in her temple. Malfi replied that he could and that he would reroute the victims of their downsizing and layoffs to them, so that way they could cut down on severance packages. Then Malfi gave him a doctor 
document while whispering to him that he had fantastic business opportunities for him like succubus brothels, imp casinos, and more. He asked Malphi if he wanted Hell to invest in Murmurin. Malphi signed the contract while telling him that it in Fekorp. They believe in buying souls by doing good business and those Faustian bargains of the past were so cliché. So to improve their shareholders' soul dividends, they must offer deals where mortals are so happy with their customer service. Then Malphi showed him a poster with demons saying that their souls were safe with them, with a magical hotline sign, and told him that they convinced their friends and families to sell their souls too. Allison told Malphi that he should know they picked a fight with the local demon king's forces, but Malphi told her that Brandon Mora from Mora Hell Corporated is their direct competitor. So, it's even better and they'll be happy to work together with them on joint plans to take over the Ishfanian market. Then, he told Victor that some of the profits will find their way into his pocket. Victor asked Malphi if he was trying to bribe him, but Malphi said no and explained that he was giving to the community because he was a kind person. Victor asked Chocolatine if Malphi was telling the truth and Chocolatine said that Malphi's group is demon binding, so he was forced. Allison asked him if he wasn't going to accept it and told him only if they are really in need of food and money. He replied that they are in need and the food budget is a big problem, and Vancouver's guests won't think twice about eating them. Chocolatine asked him to agree with Malphi because she needs more demon meat for her next pie. He looked back and saw Malphi happily waving and waiting for his answer. Then he told Malphi that they have a deal on the demon downsizing and the rest they should discuss with his dragon boss. Malphi shook his hand while telling him that it was great and he'll tell the board and come back with an investment plan. Also, he won't regret it. Then Malphi went back to hell. Allison told them that at least Malphi was gone and thanked Victor for it, but he just asked her if she was still up for a drink that night. She said sure, but asked him if it was a drink as friends. He shyly laughed and told her that it could be more if she wanted, which shocked Furibon. Allison shyly scratched her head, not knowing what to say, but he quickly asked her if she was not interested. Allison apologized to him and explained that she prefers girls, which shocked Furibon and he was stunned. She told him that she hoped they could stay friends, and he replied of course they are still friends and he must have misread some signals. She thanked him for understanding and told him that they'll still get that drink another time. Chocolatine looked at them in silence, then they went to walk toward the village. Chocolatine shyly asked him if he was okay, and he replied that it was alright and he was just a little bit sad. Chocolatine shyly told him that she wasn't sure if it was the right time but maybe she could help him feel better. He asked her how, then she touched his hand and told him that she hadn't had the courage to say it before, but she liked him and she thought he was cute and brave. Then she shyly asked him if he wanted to breed with her. Victor was stunned to hear it. And, she said, they can also make good use of his monster rider skill too. This made Allison stare in surprise. He thought Chocolatine looked sweet and innocent, but he wondered if she really liked him. Then, he snapped back to reality, remembering what Chocolatine truly was. This sent chills down his spine. He nervously told her that he didn't want to ruin their friendship, but Chocolatine assured him it was fine. She even said he could ruin her clothes if he wanted. Allison laughed when he said he wasn't sure and asked for some time to think. This made Chocolatine sad. Then Allison asked if they wanted to hang out. She reminded Victor of a promise to have a drink and suggested a group outing. This way, Victor and Chocolatine could get to know each other better. Victor replied with hesitation, sure, and left. Chocolatine asked Allison what it was all about. Allison told her to be patient because Victor was shy, so she shouldn't rush things. Allison assured Chocolatine not to worry, as she would be there with her. Meanwhile, Victor arrived at the village, surprised by the turn of events. He knew Chocolatine was wild and dangerous, but she seemed so genuine. Could it all be an act? He asked Furibon for his opinion. Furibon warned Victor that if he accepted Chocolatine's offer, he might end up as her dinner. Victor agreed. Savarus called him and waved at him, asking how he was, and hoped his new role wasn't too stressful. Victor replied that it was less stressful than being kidnapped by a lick while Savarus just watched. However, Savarus said he would have helped more if his life wasn't at risk. Victor asked Savarus why he hadn't warned him that Allison wasn't into guys. Savarus replied that he had tried, but Furibon had kidnapped him before he could finish. Then Victor noticed the woman next to Savarus and asked who she was. The woman introduced herself as Lucy Laver from the Royal University of Garda Magni. Lucy explained that her master, the Archmage Nostradame, sent her to confirm Furibon's downfall. Victor pointed at his scythe and told her she could check for herself. This angered Furibon, who threatened 
Victor that one day he'd escape and take Victor's place in the scythe. Saverus then reminded Victor that he had once mentioned that the Night Blades had a new guild master. Suddenly, Lucy showed her mark and confirmed that she was indeed the leader of the Night Blades and that he was a deserter. He was stunned. He quickly used his monster insight. The system revealed Lucy's true identity, Lucy Sinistra Laver, an alchemical vampire who was strong against many forces but weak against a select few. She was a top student and spy for Nostradame, the criminal mastermind behind the Night Blades, and could read Victor's thoughts with her eerie powers. She told him his ability was interesting. He quickly pointed his scythe at her, questioning how she could walk under the sun as a vampire. She calmly replied that the fairy flower in her hair protected her from the sun, a gift from a teacher. He confronted her, stating that Saverus had told him the Night Blades supplied the Scorchers, and asked if that meant she worked for Brandon Mora. She responded that she did work for him if the pay was good but mostly worked for Garda Magni. Her only loyalty was to her bank account, but she wouldn't bother Victor because she wasn't foolish enough to pick a fight with a dragon. Furibin told her that, looking back, he would not suggest it. He asked her why he was there and she said that they, the Night Blades, wanted to start a trade spot in Murmurin for their secret market actions. As long as he did not get in the way, she would ignore his leaving. She reminded him of the usual punishment. He asked if she was making a threat and told her that if she killed anyone there or tried to start a thieves' guild, Vancouver would eat her. But she just asked him who, in their right mind, would try to take from a dragon, except for him. Then she playfully told him not to make that face because she was only joking. Plus, she shared his skill for raising the dead, so maybe she could give him private lessons. But he replied, shaking, that he would pass. Then he turned around, but she told him it was his loss. To show her good intent, she would tell him a secret. Next, she said that Nostradame had sent a strong adventurer to check on his VNV &V empire. If she was him, she would get ready for her arrival. He was shocked to hear this but said that he would keep it in mind and she should leave before he called Vancouver. Saverus told him that Lucy was very intense. He just asked when Lucy would leave, and Saverus said that she would go in a few days after they finished the paperwork. He swore that he would watch Lucy and if she did anything, he wouldn't stay quiet. Saverus promised there would be no theft, and no killing, like Lucy was never there. Then they watched her leave. Later, when Lucy was far from the village, she touched her fairy flower and told her boss that she was in. Odeus praised her and told her to open the box she had given her. Lucy took out the box, but before she opened it, she asked Odeus if this was smart because Furibin had lost badly. But Odeus said that Mora was a proud fool who did not respect the dragon and she wouldn't make that mistake. Vancure had to go, one way or another. Then Odeus asked Lucy if she was more scared of the dragon than of her. Lucy quickly said no and told her that she would happily take any risk for her. But Odeus said that she doubted it, but her hands would stay clean. She ordered her to let her pet out. Lucy quickly opened the box and saw a small pet inside. This made her ask Odeus if it wasn't too small to fight Vancure. The bug flew away while Odeus told Lucy not to worry. Her kind had made those creatures to hurt what dragons love most. She should give it a few weeks, and she was sure that Nightsbane would leave the area and not come back. On the other hand, Vancouver was sleeping deeply in his hoard when he smelled something. He quickly stood up, full of fear, and shouted that it could not be. Then he angrily called for his workers. The kobolds asked what it was and if he was hungry. He told them that he smelled a big change in the gold, like lots of baby coins trembling at the return of an old enemy. Then he ordered them to wake every worker at hand and grab a bug catching net quickly because they were back. The kobolds asked what he meant by they, but he just replied in a panic, they. The next day at the mansion, the undead were cleaning outside. Victor poured coffee into his mug and opened the window with a sigh of relief. He happily said that he had finally had a good night's sleep in his own bed, which was much better than the grimy cave floor. But Furibin laughed at him and told him that if he were undead, he wouldn't need sleep at all. This made Victor tell Furibin he was always cranky in the morning. Victor thought it didn't matter because nothing would ruin his mood today. After all his quests, he could finally enjoy some time off. He was even looking forward to Allison's get-together and thought it would be nice to make a new friend. But suddenly, Vancouver shouted at Rollo to keep digging because it was the right spot. Rollo told him that he had said the same thing about the last three spots. Then he told Victor not to just stand there but to grab a net. This made Victor curse as his peaceful morning was ruined once again. Victor told Jules that he knew Vancouver had decided to raise all his minions from the dead, but those minions had been buried years ago. Jules replied that he didn't complain. Then Rollo stopped digging when he saw something. He told them it was old Mackie still holding on to his gold. Victor asked Vancouver if he was opening tombs to rob the dead, but Vancouver just nervously ordered them to open it slowly. One of the kobolds agreed and walked towards the treasure box while Victor asked what was going on. The kobold grabbed something from the treasure box and Vancouver broke out in a cold sweat. He exclaimed, by the elder worm. Then the kobold showed something that made Vancouver shout. He saw the gold had been bitten. He cried out that there were gold-eating insects there and, shaking with fear, declared it was war. 
he turned around so quickly that he hit Victor. He told them he had been young once, a naive dragonling trying to save lost baby coins. He thought he could save them, as he had so many in the past, but he didn't understand the enemy until he saw them. He was shocked to see insects eating the gold, one piece at a time. He shakily told them that the insects ate the gold with their mandibles. He was too late and the dragons had to kill them all. They burned all their nests from above and took all their gold for safekeeping. That was the only way to be sure. But now, he accused Furibun of bringing them back. Furibun retorted that they should always blame the lick. He asked if it was because he didn't have skin, but Vancure told Furibun that he should have known he was sheltering such a monstrous creature. He couldn't destroy his gold by turning it into lead, so he released those vermin. Furibun replied that he hadn't and that his undead life didn't revolve around his horde. Victor told Vancure that with all due respect, he didn't think Furibun was behind it. Furibun couldn't even move without help. And besides, it was just one bug and they had hundreds of minions. Vancure shakily told Victor that he didn't understand. He could tell by the smell that it was a queen. The more she ate, the more she would grow. And when she was large enough, she would breed. This news shocked the kobolds, but Victor and Furibun didn't react. Vancure then ordered Victor to mobilize every minion to find the creature's nest and destroy it. Victor asked the kobolds if they had anything better than nets. Rolo told him he might have something. He had a locust problem 10 seasons ago and couldn't get rid of them no matter how hard he tried. So he bought a powerful bug-killing artifact from a traveling merchant. But the weapon was so powerful that it destroyed his crops along with the locusts. He had buried it in the desert and vowed never to use it again. But Vancure just asked Rolo where the weapon was. Rolo replied that it was south of his fields. Rolo tried to warn him, but Vancure told him that the fate of his gold depended on it. He ordered Victor to grab the map because they were leaving immediately. Victor asked him if they were leaving now. He said they had no time to wait. If they let the queen bug multiply, they would need to clear out the bug swarm again. Meanwhile, Kia was in the air with her eagle. The eagle saw Victor tell Vancouver about the location being between three cacti. Vancouver said he didn't like that fruit. Victor teased him by saying all fruits are green. Victor asked if the dragons had killed the gold-eating bugs. He said he was sure the proud frost dragon Icefang missed one. Icefang always messes up, he said. Victor asked him if it was odd for an anti-dragon bug to show up just as he moved into the area. He thought the lick might have brought the bug back before his shameful loss. But Victor suggested that Brad on Mora might be trying to drive him away. He didn't realize someone was watching him and checking his level and skills. He used her solar judgment attack and hit Vancouver from behind. He fell and crashed to the ground. The system told him the sun attack beat his fire shield, so he was hurt. He just told Victor he felt a bit of an itch. Victor told him it was actually pain. But he told Victor that was a lie, as only mammals felt pain. Kia, who was at level 70, told Victor that a reaper is the worst class in the world. She asked if she saw a soul trapped in his weapon. She said it was even worse than she thought. Victor knew she was the Shining Knight. He had thought she was weaker but was wrong. Vancouver was happy, as it had been a while since he could lived up to his name, Nightsbane. Then he attacked her with his dragon fire. Kia simply dodged with her eagle and used her wind power and ice skill to attack them. Vancouver told Victor to stay put while he chased the flying target. But Victor warned him that Kia had killed King Balor, so he should be careful. He replied that the farmer was just the second worst threat of that time. Then he attacked Kia, telling her to be scared. He told her she was up against Emperor Vancouver Nightsbane, first of his name, the biggest threat of that time, ruler of Murmurin and the Albane Mountains, and the one who beat Furibun. She told him she knew about the Lick and that she was grateful as they never got to kill him. He asked her if she knew about Furibun and did nothing. Then he said Furibun must have used many princesses for his bad spell. Furibun was going to let the spell loose in the world before he stopped him. He asked her if she knew what Furibun made him go through, the battles he fought, the sacrifices he made. She was shocked and tried to answer, but Vancouver told her that Victor was taken by Furibun and tortured. The Lick stole his vegetables and made him eat baby coins. Furibun yelled that it was a lie, which Victor agreed with, saying Vancouver was stretching the truth. But Vancouver told Kia that Victor risked his life to trap the Lick's soul. They had to fight lots of demons until Victor was strong enough to lock up the evil monster. She said she was sorry and explained that she didn't know. But Vancouver said he was fed up with human prejudice. He was the best dragon adventurer and her species didn't pay him when he fixed their problems. Victor reminded Vancouver that he thought all species were less than dragons. But he replied that it wasn't prejudice, it was just true. Kia quietly asked about Victor's classes. Victor asked if she was going after him because she used magic to see his job. Wasn't that class profiling? He asked, making Furibun tell Kia that was a low move. She got scared and said that wasn't it. She used her karma scan, which made Victor say she was doing it again. But she quietly said she wasn't. When she saw it, she quickly said sorry and explained that she should have checked their karma right away. She had thought they were bad guys, not kind of good mercenaries. But Vancouver said sorry wasn't good enough and he wanted her flying cow as payment. 
she said sorry again and explained there had been a misunderstanding. She asked to heal them first, and then she healed them. Vancouver was back at full health. Victor told her he was getting used to this, but Vancouver told her he wasn't. He wanted five griffins as payment. She said she would see what she could do. Then she nicely introduced herself as Kia and said it was nice to meet them. They just looked at her, making her ask if something was wrong. Victor told the gods that he never thought he'd meet her in person. He asked Kia if she was the Shining Knight. However, Vancouver told Victor to stop talking at once. Kia had attacked him, so he wanted an apology. She said that she swore it was a mistake. If she had known the Lick was using bad magic that threatened the world, she would have done something. But he said that her mind couldn't grasp the depth of Furibin's wickedness. Furibin was pure evil, a lifeless lead. She thought that if a dragon was saying it, she didn't want to hear the nasty details. Victor looked away, feeling guilty, while Furibin was angry hearing it. Then, she told Victor that he must have taken the Cursed Reaper class to stop the Lick. He had given up his morals for the greater good. It must have been hard for him. However, he just leaned his head back and said that she could say that. Still, Vancouver wanted a roast griffin as payment for her treacherous attack, making her eagle tremble in fear. Victor told Vancouver that they should forgive and forget because Kia was almost as strong as him, and they had monsters to hunt. She told Vancouver that she wouldn't give away her griffin, but they should make up for her foolishness and she would help them on their quest and offer them a different item. Vancouver told her that he was listening. She took out something and told him that it was an agarth and warp stone. It was a one-time use item that could teleport him and anyone nearby back to any place he visited. She showed it to him and told him that it bypassed protections against teleportation effects. She always carried two, just in case. He said it was perfect because in that way he wouldn't burn fat flying back to his horde, so he accepted her tribute and forgave her for her offense against him. He told her that any other dragon would have killed her for her insolence, but he was generous. She scratched her neck when she heard about dragons, making Victor ask if she had met other dragons. She replied that she had fought one in a swamp. She thought the dragon's name was Blight Swamp. Vancouver couldn't believe she lived in a swamp without even a cave. Then, he asked Victor where the cacti fruits were, but Victor just asked Kia for her autograph. She agreed. As they walked toward the cacti, Victor told Kia that she inspired him to become an adventurer. She was an inspiration to everyone, but she told him that he was acclaimed too, and asked where he was from. He said he was from Chicago, USA. She said it was cool and that she was born in Ethiopia. She never thought she'd get a second chance at life, and she was grateful to the gods. Victor asked if she was reckless too. She agreed and said that he took the words right out of her mouth. Suddenly, Vancouver stopped walking when he noticed something. He looked at the giant cacti in front of them. Victor said that this was the place. He ordered Victor and Kia to do something. Kia asked if he was just going to watch them. He replied that he was a dragon and their objections didn't matter. She walked closer to Victor, saying that she felt like she was starting all over again and asked what they were looking for. Victor said it was some kind of anti-bug weapon. Luckily, something shiny on the ground caught Vancouver's attention. He said it sparkled in the sunlight, so it must be effective. But Kia and Victor had the same thought, it was a magical bug spray that could normally be found on Earth. Vancouver asked Victor if the weapon could truly banish the ancient evil from his land. Victor replied that his eye for treasure perk told him it was enhanced with magic, so he wondered how it ended up in Outramond. Kia asked him what kind of insect monster he planned to use it on. He replied that it was the vilest kind, a foul brood that would destroy all that is good in the world if left unchecked. Kia thought it was awesome and asked him if they were strong and if she could kill them. He told her that she would help with cleaning that infestation as soon as he located the queen. They needed to find her before she grew too big. Victor asked how big it could get, but he replied that it depended on how much gold she could find to eat, almost as large as him. Victor guessed that it was time to inform him that Jules's undead workers found some gold deposits around Murmurin. When the kobolds were busy digging on the ground, they heard something. Suddenly, a huge stone cracked and a large bug came out of it angrily. This made the kobolds run in panic. While the kobolds were running and being chased by bugs, Jules couldn't believe what he saw. A moment later, they arrived at the scene and saw a lot of bugs and a huge one. The queen went to the village to attack, making the villagers panic, but it kept chasing after them. Kia shouted in panic for the village, Vancouver cried in panic for his horde, and Victor panicked for his life savings. But Furibin didn't care at all. Vancouver dashed toward the bugs while shouting to them that there was no time to waste. Victor shouted to Vancouver to wait, but Kia told him to hold on to her. Then, they flew toward the village full of bugs. On the other hand, Chocolatine was trying to catch the bugs while Quasin cried, trying to protect his gold coins. Rolo and Allison were trying to kill some of the bugs, and the undead and junior Vancouver were trying to protect Victor's mansion. That day, Minionkind received a grim reminder. A huge leg grabbed the tower, and they dreaded seeing a huge bug crawling up to the tower and looking at them. The others panicked and shouted that they were doomed, but Red shouted at them to stand their ground and defend the horde. 
but it just jumped toward them and crashed into them, making them thrown away to the side while it successfully entered the tower. Victor told Kia that there were so many of them, but Kia just activated her power while telling him that they were not many for long. Then, she attacked them using Solar Judgment. Chocolatine covered her eyes because of the shining light and asked Victor if he brought a new friend, but he just ordered her to tell everyone to gather at his mansion with their life savings because they needed to gather the swarm in one place to destroy it. Chocolatine replied that she was on it and immediately ran to tell it to everyone. On the other hand, the Queen Bug arrived at Vancouver's Gold Bolt, but then the ceiling slowly broke and Vancouver descended on it, cracking the ground in the process. He told it that he had devoured more thieves than he could count and he had defeated the source of all evil, Furibun. Then, he took out the magical spray or bug spray, while ordering it to tell him if it could feel fear. The queen bug screamed at him in anger, but he simply told her to scream all she wanted because he had the ultimate weapon. Suddenly, she flew towards him to attack, causing him to step back a little. He quickly sprayed insect spray on her face while shouting sneak attack. She screamed in pain and the system showed him that she was damaged and it was super effective. He then poisoned the atmosphere. Suddenly, she opened her wings, flew in mid-air, and attacked him with poison. The system showed that he had taken bug damage, but the poison was negated by his poison resistance. He realized that she was the source of the delicious poison sauce the Marquise served him. He told her it was so good that he would eat it with a cow. However, he stopped speaking when he noticed her gathering power to attack him, which left him confused and shocked. She released her power towards him, throwing him hard against his bolt gate. The gate crashed open, allowing the queen into his horde. The queen landed on the piles of gold and victoriously screamed upon seeing all the food in front of her, while he lay on the ground in pain. On the other hand, in the village, many bugs were attacking everyone's gold. Allison used her bug barrier and Chocolatine used her fire burst power to attack the bugs. Saverus guided the kobolds to place the gold in the mansion. Victor and Kyo arrived at the mansion, relieving Saverus. Victor asked Saverus if everyone's gold was safe inside the mansion. Saverus replied yes and explained that it was all he had managed to steal. Kia asked Saverus what he meant by stealing. Saverus, shuddering in fear, explained that he meant saving it from empty houses and that he also gave jobs to street urchins and orphans. Kia happily praised him while Victor asked if pickpocketing counted as a job. Saverus clarified that he never said it was an honest job. Kia told everyone to form a line and ordered that fighters should be at the front and spellcasters at the rear. Allison shouted a warning that the bugs were coming, then a swarm of bugs flew towards the mansion. They immediately ran forward and Kia told Victor to join her at the front. Victor cut a huge bug in front of him and Kia easily slashed another bug. Victor told her that he thought the big ones were the leaders and she told him to leave them to her. They then proceeded to attack the swarm of bugs at the front together. Inside the tower, Vancouver composed himself and stood up furiously. He shouted at her not to touch his horde. When she was about to attack him again, he told her to wait because he had an idea. He aimed the bug spray at her and shouted combination attack, then pressed the bug spray together with his fire breath. She screamed in pain and collapsed on the ground while he was discarding the empty spray bottle. He quickly grabbed her body, causing her to shake in fear, and told her to the lead with her. The rangers were shocked to hear an explosion and saw Vancouver flying into the sky while holding the queen bug. Vancouver powerfully continued to ascend, attracting the smaller bugs. Victor pointed to the last big one with his side that held Furibun and another bug. The bugs angrily flew towards them, but Rolo jumped on the huge one while shouting that he knew how to end it, and then used his power to tame any animal. The bug was thrown into the galaxy. It heard Rolo tell it that it ate gold believing it would fill its belly, but all gold brought its suffering. Instead of suffering, Rolo said he would show it the true meaning of life, which was the farm. This confused the bug. Rolo told it to look at the verdant crops of the farm and the beautiful livestock. He said that in this simple life, gold and wealth were illusions because only the farm was real. The system showed him that he had successfully tamed a gold-eating insect princess. The villagers cheered and shouted in happiness because the gold-eating bugs were gone. Kia asked Victor what had happened and why the bugs were no longer attacking. Victor replied that their queen was gone and Rolo had dominated their new leader, so it was over. Meanwhile, Vancouver flew past the clouds into the sky and continued to space, telling her that he banished her from all space and time. Once they were in space, he threw her hard. It was shocking to see a huge and powerful fire coming towards her. When his fire hit her, she exploded due to the impact. The system then showed him that he had gained a level in Dragon Kaiser. This made him say that he should do it more often. The next day, Victor told Vancouver that the gold-eating bug princess changed while Rolo showed her the gold. She turned around in disgust, but he remained skeptical and said he needed more proof. Rolo put a lot of nails on the ground. Then, the system congratulated them because the gold-eating insect princess had changed her diet. She was now a lead-eating insect princess. Vancouver shouted that it was incredible. It seemed every creature could find a good path and live like a dragon, except for Furibun. Furibun was pure evil and had to be destroyed. 
Rollo said that any animal could become a farm animal if they tried hard enough. One day, all animals would be farm animals, and the whole world would be his farm. They didn't know someone was spying on them from a bush. Lucy noticed it was a bust and thought her mistress wouldn't be happy. A moment later, they walked into the village and saw the cobbles cleaning and fixing things. Victor said that the insect was on probation. If he found it near his gold, it would join its kind in outer space. Victor couldn't believe they were littering space before even starting the industrial age. When he looked up, he was shocked to see Kia resting Malphi. They were asked what it meant and if it was another bug. Kia said she found a demon, but Malphi told Victor that the paladin was in his personal space. Victor walked closer to them. He told Kia not to worry because Malphi was with them. Kia asked why they would trust a demon, but Malphi asked if it was about his species. He said he didn't choose to be born like that. Vankur said she should feel bad for judging by species. This made Kia nervous. Victor introduced Malphi and said he had investment plans for them. Malphi said he had the offer of the century. Kia felt bad and thought she wasn't against demons, as she had demon friends. Malphi said it was a new joint project of item shops and the first Nethramart would open in Murmurin. He asked Malphi how much it would cost. Malphi said half of all sales, but Vankur wanted it to be five five tenths. As his living signature, Victor would handle the paperwork. Malphi handed the contract to Victor and said he was happy to do business with him. Kia was angry. She thought Victor was against Demon King Brandon Mora, but now he was dealing with his henchmen. Malphi said not to compare Infercorp with their rivals, Mora Hell Corporated, because they cared about their clients. Victor thought they were against the Demon King, which made him realize something. He said he thought Brandon Mora was behind the insect attacks. This shocked Vancouver. Victor asked what were the chances those creatures came back right after they moved to the region. Vancouver told Victor he understood now. They had to stop Mora because he was trying to free the evil Furibon and bring back the Lick to the world. But Victor said the worst part was that Mora now had plans of dangerous weapons. Kia excitedly asked if they were going to attack the Demon King. Vancouver said they would, after his castle and vault door were fixed, so Kia asked to go with them. She said Brandon Mora was a strong half-elf, half-demon fighter. It would be risky to fight him without help. Vancouver said Mora was an elf, and elves were like sheep because they ate grass. He would eat Mora like a sheep, but he didn't mind having more shields so she could come. Kia was happy when she heard this and walked away. Malphi thanked them for their time and said they would start building soon. He would cheer for them to beat their competition. Vancouver flew away and told Victor he was going back to his horde. He told Victor not to forget to find a group of princesses before planning their next quest. Victor agreed. Kia asked Victor if there was an inn where she could rent a room. Victor said he had guest rooms in his house and asked if she wanted to see the place before they went out for a drink. She said yes. A few hours later, Victor, Kia, Allison, and Chocolatine were happy about their victory. Victor said it was nice to finally have a night without problems, but Allison told him not to jinx it. Chocolatine said she was excited to cook the insects. She thought she could make nice meals out of them, like shrimp. Kia said she missed protecting a village from a horde of monsters. She even leveled up and asked Victor how many levels he gained. He said none and that he was at level 30 and couldn't gain more. Kia said it was time for him to find a crest, but he asked what a crest was. Kia explained that crests were strong items that allowed someone to level up past 30. Heroic crests were even rarer and needed to level up past 60. After that, he could get to Valhalla at level 99 and try Apotheoses. He was shocked to hear this and asked if it was like becoming a god. Chocolatine answered that all gods were people who reached level 99, passed the tests of Valhalla, and then got the legendary level 100. But Kia told him that nobody knew what was in Valhalla and the gods wouldn't say. Allison told Kia she was the closest to level 99 out of all of them. She still couldn't believe she was having a drink with the Bright Knight herself. Kia told Allison that was what they called her. But at the end of the day, she was just some student who got hit by a truck. She was lucky to be born again at all. He asked them to wait and asked if they too were hit by a truck. Allison said yes and thought it was a strange thing, but Chocolatine asked what a truck was. He asked them suspiciously what color the truck was and they both said it was white. He hit the table in shock and told them they were all hit by the same truck. But Kia told him it was not just any truck, but a truck called Truck Kun. While Chocolatine still asked what a truck was and if someone could tell her. Later, Allison told him that she didn't know she drank so much. He asked her if he would have to carry her home. But Allison told him she would take care of drunken Kia. She asked him if he could walk Chocolatine home because the streets were not safe at night. He asked her if it was for Chocolatine or for everyone else. Allison helped Kia and told him there was something he should know since he was taking Kia in. She seriously told him that as long as she was alive, harems would not be allowed. She asked him if they understood each other. He said yes in fear and Allison told him she would be watching. Chocolatine was waiting for them. 
He walked with Chocolatine, remembering Allison's scary face. He thought Chocolatine might be a werewolf, but he felt Allison was the truly scary one. Chocolatine told him she hoped they could have more times like this with people and monsters getting along. He asked her if she really meant it because he thought she killed all the adventurers who came to murmur it. She said only because they always tried to hunt them first. She thought about it while in Jevonin and asked why civilized beings hated them, werewolves, monsters, and predators. He said maybe because they get eaten. Chocolatine happily agreed and said they ate them because they lack meat. So they chased them from the cities that could feed them, and the cycle continued. Also, by creating a city of monsters that could feed itself, they could inspire others to copy them and show civilized beings they could all eat in peace and maybe even trade. Victor smiled and asked her if she meant to live in peace, not eat. She said yes and told him it was the same thing. He told her it was a good idea and he was surprised she thought about it so much. She asked him if he thought it was possible and he said he hoped so because he thought dragons were mindless monsters too, and now he was at a party with one. Also, he would rather drink with monsters than fight them. A moment later, they got to Chocolatine's house. She said she guessed they would say goodnight and she would ask him in. But her brother didn't like him. He said it was okay and they would see each other tomorrow. Then he looked at her and thought that maybe he had Chocolatine all wrong because she really did care. And maybe she wasn't so bad after all. Their lips were close to each other when someone said sorry to him. He looked back, remembering the voice, and was shocked to see Charlene standing there. Then Charlene angrily asked him if she was interrupting something. The day after, in Pink Ranger's book, Her Immortal Dragon Chapter 2, The Dragon's Desire, Vancure was resting quietly on his treasure. Victor was thinking how rich Vancure was and wondered how he could show his true feelings for his lovely dragon master. But, he must love him from a distance. Out of nowhere, Vancure called Victor. Victor got scared and asked why. Vancouver told him that he was the bright gem of his treasure and his big brag day was tomorrow. He told Victor to treat himself and asked him to lay on the gold. Just then, Black asked Pink what she was writing. Blue took it and Pink told Blue to give it back quickly. It was not for the public. Blue asked if it was the sequel to War of the Horde, but he read the sweet story of Victor and Vancouver. This left him shocked while Pink tried to take it back. Blue said he was undead, but he was still scared. He asked Pink what she did. Pink just said that she had a story in her head that wouldn't leave her alone. Blue asked what lizards had to do with it and said it was worse than her bad romance story about Furibun. Pink told Blue that their Emperor Vancure, their Lord Victor, and the treasure were meant to be together. They made the perfect group. Black laughed and said their love was friendly, and everyone knew that Chief Victor would end up with Chocolatine. But Red said that he had a good feeling about a Vikia pairing. Yellow told Charlene that he still thought she could win Victor's heart. Just then, someone cleared their throat to get their attention. Quasson said hello to Charlene and asked if she was new. He asked her what her name was. She said her name was Charlene and she was the new representative of the Adventurers Guild in Murmurin. Quasson introduced himself. He told her he didn't like to brag, but he could say he ran that town. Red asked him since when. Charlene said she had work to do. The guild moved her to that small town with her ex, of all people, and she was not in a good mood. Quasson said that was tough. He asked her if he could show her around to make her feel better. She just asked him how about never. This made Red laugh a lot. Then he said they would go on the quest as proud members of the V&V company. Then Red went back to his friends and asked what they were talking about. Yellow told him that Pink was writing fan stories again. But Pink said they didn't understand. It was the only way she could express her artistic side. Pink also told them shyly that when Vancouver asked her to write about the lead event, she had to write a Furibun and Vancouver fanfic. Red told her that they all knew how hard the event that they will not name was. That's why they needed to train hard so it wouldn't happen again. Then Red said that a monster was eating Rolo's crops. If it kept happening, the animals would starve and Vancouver's big brag day feast would be ruined. Pink asked who would do such a mean attack. Was it the fiends? But Red said it was worse. It was a rabbit, but not just any rabbit. It was a black rabbit with a horn. If they didn't kill it, all the fields would be eaten by it. The rangers were scared. Yellow asked Red if they could beat it because its ears were like swords. Blue said that black rabbits could do magic. Red slapped Blue and yelled at them to stay calm. There was no bigger honor than dying so Vancouver could eat. Red yelled at them to remember what Victor said, that they were the top of the minions. Blue and the others cried and said sorry because they let their fear control them. Then Blue lifted his weapon and yelled that they fight for the treasure. Black yelled that they were made of gold. Yellow yelled that they doom their enemies. Pink yelled that they strive for their king. They all yelled that they were the cobbled rangers. This made a big explosion and threw Quasson in the air. He landed on the ground in front of Charlene. Later, they got to Rolo's farm. Red said that it was too quiet and they should get ready. Just then, they heard something coming closer. Red said that he was coming. The rabbit was angry and asked how they could stand in the way of his joy. 
Red yelled back that they were the Cobbled Rangers and they would defend Vancouver's pantry from him. Yellow said that he shall not pass. Allison and Chocolatine, who was helping her brother, saw the Rangers. The rabbit told the Rangers that their brave words meant nothing. All who stood in his way would be eaten and his horn would be covered in their unworthy blood. The Rangers saw the black rabbit as huge, but it was really small to everyone else. The rabbit teased them to come closer and called them his hunger minions. Then he called a rabbit army. Red shot them with his gun and yelled at his friends to defend the fence. He told Pink to sing and Blue to use his pebble to help him attack. Pink sang while Yellow and Blue attacked the Black Rabbit. Pink's song lyrics were Vancouver's words to them. Remember Furibon, take their swords, rise, and fight. Fight for the treasure and the bad ones will die in the king's flame. The system showed them that Pink's song made all of her friends' strength go up by plus five. They easily beat the White Rabbits that the Black Rabbit called. But then, the Black Rabbit attacked the Black Ranger with lightning. This threw him away and Pink worriedly called Black's name. Black was thrown hard to the ground. Yellow ran towards it angrily. He said it will pay for that and called it a dishonorable fiend. Yellow hit its horn, but it didn't react. It just jumped in the air and kicked Yellow away. Yellow fell to the ground, so Red told Pink to call the Mimic Sword. But Pink said they couldn't control it. Red still told her to do it. So Pink sang about the shiny sword and shining blade trapped in stone. The Black Rabbit flying kicked Blue and then attacked Red. When the boys were on the ground, it told Pink that now only she stood between him and his dinner. But then Junior Vancouver came and told the rabbit that he would feel the pain of a thousand deaths from his sword. He pulled the sword from his back and immediately attacked the rabbit with his fire sword. But the rabbit used its holy horn to fight back. They crossed paths. Junior Vancouver put his sword back in its stone body. The black rabbit was cut in half. It said that they were all food and would stay as food. Pink saw the white rabbit running away in fear. She happily yelled that they were retreating. The system showed Pink that she gained two levels in Bard and Extended Song. And her performance power-up lasted twice as long. The rangers cheered because they won. But then Junior Vancouver saw the sword they were folding and asked about it. But Yellow told Junior Vancouver that their swords are good, so it bite Yellow's sword while shouting that he was only sword making Yellow panicky agreed and told him that he'll use an axe next time. Red told them that what matter is that the vegetables are safe and sound. Then Pink happily shouted that bragging day is saved. The V and V Empire's enemies were legions, but wherever evil threatens crops, it shall find the cobbled rangers on its path in their majesty's name. The knight comes to the mansion. Inside, Victor Scythe, Furibin is laughing and calling them fools. He asks if they really think they can keep him chained up. He says all their trials have led them back to him, back to their doom. He suggests they settle it. Then, he makes them gaze upon his true form and despair. Suddenly, Victor opens the cabinet and asks Furibin why he is shouting in the middle of the night. Furibin says he was rehearsing for the day he finally escapes his cage. He asks Victor why he isn't sleeping. Victor says he heard Junior barking outside. They walk outside. Furibin asks Victor why he is bothering. He says, what's the point of having undead thralls if he doesn't use them for his problems? He says why doesn't he send the paladin to the guest room when she doesn't even pay rent? Victor replies that Kia sleeps heavily, especially after a drink or two. He says he was checking personally because he can't sleep. Furibin asks if it's because Victor was caught two-timing. Victor says no, he thought he and Charlene were over. Junior was barking at something. He asks Junior what he is barking at because he doesn't see anything. Suddenly, a strong light appears in front of him. He wonders if it's already dawn. Then, a white truck drives towards them, breaking tombs and startling them. Furibin tells him to dodge. Junior shouts that it's dangerous. They jump to the side in time to avoid the truck. It drives off like nothing happened. They are stunned and he wonders what it was. The next morning, Vancouver asks what a truck is, if it is some kind of cow. Victor says it was the vehicle that killed him on Earth. Vancouver asks if Victor was undead all along while Kia looks at the gold golem. Victor says he was reincarnated in Outramond after that thing killed him. He wonders how it can be in Murmurin and if he is going mad. Kia says he isn't because she saw the tracks. She says it was Truck Kun, there's no doubt about it. She doesn't know why it tried to run him over again when once should have been enough. Vancouver says whatever the reason, he won't let anyone harass his chief of staff. They will find that cow on wheels and eat it. Kia tries to explain that it's not food, but Victor stops her and shakes his head. Later, they arrive at the scene of the accident. Victor says it happened there. He says he smells fish and burning oil, then nothing. He thinks it's odd. Kia notices the tracks begin a few meters away. Furibin laughs and says the driver must be a mage who can teleport. But Victor wonders why attack him twice. Kia asks Victor if they should really be asking these questions. She says it's truck cun again. She tells Victor that maybe they are uncovering truths that mortals weren't meant to know. 
Vancouver says it's good she finally accepts her ignorance, but he is an immortal dragon and he won't surrender. Victor looks behind and says it's strange the truck avoided hitting older tombstones. He says they look older than the others. Vancouver tells Victor they didn't empty those tombs when hunting the foul insect queen. He guesses they contain treasures. Victor reads the intact graves. The first one is Sadu Subaru, the second is Sora Iwatara, and the last is Ikigo Kirita. Kia notices they are all Japanese names. Vancouver complains about the use of truck in Japanese and asks when will they, the manlings, learn to use real words. But Kia and Victor just nod at each other. A moment later, Allison asks if they mean the names on the oldest tombstones. She apologizes for not checking them. But now that they say it, it is odd they all sound Japanese. Kia asks if anybody knows the people buried there. Allison says no. She explains that Rolo has been in Murmurin the longest. Those tombstones were already there when Rolo settled in the village. Victor and Chocolatine look at each other and feel awkward. Then Allison tells them that Rolo found strange circles in the crops lately. They look a lot like car tracks. Vancouver angrily told Allison that a wild beast threatened his food stores. He asked why she hadn't warned him. Allison replied that the Cabolds kept the crops safe, so she hadn't worried much. She suggested he check with the group who often got requests when odd things occurred. Meanwhile, Chocolatine greeted Victor. She was about to mention the night just as they were close to kissing. He stopped her, saying now was not the time to talk, not with Charlene in town. Charlene said she got it and asked about another time. Allison sighed, noting she should have ruled out love triangles too. This was tougher than she had thought. Chocolatine assured her it was okay. She would simply beat the rivals. Soon, they reached the group's desk. Vancouver told Victor he smelled the same smell as in the graveyard. The beast that attacked him and harmed his crops was the same. But Kia asked why the truck-like beast was there and what made this town special. Victor greeted Charlene awkwardly. Charlene just glared at him. The system showed Victor he had taken cold harm. Kia, watching, said it was uneasy. Vancouver agreed, adding he could wait for his new crew. Charlene then told Kia it was a pleasure to meet her and greeted Vancouver. She asked how she could help them. After they shared the event, Charlene said they often got slight complaints about the truck. Usually, they came from the group called New World Order. Vancouver noted the name sounded familiar. Victor explained a member of that group had bothered them in Hodimer, and he had the Cabolds tackle him. Kia said they were the worst, believing Earth was paradise they would be born into again. She nervously added they always tried to get the claimed and wouldn't take no for an answer. Charlene said she knew they paid for many quests in the area. She would need time to find the details. Kia said it would be helpful if she could. Vancouver then asked about her three princesses as his bragging day was coming up fast. Charlene said she had one task if they were up for it. The task was titled The Demon King's Captive. It was gold-ranked, and the giver was King Ronald Gardamagni. The description stated that Brandon Mora, a known evil being, was collecting foreign beauties, including the king's own niece, Princess Merve. She was taken as a child during the war and kept as a political pawn. The reward was the king's gift to the one who saved his niece, as long as it was within reason. Victor asked if Brandon Mora kept many women. Charlene said it was worse. Mora sacrificed noble women to powerful demons for power as part of his big plan. Mora kept Merve alive only to stop an attack from Garda Magni. Vancouver shouted that princesses should be let go after bragging day to keep the royal system healthy. He said such irresponsible behavior endangered the species. He told Victor once his vault was fixed, they would defeat the wicked beast and protect the princesses. Kia excitedly said to count her in. Victor said he'd get ready for the trip. Victor then asked if he could talk to Charlene. She just asked what there was to say. She had asked to be moved there to see him again, only to find he had found someone else. She congratulated him, admitting she was at fault for thinking they could have been more than a fling. He explained he hadn't thought they'd see each other again after Hodimer. If he had known, he would have waited. She asked seriously if given a chance, would he leave Nightsbane? He said he wasn't sure and asked why it mattered. He didn't think he could leave even if he wanted to. She turned to look at Victor, shocking Vancouver. She said she had thought it over. She could get past the other woman but wanted a simple, stable relationship. They wouldn't have that if he stayed with Nightsbane. She didn't think he stayed because he had to, but because he liked it. Hearing this, Victor was shocked. Vancouver silently watched them. He walked towards them, feeling heavy. Kia asked if he was okay and offered a shoulder to cry on. He said it was fine and he just needed to think. But Vancouver asked why there was need to think when he was his right-hand man and the best of his crew. He would surely find someone better. Victor sadly agreed, adding maybe. Night fell, and he was in his big house looking out his window. He thought he might enjoy a calm night for once, then lay down, knowing he needed rest. Suddenly, people turned off their cloaking and put a cloth over his mouth and nose, making him sleep. Three unknown men grabbed him. One told his friend to bring the chosen one to the summoning place and shouted a cheer for Orknoob. A moment later, Kia knocked on Victor's room to tell him what she found in the basement. She knocked continuously on the door, telling Victor she found century-old wine and asked him if he was up for a drink. When she got no answer, she thought Victor must be asleep. 
Maybe that was best because she wanted to cheer him up. But she didn't think Victor would drink his sorrows away like her. Then she noticed Victor's room door was unlocked. She guessed she could take a look if she didn't make any noise. So, she slowly peeked inside the room and was shocked to see it empty. She walked inside and looked out, only to be surprised by seeing Junior and the undead tied up. Worried, she called out for Victor. On the other hand, Victor was tied up and thought it was his third time being kidnapped that year. It was starting to annoy him. The people with the red capes and the Earth logo raised their hands and one of them announced that the Chosen One was awake. They could begin the Ice Sky ceremony. The one with the crown told Victor that on behalf of the New World Order, they were sorry for his capture. But it was for a good cause, their good cause. Victor was surprised to see a circle sign on the ground and asked if it was the crop circle Allison mentioned. He figured out they were the ones driving that truck. The man replied that it was not them, but the holy truck doing as it wished. The one with blue hair told Victor that ever since the prophet Orknoob told them about the mythical land of Japan, they had been working for years to reach it. The one with the crown continued, saying that by studying the forbidden lore of Truck Kun, they had found a way. The area was a holy site for Truck Kun. All claim Japanese people from Earth ended up reincarnated there, even though monsters often ate them quickly. They wondered what would happen if the holy truck rolled over someone there in Outramond. The two men happily told Victor he would be reincarnated in Japan. It was reverse Ice Kai. They had been waiting for a powerful claim whose Ice Kai energies would attract the holy truck. Victor was scared when he realized they were serious. He asked if they wanted to summon Truck Kun, get run over, and reincarnate in Japan. They said yes. He asked them why anyone would want to do it. The blue man said he wanted a harem with his own waifu. The other man excitedly said he wanted a schoolgirl wife, a demi-human with cat features, maybe a raccoon, and a lowly. But she would be a thousand-year-old immortal, which would make it okay. Victor had heard enough. He delayed his escape until he knew what they wanted. He realized they were worse than he thought, not just deluded but also selfish. He wondered who would have told them Japan was like that. Suddenly, a light appeared behind them. The people thought it was there and begged the holy truck to take them to the holy land. But Victor's face lit up when he saw it was Vancure. He told the Orklings to repeat Japan one more time. But the Orc threw their weapon at him and shouted to run. However, he gathered fire in his mouth and attacked them with it, causing them to panic and run. He then asked Victor if he was alright while freeing him from the rope. Victor said he was happy to see him, but he only asked Victor why it was unusual. The blue-haired man pointed in a direction, telling his companion it was the way back to their barn, not noticing someone was there. When he reached that point, Kia pointed her sword at his neck and told him, No, you don't. Rolo stops them while Kwasin tells them that he smelled orcs near the fields. But no one ever trusts the ranger. Red rangers tell the enemy to put their hands behind their heads in anger, and Chocolatine asks if she can eat them because she thinks they might taste good. Kia says that Vancouver will decide, but then she sees a bright light coming at her and jumps to the side quickly while shouting that it's coming at them. The blue one does not avoid it but yells that he's waited his whole life for this and asks the truck to take him to Japan. But the truck avoids him. This makes him confused. It also avoids others, but goes straight toward Allison. Luckily, Kia grabs her and jumps away to avoid it, but the truck drives toward Victor making him call out to the gods, not again. Thankfully, Vancouver uses his tails to break it into pieces in time. Victor covers his face and calls to him worriedly, but he just says it's his, then the truck crashes to the ground. Kia and Chocolatine are shocked to see that the truck has disappeared, leaving only destroyed ground behind. In the end, the nature of the truck remains a mystery, but she doesn't think it will come back soon. The cultists are too sad to fight back and as it turns out, even the truck has standards. It tells Victor that the lick is the problem, not the orcs, so he should make his cave more secure. Victor says he will and thanks it for saving him, then asks how it knew he was in trouble without him knowing. Vancouver was flying above his house, watching over him, but he only tells Victor that he is a dragon, so he knows everything. Victor says that makes sense. Then Victor tells him that Charlene said he would never have a steady relationship as long as he stays with him. But he asks Victor why he would give up a good life as his helper for the love of one human. Victor says he wondered that too and guesses it wouldn't work in the first place while Chocolatine secretly watches him from far away. He tells Victor that he understands his wish to keep his kind going. But he shouldn't worry too much about it because the village is full of his helpers and they will bring in many more. So surely he will find a woman among them with whom he can breed happily. Victor sighs when he hears this and tells him that he might be right. But he asks Victor why might when he is always right. Victor tells him that Charlene and he want different things, so he guesses he should accept it and find someone who likes the same things he does. Then Victor thanks him for his advice. He proudly says you're welcome. But the truth is, he feels strange because he feels a warm feeling inside him when he looks at Victor, almost as if Victor was family. The next day, Vancouver held a huge bag while the people gathered near him. Victor asked him if he truly meant to carry the princesses in the bag he was holding. 
He asked Victor back if he thought it was too small because he had a spare cage too, but Victor told him never mind. Tia told him that she didn't know if she should be okay with that whole kidnapping princesses thing and asked him if he was not going to hurt them, but he just asked her back, what do you take me for, and told her that he would release them in the wild after his bragging day. Tia was happy to hear it and told him that as long as she could finally give Mora the beating he deserved, it was good enough for her. The rangers saluted him and told him that they would keep order in his absence. When Victor was about to walk toward his hand, Chocolatine gave Victor a cake for the trip. After that, they flew away to kidnap the princesses and kill Mora, leaving Charlie and saying them good luck and telling them that she would pray for their success. But suddenly, Kwasan appeared behind her and told her that he noticed she moved on from her ex, making her mad. Then she walked away while telling Kwasan that she supposed so, and she guessed they would stay friends. Kwasan told her that it was good news and asked her if she was back on the market because he knew a place she would love without them noticing Lucy spying on them from the side. Lucy touched her flower and Odeuse's reflection appeared. Lucy apologized to her mistress that the insects failed her and told her that Nightsbane had left the town to go after Brandon Mora, but she just told Lucy that it was good, making Lucy confused and asking why it was good. She replied that it would finally get the princeling out of his comfort zone, and Mora had been itching to test the Iron Eagle for a while. Days later, they arrived in Ishfania's capital of Moria. Tia told them to be careful because the invisibility would trick lesser fiends, but neither Mora nor his demons. Victor told them that he wondered why the city was so lightly defended because he expected more guards, but Vancure told them that he smelled many demons gathering nearby. Suddenly, Victor noticed something and asked what it was, then they saw an airplane on the ground while demons were completing it. Tia was surprised to see it, and Furubin excitedly shouted that it was finally done because he thought they would never complete it. Vancouver thought it was a big bird, but Victor knew that they used the Pineapple of Wisdom to create a magical bombardier, but Kia told Victor that it was bigger than the Titanic, and they had to destroy it before it took off. Vancouver's eyes opened wide, and the system showed that he activated the Virgin Princess radar, then he immediately flew toward where the princess was, making Victor shocked. Then Kia also ordered her eagle to charge and attack the demon that was in her way while he was telling them that he sensed the princesses. On the other hand, in the stadium, the host welcomed fiendish gentlemen and devil ladies to the demon Corrida, and told them that three noble ladies would be sacrificed today for the pleasure of hell, including the niece of Gardamagna's King Roland himself, Prince Princess Merve. The host also told them that a ghastly deed would be done by their esteemed king's guest, the beautiful and poisonous Mel Odeus, making the crowd cheer in excitement. Princess Merve was hopelessly tied up with rope while someone shouted that it was his turn continuously, then he got down in front of Odeus, breaking the ground in the process. He immediately and loudly told the princesses to get into the bag. But Victor told him that they were chained, and Furibin told them that he wasn't invited to the demon Corrida, but he was glad they arrived on time. Suddenly, Odeus trapped the princesses inside her crystal prison and told them that they had come to delay their plan again. But it ends there. He knew that there was no mistaking the smell, that Odeus was the worst kind of fairy, the ancient enemy. Then he told Victor to get behind him because Odeus's kind hunts men for their fur. Victor asked him who she was because his perks couldn't read her, and she felt wrong. She introduced herself and told Victor that she was a fairy lord of the farmers. The host told the viewers that a surprise challenger had stormed in, and it was Vancure Nightsbane, Emperor of Murmurin and the Albane Mountains self-proclaimed great calamity of the age, but he told the host that self-proclaimed did not belong to his title, but the host just introduced the viewers that in the other corner, the demonic superstar, the invincible champion, the undefeated king of Ishfania, and the fabulous Brandon Mora. Then Mora appeared beautifully while biting a red rose in his mouth. Mora told Victor that he knows that expression all too well, and the mere sight of Brandon Mora's perfect body has made him fall for him. He gets that reaction all the time, but Victor says he is actually just very surprised by the Trage de Luce's outfit, while Furibin thinks Mora is still the same brat. Still, Mora told him that there is no need to deny his lustful feelings for his sublime body because he welcomes all admirers, and for beauty has a lover, and his name is Brandon Mora. Vancouver says that Mora is quite full of himself for an elf grass eater, but Furibin told him that he has no idea. Then Mora told him that he has slighted him for months, slew his minions, and stole his precious pineapple. He then asks him what did he do to deserve it, but he just told Mora that he exists in his world. He was an emperor, so he does as he wants. Mora told him that he was not an emperor, but a lizard. Murmurin is a daughter of Ishfania, and Ishfania has only one king, and it was the king who stands before him. The system warned him that his emperor title is contested by Brandon Mora, and that if he does not assert his rightful authority, his emperor class perks will be nulled. He was confused reading it and wondered what is there to contest. Victor asks Mora what does he intend to do with that plane and how did he build it so fast. 
Mora replied that he simply needed the pineapple for the finishing touches, and as for what he will do with it, Earthlings have a word for it, and it is something with carpets. Odeus reminds Mora that it was carpet bombing, to which Mora agreed and told them that he will carpet bomb the monkey farms of Gardamagni until only rubble remains. Also, he will make a short detour to raise that stinking Murmurin village. Victor fearfully asks why and what is the point. Mora replied that he has many qualities like beautiful, perfect, and generous, but forgiving is not among them, so if they wish to survive with all their ears attached to their body, they shall release Mora's lick servant at once, making Furibin shy. But Vancure told Mora that he will not let him release that evil on the world, so Mora told them that his will shall be fulfilled, and told Odeus to do him a favor and clear his arena of peons, to which Odeus replied as the princeling wishes. Vancure jumped to midair and used his dragon fire to attack them, but Mora beautifully and simply avoided it, making the devil ladies scream in love with him. But suddenly, Odeus appeared behind Victor, making him panic, knowing she was behind him. Then Odeus used her hell zone and pushed Victor into the lava on the ground. Seeing it, he panicked and shoutingly said that he was not clearing a dungeon again and ordered them to bring Victor back at once. When Mora was going to tell him that only a true winner makes demands, something exploded outside the stadium. Tia attacked the plane, making the demon shout that the Iron Eagle was being destroyed, and the enemy has brought reinforcements, but Odeus just told Mora that it was not for long. Vancour told Mora that he will show him his place as a grass eater and told Odeus that her feeble fairy magic can do nothing to him. But Mora just teasingly told him that only the weak rely on magic to win their fight because a true warrior just needs his Mileta and his Espada. Then Mora challenged him one-on-one, -on -one, champion against a dragon. He furiously growled and told Mora that he, Vancure Nightsbane, does not back away from a fight. Then the system showed that he accepted Mora's demon core to challenge and the audience will empower or weaken the fighters depending on their performance. Mora told him that he swears on his honor as a matador, that day, he, Vancure, shall learn the bitter taste of defeat. On the other hand, outside the stadium, the plane attacked Kia from above, and the demon launched toward her too, but she simply avoided the plane attack and sliced the demon in half. She noticed the woman above and had no doubt about it that she was the fairy lord of the farmers. Odeus asked her if she was truly a woman who slew Balor and told her that she had grown rusty. But she just told Odeus that it was just another one of their sick ploys to destroy Garda Magni. Then she used his solar judgment power to attack the plane. But Odeus used her magic to shield it and told her that it matters not how long her mortals delay her inevitable extinction. But they, the farmers, are forever so centuries mean nothing to them. And one day, the world shall be theirs again. Odeus also told her that her efforts were wasted because the Iron Eagle is ready to take flight. But she replied that it doesn't matter because once Vancure demolished the Demon King, his army will collapse. But Odeus told her that she wouldn't be so sure because the Princeling may be an idiot. But there is a reason why her kind never managed to defeat Mora. On the other hand, inside the stadium, a large fire explosion could be seen and heard. He tried to grab Mora, but Mora easily dodged it. Then Mora turned his sword back to him and activated his Estacade power, then hit Vancure neck with it. The system showed that instant death was stopped by Dragon Scale. Then he angrily told Mora that it was sad, but Mora teasingly told him that he shall not land a single hit on his perfect skin. Then Mora activated his death or victory power while the system showed him that Brandon Mora's agility, skill, and strength have increased by 4 stages plus 20, but his vitality had dropped by 30. He tried to attack Mora again, but Mora just jumped away to avoid it, making him very angry. He shouted for Mora to come back there. Mora landed on the ice trap and activated his Fina Muleta, but the system showed him that the intelligence check was failed, so his strength had increased by 2 stages plus 10, but he could only use physical attacks against Brandon Mora. Mora attacked him using Spell Purge over and over, making him shout in pain. He looked at Mora with anger, but Mora told him that it was no magic trick. Then Mora raised his sword in the air and activated his air blade. Then Mora swung it down, telling him that it was all his. The system showed him that the love of his fans made Brandon Mora strong, so Mora's blade would now do Dragon Slayer damage. Then Mora attacked him with his air blade over and over, making him mad and tell Mora to get off his perfect face. He noticed that he couldn't follow that grasshopper's movements or use his flames, so all he could think of was charging at that silly cloth, and he planned to do it again. Then he attacked Mora, but Mora avoided it, so he crashed into the wall instead. While he was down on the ground, Mora teasingly told him that he was no emperor but a bull because he had all strength and no skill. He shouted, trying to turn invisible, but noticed that it was broken, making him ask Mora if he broke it. Mora replied that he should have expected that from a weak dragon like him and told him that while they, the savage beasts, ate cows in their caves, they, the elves, ruled the greatest empire in the world. He turned around slowly, telling Mora that they made the world first and he had more power as an egg than his whole inbred species. But Mora told him that he was a rough beast, and while he was in diapers, he was strangling manling monkeys with just his hand. 
While Mora's eye was filled with sand and couldn't open, he took the chance and ate Mora whole, making the viewers look in fear at the scene. Then he just swallowed him, making the viewers disagree with him. But he told them that he didn't care and that he won. But all at once, he felt something moving inside him, then he coughed, and Mora came out of him whole. Then the system showed him that he had lost a quarter of his health, making him wonder if it was pain that he could feel. Mora changed to his original appearance and told him that he had done it because he made him mad enough to show his true demon matador form. Then Mora used his all-or-nothing power, making the crowd's electric enthusiasm raise all of Brandon Mora's stats by one stage plus five, but he figured out that he still couldn't use his breath. Mora immediately flew toward him and slashed his body twice using a sword. The system showed him that it was massive damage and he had lost half of his HP. He looked at his body and wondered if it was his blood and if he could bleed. Mora confidently told him that he was no emperor, thou art a beast, fit only to have his horns cut, and he ruled supreme, making the crowd cheer for Mora. He was injured on the ground while the system warned him that he failed to properly defend his emperor title by steamrolling his challenger, and all of the emperor class perks are ineffective until he manages to slay Brandon Mora or cow him into submission. Then Mora told him that he would slaughter all his fans after he was done. Then he would claim all his treasures as his own. But Vancouver disagreed because he was the beast of legends, the greatest calamity of the age. And dragons don't give up because, in the end, they always win. Then he strongly told Mora that he would not fall for his horde. The system showed that the dragon's arrogance was triggered, so all stat debuffs were removed. His fans became lively and shouted his name while the others shouted Mora's name. The system showed him that his charisma was successful, and by impressing the cruel crowds of Ishfania with his fighting spirit, he earned the Bravo Bull, which means when his health is critical, his strength is greatly raised. Mora jumped backward while teasingly asking him if he was up for more because he would provide. But he was just launching in silence while thinking that if he could not win with his immense strength, then he would use his peerless intelligence, and he knew that there had to be a way to bypass that silly red wing. And it was the only thing preventing him from roasting that grasshopper. Then he figured out that he could only use physical attacks against the moth, so he used his flame, but he could still get the stage ablaze. Mora told him that his flame wouldn't be enough to defeat him while the system showed him that his flames were inflicting heavy holy damage on Brandon Mora. He burned Mora's fans while telling Mora that he couldn't burn him but it would give him enough time to destroy the source of his power, which was his fans. The system showed him that he interrupted the demon Corrida, so all of his stat changes had been cancelled, and by feasting on the spicy thralls of Brandon Mora, he recovered some HP. Mora immediately used his sandstorm power and made a huge tornado, making the viewers panic and run away for their lives. Mora angrily asked him what kind of beast attacks an audience of loving demon supporters, and he proudly replied that it was the dragon kind, then told Mora that he had no more minions to support him. But Mora told him that he just only delayed his inevitable defeat and cheering fans or not, he would triumph. Mora readied his sword to attack him again, but suddenly, the ground they were standing on exploded, making them fly away in different directions. He was surprised to see Victor coming out of it and asked him what he had missed. Before it, he was thrown inside hell and remembers that Charlene told him he was already in hell when he first introduced Vancouver into her life. And as it turned out, he did end up there, right on the devil's doorstep. Suddenly, a spear slashed in front of him, making him shocked. A lady with two guards asks him if he was the new sacrifice but notices that he was not a virgin maiden. He replied that he had not been mistaken for one while shyly thinking that it was bad. The system showed him that the woman is Archdevil Isabel Mora, chief demonic executive of Mora Hell Corporated. She was strong against darkness, drain, mind, insta death, all ailments, frost, lightning, wind, and poison, but weak against light, fire, demon slayer, and bug slayer. Also, she is one of Hell's corporate overlords who secretly regrets sacrificing her golden years for her career. Isabel told him that he smelled of dragon and asked him if it was Furibun's soul she saw trapped in his side. Furibun apologized to her because he failed to break the Hellgate seal on schedule, but she replied that it was alright because the army behind it isn't moving anywhere, so he'll still get to keep his free dental healthcare. Victor still has Kia's teleporting stone, since Vancure is too lazy to carry it himself, but he wonders if it would work in Hell, so he realizes that he has got to buy more time to figure something out. Then he happily asked Isabel if she was Brandon Mora's mother. She happily asked him if he knew her Brenino, how he was, and if he conquered Gardamagni yet. Victor told her to wait and asked if Mora didn't inform her. She sadly replied no and told him that Mora never visits and only calls when he wants something, like if he wants a demon pony or needs more infernal power. Victor told her that parenting is a thankless job, to which she agreed, and told him that something she regretted was eating Mora's father. Then she asked him how did he end up there. 
he introduced himself and told Isabel that Odeus sent him there with a spell. She told him that she told Mora not to listen to that Odeus because nothing good can come out of dealing with fairies, and what they demon do for business, they do for pleasure. Victor told her that he would be thankful if she could send him back to Outramond. But she told him that her ungrateful son will wait and she wanted him to tell her everything Mora has been up to. When he was about to reply he will with pleasure, she told him that after it, he will be killed, making him stunned in fear and asking what she means. Isabel replied that her Mora has been complaining about a certain vancuer, and him for a while, so family first. But she told him not to worry because she doesn't torture polite young men. Furibin happily told them that he'll have a hell of a time watching it while he was in fear. Suddenly, a powerful smoke appeared in the center of them, and someone shouted to Isabel to stop because it was a violation of their rights. Malphi appeared with the other demon businessmen making Victor ask if he was Malphi, but Malphi cleared that it was Vice President Malfacent now, and the shareholders loved the new Murmurin project so much that they promoted him after Chocolatine, his predecessor, but he still could call him Malphi. The other businessmen walked closer to her, making her ask what the heaven they were doing there. One of the businessmen told her that Victor Dalton there is protected by their Faustian Associate Protection Program, and Victor was a true mortal partner of Infercorp and Murmurin. Then the other continued by saying any violence against their client would be an act of corporate warfare, and for the sake of their mutual market shares, they asked that she abandon all pursuits against Mr. Vicotter, or else they'll send the bailiffs. She snatched the paper while saying that Murmurin is part of her market but they teasingly told her that it was before, but it's theirs now. Malphi told Victor that now he understands the good things of having a friend in low places. He expects Vancouver to say yes to their new whispering brothel project. Victor happily agreed, but said if he can send him back to Outramond and ask if an act of business fighting was really a thing. Malphi told him not to worry because they'll make sure he gets away with everything. Then they happily walked away, leaving Isabel angry. Then he told Vancouver that it was how he got away from hell with a golden parachute, safe and sound. Vancouver proudly said that he expected that from his chief of staff and he trained him well. But Mora told them that it does not matter because he will cut off their heads and send them to hell. Victor told Mora that he almost didn't know him for a second and said his mother sent her love. Mora angrily asked what he had done to his mother, but Victor asked Mora what he had done to his mother. He said she was worried about him and he only calls her for help, so he should feel shame. Furibin told Victor that Mora's young time never ended. But Mora told Victor that he asked his mother for a party game and she gave it, making Victor ask what that meant. Mora flew toward him to attack, making Vancouver shout Victor's name in fear. Then a loud noise was heard. Mora stabbed Victor in the chest, not seeing Vancouver behind him. He told Victor that there is no bigger joy than dying by Brandon's hand, but was confused to see Victor didn't die. Suddenly, Vancouver hit him to the ground hard, making him hurt. Then he told Vancouver that looking back, it might have been a mistake. But Vancouver hit him into a wall while saying not to touch his horde. A message showed Vancouver that by beating the big demon lord, he went up a level in Gladiator and in Dragon Kaiser. He also got new skills and things that make him strong in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. He also got the power to call his trusty chief of staff Victor to his side, but was warned that he has reached the top level, so he can't go higher until he uses a special crest but he can still get special perks through doing great deeds. Mora was thrown into a village tower and fell to the ground. But even though Mora was very hurt, he told Vancouver that it was not over, not at all. On the other hand, Victor told Vancouver that he needed healing. But Vancouver said they couldn't rest yet because he hadn't got back his emperor powers. So the moth still lived. Victor agreed because he thought it wouldn't be so easy. Thankfully, he saw Kia with her eagle coming. When she landed, she told them to quickly grab the princesses because they needed to use a special stone and go away fast. But Vancouver said no, not without the moth's head. Kia healed Victor while he asked if she had destroyed the plane. She said no, she didn't. Then, a huge plane came toward them and Odeus told Vancouver that she was tired of him. She told her people in the plane to kill them all. The plane put a target on a confused Vancouver and Odeus said it meant death. Then the plane shot at Vancouver, making him scream in pain. But thankfully, Kia jumped in time for them to dodge it. They were slammed into hard crystal. Then Vancouver told Victor that he felt sick while a message said he was in very bad health. Odeus asked how he lived through a weapon made for castles, but he said he was too strong. She said it didn't matter and told her people to bomb the dragon again. Kia yelled at Victor to use the stone, and he quickly called them back to the treasure. The bombs were close to hitting Vancouver again, but they were moved to the treasure in time. Victor was happy it worked, and Kia said that it was close, but Vancouver said he was not feeling well. Victor said they almost died, but Vancouver said that death is a problem only for animals like them, not dragons. He wondered if he could die too, but thought it was still not possible. Then a message said he figured out that dragons can die, so he got smarter. He realized that his whole way of life was built on a lie. Yeah.
Meanwhile, in the stadium, Mora can't believe that his beautiful stadium was destroyed. But Odeus told him that he desired a test of the weapon, and it was delivered. Mora angrily asked her if it did and told her that his stadium was now a crater, and the dragon escaped anyway. But Odeus told him that even Vancouver was no match for the Iron Eagle's power. She asked him, if Vancouver couldn't destroy it, what hopes does Gardamagni have? He smiled and replied that it was true, then asked how long it would take to repair the ship. His demon replied that a week at most because the paladin only inflicted minor damage. Mora ordered his men to send messages to all of the Ishvanian legions and once his Iron Eagle is repaired he will lead his army to invade Gardamagni. The man agreed and asked how many soldiers they would gather for the assault. He happily replied, all of them. Meanwhile, in Victor's mansion, he was lying on the bed thinking that it didn't go well because they almost died. Even Vancouver and Mora was going to attack them soon, so they had to prepare. Furibin told him that he could no longer gain levels and his old master possessed the strongest weapon in the world, so no one could help him. But he told Furibin that he could help, making Furibin confused and ask him what he meant. He replied that Furibin was an archmage, so surely he had spells he could teach him. But Furibin asked him why he would teach him anything. He happily shook his scythe while asking Furibin to confirm if he didn't have Stockholm Syndrome or something because they had been together for weeks, but Furibin replied, never. He silently and smilingly looked at Furibin, then shook his scythe continuously, making Furibin tell him to stop shaking him, and he would give him pointers. He told Furibin that he was much obliged, but Furibin told him that he hated him so much. Suddenly, a bright light appeared, making him confused, and he asked what it was. Then a lady called him Mr. Dalton and introduced herself as the Angel Meal, and she had come to save his soul. He fearfully asked her if he was going to die again, and Meal replied, No, but you almost did. Then she explained to him that each year, thousands of neutral aligned mortal souls end up in hell by accident, so he might not be so lucky next time. He asked her if she was saying he would go to hell when he died, and she replied that he might. But it's not too late to save his soul, and all he needed to avoid was eternal damnation. He wondered if Malphi could get him a cushy job downstairs, but then Meal told him that all he had to do was buy the right karma insurance and explained to him that by insuring his karma and giving them some of his SP every month, he could avoid eternal torment when he died. He was stunned hearing it while Meal brightly smiled at him. He stressfully tried to compose himself, but Meal told him to consider signing up for their Hellfire Protection Plan, or else he would be tortured forever when he died, and they would use the SP he spent on that plan to save orphans and heal the sick, so if he refused their insurance, he was committing a sin. He asked her if she was trying to guilt trip him when someone knocked on his door, then Kia told him that she talked with Charlene and sent a message to her partner Nostradame and Gardamagni, so they should send reinforcements to help them. But then Kia noticed an angel and asked if she was Meal. Meal remembered her and told her that she didn't know she lived there, making him ask them if they knew each other. Kia replied that Meal was the intern of her karma insurance counselor, then she asked Meal how things were going upstairs. Meal happily replied that she finally graduated from the redemption chasing department, and Victor would be her first client. Kai told him not to worry because they were pushy, but they meant well. Neil gave him a redemption for Dummy's book while telling him that in his case, she would suggest starting with the Halo insurance, and he replied that he guessed he could take a look at the plans because he couldn't dodge death forever. Suddenly, he heard Vancouver calling him, then a light came out of his body, making the two girls shocked, and he vanished, making them panic. Then he was transported to the Horde upside down. Vancouver told him that he could not break those crystals no matter how hard he punched them, and ordered him to find a way to free his princesses. But Victor just asked him how did he teleport him there. He replied that he summoned him, calling Minion with his new summon herald perk, and now he could fulfill all of his requests without wasting time. He was speechless, shocked to hear it, and asked himself why him, while Vancouver told him that after much thinking, he had come to accept that death is not a birth defect. Victor explained to him that death comes to all of them, except maybe the gods, but Vancouver would need to reach level 99 to become one. He ordered Victor that he would find two crests so that they might blow up that giant bird, eat that grasshopper, become gods, and never die. Victor asked why he needed to find two crests, and he replied that it was for the two of them. Then he reminded Victor that he told him to become immortal before, so he should not make him repeat himself. Victor fearfully thanked him for his concern, but Victor could tell that facing Vancouver's mortality shook him to the core. Still, he'll look into insurance, just in case, and maybe Vancouver would benefit from insurance too, but Victor hoped Vancouver would get some rest. Many centuries ago, in Midgardian hinterlands, the pink dragon told her husband that the eggs were hatching, and the Marin dragon replied that he wondered which one would hatch first. Then Vancouver happily came out and told his parents to look at him because he was beautiful, and when he grew up, he would be richer than them. 
His father told his mother to look at how big their eldest was and thought that he was a born winner. Then his mother decided to call him Vancouver. Since the moment he was born, he has never failed at anything. He learned to fly on his first try, and he could breathe fire before any of his siblings. His father told him that upon realizing that her children were too good to work, the Elder Worm created the first minions, making him ask his father if it meant non-dragons existed to serve them. His father replied, of course, and told him to look at how happy they were to spoil them, but the truth was the people were scared to death because of them. His father told him that if he didn't eat his cow, Dragon Bane Watton would come to eat him, but he reminded his mother that she said true dragons never die. His mother replied that it was true, but he wouldn't become immortal until he ate his dinner, and true dragons could only die while young, or if they hibernated, but even the farmers couldn't defeat them at their best. His siblings asked their parents what about dragon slayers and if they were real. Their father replied that he said true dragons, and sometimes, one of them was born with the birth defect called mortality and carried it even into adulthood, but their mother told them that all of them would grow into true dragons to which Vancouver proudly shouted that he was fire, and he was deaf. His parents believed in rigorous education, so they sent him to study alongside his cousin Genialisime under the famed Princess Hunter, Grandrake. Grandrake told them that elven princesses are among the rarest found in the wild, and they could see her thriving in her natural girl posse social hierarchy. His cousin told Grandrake that the princess was so beautiful, and though he faced envy and competition, his cousin told him that he saw her first, but he told Icefang to go back to his igloo. He grew into an experienced princess hunter himself. In time, all paid him homage as the strongest dragon of his generation, the great calamity of that age. He opened his eyes, felt his head hurt, and coughed continuously. Then he vomited a lot of armor and weapons, making him feel sick. At 11.98 AM, a century before Victor Dalton's ill-attempted robbery, in Collignanburg, the biggest city of the Midgard Republic, his surrounding was on fire while he was wondering what did he do last night. A moment later, in Midgardian hinterlands, Vancouver's old lair, the goblin told his friend that they should run away because Vancouver ate half of them last month when he ran out of cows. But his friend told him that if they try to run, Vancouver will eat all of them. One of them suggested to the other that they should wait for the long winter when Vancouver hibernates, and then they run without looking back. Suddenly, Vancouver landed in his lair, making the goblins thrown away and shouting in panic. Then he told his minions to stop slacking and asked if his horde was safe, but one of the goblins just asked him why he was back and what was the matter. He replied that it was safe and that he did not remember what he did last night, so he was worried, but the goblin was glad that Vancouver didn't hear them. Then he told his minions to be good minions and tell him what they remember. One of the goblins fearfully replied that he swore he took the big bag and left yesterday. He asked the goblin if he meant the grocery bag, and the goblin replied yes, then reminded him that he was hungry and would do his groceries. Also, he would eat them if they couldn't find cows. He told them that since they were still alive, he must have found what he was looking for, but he knew that it shouldn't take a whole day. Then he flew again and told his minions that he would go look for answers and eat them another time. One of the goblins said good luck to him, but the other one told his friend to tell other goblins to pack their bags and be ready to flee at a moment's notice. A moment later, he arrived at his favorite grocery place, but he sensed something vile. He got down and smelled the stinky fairy's stench, making him remember that the day before, he was happily grabbing a cow while singing and when he was about to eat the cow someone told him that he had been looking for him. Then the person introduced himself as Magmel of the Farmers, Patriarch of the Mel Clan, Father of Plagues and Monsters. He introduced himself as Vancouver Knightsbane and told Mag that he could do everything he did, but much better, and asked if he had come to die by his hand. But Mag replied that others would die, and all the new folk who polluted their lands would die, and such was the word of High Balor, the mightiest of their kind. He teasingly asked Mag if he meant the overmighty Dullahan and told him that the strongest of them, fairies were no match for the weakest of dragon kind. But Mag told him that they killed many dragons in the dark days. He clarified that the dragons they killed suffered from birth defects, so it didn't count, but Mag told him that he was the greatest of dragon kind, the great calamity of that age, or so he pretended. But he told Mag that he did not pretend because he really was the great calamity of that age. Hearing it, Mag told him that if so, he should fight by his king's side and help them wipe the mortals from that world. Also, there would be a great reward for joining in that carnage and soon. They would wage a great war, they would spill the blood of mortals and rule out Ramond again like in the old days. But he told Mag that he had always ruled and he would still do so, and it was his kind who had grown weak enough to be defeated by manlings. Mag explained to him that the mortals were vermin and the magic they used was a disease, so they had to die for that world to be purified. He asked Mag why he would exterminate his favorite food, and if he killed all the puny races, where would he find coins and princesses? Then he seriously asked Mag if he had thought of the logistics and ordered Mag to be gone before he devoured him because Vancouver Knightsbane was no one's pet. 
Mag proudly told him that on the day of the solstice, he should mark his words, that in time, the mortals would come for him and his kind too. He was shocked to hear it and flew immediately, thinking that the solstice was that day, so he should quickly find a princess because he had no time, leaving Mag shocked and speechless. Meanwhile, in the peaceful castle, the princess was peacefully and enjoyingly listening to the elf musician who was making music for her, while the other nobles were chattering. The knight heard something coming, then suddenly, he broke the ceiling and appeared, making the people in the castle shocked, together with the princess. He told the princess that she would do, but the knight told him that at long last they met again. But he called the knight elfling and told him that he was too busy today to help him commit suicide because he had to be in the region of the Great Lakes before sundown, so he ordered the knight to fall on his sword on his own. But the knight told him that he would not ignore him because he was Orsted from Kolignenberg and reminded him that he burned his city 15 years ago. But he didn't remember it. Orsted asked him if he did not remember it, but he asked Orsted back how he expected him to remember every place he visited for groceries and told him that after a time, they all started blurring together. Orsted was pissed, hearing that he called his place grocery and reminded him that it was in the west, near the sea, and there was a white chalk cliff nearby. Because of it, he remembered it and asked Orsted to confirm if it was the city with the big clock. But Orsted told him that they didn't have a clock tower because their water clock was destroyed 50 years ago to put out a fire caused by a dragon. Then Orsted figured it out and asked him if he burned their city twice, but he just asked Orsted if he thought he overturned their villages because he liked it, and told Orsted that it would be much easier if they left their cattle and princesses on display for him to take, but they, manlings, only thought of themselves. Orsted called him a monster and said that he would strike him with his holy sword. Then Orsted attacked his head using Leon's edge power, but Orsted was stunned and shocked when he saw his sword break in half. He furiously opened his mouth to eat Orsted, who couldn't believe what he was seeing. Because of this, he figured out where the armor he vomited came from and wondered if he was visiting his family. But he was confused why he wanted a princess to brag about. Then he noticed his cousin Genialisime with Blight Swamp on the shore. He flew toward him, making Genialisime ask if he was sober while hugging Blight Swamp. But he just asked his cousin why he bred with Blight Swamp when she lives in a marsh. Genialisime told him that he hurt her feelings, so he gave her a wing to cry on. Then one thing led to another. He told Genialisime that he didn't remember anything, but his cousin just laughingly said that it didn't surprise him because he was in terrible shape yesterday. He also told him that Jolie was super worried for him, but he asked his cousin who was Jolie. Then he remembered that the solstice was Jolie's first bragging day. Jolie happily told him that he came, and he asked Jolie how he could miss her sweet niece's first bragging day. Then he told Jolie that he brought her a present. Jolie asked if it was a minion because Grognon brought her first minion too, and it was a catkin kitten. But he told Jolie that it was something even better, and it was a princess that made a whining sound when she squeezed her. Jolie excitedly shouted that it was her first princess and asked if she could dress her up with ribbons. He told Jolie that she could do anything she wanted, then Jolie excitedly said that she would feed her at once to the pantry. Jolie jumped down to walk toward the pantry. He told his cousin, long time no see, and Genialisime replied that he was so proud that little Jolie gathered a horde already, and that her mother must be so happy. He proudly told his cousin that victory was in their blood, making Genialisime chuckle. He asked if he wanted to help him since he was there because there was a camp of dwarves near his lair, and they kept trying to steal from his horde. Also, Blight Swamp and he would crash the place after Jolie was done bragging. He asked his cousin why he was already preparing the after-day feast when the bragging day hadn't even begun. Genialisime replied that it was a good question, but a better question was if he would follow them. He asked his cousin if he went along, and Genialisime replied yes and told him that it started well until he ate one dwarf too many. Then he burned the village, making the villagers run for their lives. He asked his cousin if he became drunk by eating dwarves, and Genialisime replied that he ate three dwarves, and then he couldn't stop. He also became crazy violent and burned everything. When Blight Swamp and he tried to restrain him, he called Blight Swamp by the W word. He couldn't believe that he called her a wyvern. Then he apologized to Blight Swarm in the name of their elder worm. But his cousin just told him that he had a serious dwarf intolerance. Then he asked Genialisime if Jolie had a good bragging day. Fortunately, Genialisime replied that Jolie did because she bragged all night long, and he thinks she really liked the princess he caught for her too since she paraded her to everyone. He figured out that it had really happened, so the mystery he was thinking of was solved while Genialisime was lovingly looking at Blight Swamp. When he was about to leave, Genialisime told him that he thought he and Blight Swamp could be great together. He replied alright, but told Genialisime that if they moved into the lair together, he should make it a cave. Genialisime said he would do it. A moment later, the goblin panicky told him that he was back so soon. 
but he just told them that they were moving south because the food was getting scarcer there, and he would set up a glorious lair in the Albain Mountains, where no thief might threaten his coins. They replied that they would follow him anywhere, but they really had an escape plan for gold coins. Then he moved to the Albain Mountains to prepare for his long nap, unaware of his old minion's treachery. But he proudly knew that he was Vancure Nightsbane, the great calamity of the age. And to those who would challenge him, whether they were demons or fairies, he had only one thing to say, and it was to bring it on. Back to the current year in Chocolatine and Quasun House. Chocolatine happily says that it was a good day to bake a cake and she'll make one for her crush, one for her god, and one for her brother because she likes the feeling of blood on her paws. In their kitchen, the black rabbit was skinned on the table, and she was wearing the rabbit's feet while walking toward the table, noticing that she forgot to clean. She was wishing for her ingredients when she saw her brother and asked him if she can ask him a question to which he replied yes. Then she seriously asks him if he was sure Charlene and Victor are finally over, and Quasin replied yes and thanks the gods that they are because the way is finally clear, making her feel happy too. Then she happily gives her brother Charlene's cake. Quasin thanked her but asked her if she was sure there won't be side effects because the last cake bit him. She reminds him that she told him it was a birthday mimic and none of her desserts killed anyone yet. But Quasin noticed that he made two more and knows that one of them is an offering to Isengrim, then asks her what about the other one. She shyly replied that it was for her crush, making her brother ask her when is she going to tell him who it is. But she told him that she won't because he was going to eat him like the last time. But Quasin explained to her that from the taste, she was too good for him and begged her to tell him that it's not a were hyena this time. She replied no and explained that her crush was way cleaner, strong, charming, and handsome. Quasin walks away while telling her that he guesses he'll meet him once she has caught him and says goodbye to her, to which she says goodbye back. A moment later, one of the cupcakes moved on its own, sighed, and growled loudly, but she just hit it with the roller and creepily ordered it to shut up and just look tasty, making it shudder in fear while the system showed her that she gained a new level in Monster Patisir. A moment later, she arrived at Allison's temple and told her god, Isengrim the great white deer who roams the summer woods, bringer of spring, god of the hunt, and lord of the beasts that she offers him that humble gift and asks him for his blessing. Isengrim called her his favorite priestess and told her that her cakes taste delicious and she has done well painting the natural equilibrium in Murmurin, so she should keep it up. She thanked her lord and asked him if she can ask for his guidance. Isengrim replied of course and asked her if it was about that boy Victor whose name she keeps repeating in her prayers. She replied yes and told him that she wants to breed with him, but they are getting nowhere. Isengrim asked her if she has offered to lay with him during the mating season and she replied that she did, but Victor says he didn't want to ruin their friendship. Isengrim told her to try perfume and the sweeter she smells, the greater her chance of luring Victor into a trap and if anybody tries to steal her mate, she should eat them because all is forgiven in love's name. She happily thanked Isengrim and he told her good luck. Then Allison told her that they should go because they are almost late for the inauguration to which she replied that she was coming. Meanwhile, in the village, Malphi welcomes the citizens of Murmurin to the grand opening of the Nethermart, the first in Furcorp magic item shop, open to monsters and mortals alike making the people happily chatter. Malphi told them that there, they will buy top-of-the-line magical weapons, or if they would rather gamble their money away. Their casino floor has all the entertainment they need, and they can relax in their family-friendly VIP lounge after a shopping spree. The citizens were amazed to hear it, but Meal, the angel, was waiting for Kia to explain everything while Malphi told them that if they cannot pay with coins, they can keep a tab with them for their soul as collateral. Vancouver told Victor to do the thing, then Victor cut the huge ribbon while telling them that in their majesty's name, he declares the Nethermart open. After that, the citizens immediately ran toward the Nethermart and lined up fast to go inside first while Vancouver happily shouted that he gets 30% sales on weapons and an axe in every home. He thinks that it was wonderful because his minions equip themselves for war and he gets a cut, so he thinks it was the true essence of a dragon-minion relationship. But Furibin told them that if anybody dares to replace him with another scythe, he'll sue them. Chocolatine walks closer to Victor while telling him that she brought him a cake. Victor thanked her and told her that he'll eat it for lunch, but she happily told him to be sure to beat it into submission before eating it, to which he fearfully replied okay while the cake was moving inside the box. Tia told Malphi that it was true that they need to equip the population for war, but she asked Malphi if they have to let them sell their souls to hell in the process. Malphi replied that following a benchmarking study, their corporate overlords decided that the name Hell is no longer politically correct, and they have now rebranded as Happy Land because marketing expects mortals to assimilate the new branding within years, correlating with an increase in soul revenue. Meal told Malphi that a change of name cannot clean the heathen's lies and dirt, but Malphi, laughing, said sorry to Meal and told her that he could not hear her over the sound of Nethermart's soul stock going up. Chocolatine asked Victor if he was planning something that night. 
but before she could finish, Bankura told Victor that they should go back to his horde because they needed to break his princesses out of their prison. Kia bumped Victor's fist, telling him that she would go check the village's defenses in the meantime, and that King Gardamagni should arrive soon with more help. He said sorry to Chocolatine and explained that it was a call of duty, but Chocolatine told him that there was no problem at all and told him to have a nice day. Then Neil asked him if they could talk about their new karma insurance plan. Victor replied, sure, but told her to be quick, making Malphi shocked. Chocolatine asked Malphi who the bird was while Victor and Neil walked away. Malphi replied that it was a live target. Then Chocolatine asked Malphi if he had stuff that could help her get a guy's attention. Malphi replied, maybe, and asked her who was the intended victim. To which she replied, Victor. Malphi told her that the quickest solution would be to kill her rival for Victor's love. But she told him that Charlene was already out, which leaves half the world's people. Malphi turned her face and told her that he meant the paladin. She asked him if he meant Kia and what about her. Malphi asked her back if she didn't see the plan and why she thinks Kia moved into Victor's house. Then told her that Kia is a holy demon sent by the angels to tempt Victor away from Happiland and take their market share. Chocolatine seriously told Malphi that it would never happen. But Malphi told her no and explained that together they would start a total push aimed at nudging Victor towards a big change in view, but she told him that she didn't understand it. Then Malphi told her that before he became a manager, he was a punishment coach for the demon pickup scene, and they had Hero turning bad down to a system, and he would share that skill with her. Then he asked her what kind of relationship she was looking for but told her that they don't push marriage in Happiland. She replied that she wanted Victor to break into her temple, tie her up with ropes, and say it was time to test his monster rider perk as he grabbed her hair. But Malphi cut her words by asking her if she wanted Victor to tie her down but not tie her down. She excitedly replied that she would like some play, worry, and fun, and Malphi told her that in that case, he suggests starting the charm with signals of being saved and the goal is to make the target believe they can change her, that she could turn good with a special person's love, a, k, a, themselves. Malphi told her to do it by sending mixed messages about the chance of being saved to show herself as a PRT or potential saving target, and she should play hard to get so that Victor believes he has to work for it, and he will fall into the trap. She replied that she didn't know because it sounded very tricky, but Malphi just asked her if she wanted to date Victor or not and gave her the script to follow. He read the words in the book that she steals, but she fights worse bad guys, she was not bad, but she just doesn't follow the rules, and it's her parents' fault if she eats people knowing that it was not her at all, but she asked Malphi if it would work and Malphi replied that it worked all the time. Chocolatine asked him what happens if she doesn't pretend and what if she was nice for real. Malphi asked her if she meant a two-layer trap and told her that he would not suggest it because only an expert can do that, so she should just follow the guide and everything would be fine. A moment later, Allison told her that she couldn't believe she spent so much money on smells and self-help books, but she told Allison that it was okay because they could always use them to start a fire. Allison asked her if she had found something she liked, but she replied it was good advice, but it was not her, and even if it's hard sometimes, she would rather be herself. Allison poked her cheek while telling her that she was very right and she thought she could set her up with Victor at the VIP place for that night, to which she replied that it would be great while many dragons were flying in the sky. She told Allison to look at the sun, and Allison couldn't believe that they were finally there, then Chocolatine called out to everyone that the dragons were there. Meanwhile, in the horde, the cupcake that Chocolatine gave to Victor released its legs and shouted a growl, but it was shocked when Vancure looked at it and was ready to attack it. Then he used his lesser demonbane to attack it, making it slowly vanish into his fire. He happily told Victor that it worked and he finally cast his first exorcism spell. But Furibin told Victor that it was a shame that the cake attacked them because it looked tasty. Victor was looking at the icing of the cupcake on the ground while telling him that Brandon Mora's buff made him dangerous. But that spell should dispel them and target his demon slayer weakness. Then Victor cast his power toward the icing, telling him that his scythe lord perk should also make it possible to use his scythe as a magical staff. Then Victor used his death candle, and the icing became undead, making Furibin tell Victor that they'll make a passable necromancer out of him. He told Victor that his guests cannot eat ghosts, so he should learn to summon cows instead. But Victor replied that one spellcasting tear at a time. He told Victor that his guests would prefer singing princesses to stuffed ones and it irked him that even his spell purge can't break that crystal. Victor told him that Kia told him that Gardamagnus King would soon arrive with elite sorcerers to recover his niece, meet with the self-proclaimed Emperor of Murmurin, and grant him his reward. But he shouted at Victor that he wasn't self-proclaimed because he was Emperor now and forever. But the system showed him that his Emperor class perks would remain unavailable until he killed Brandon Mora. Suddenly, Red Ranger panically called him while pointing outside and Pink Ranger told him that half a dozen great-winged, smoke-breathing dragons had arrived. 
but he just peacefully told them that the early guests were there and ordered the rangers to prepare the appetizer. Red and Pink obeyed immediately and told him that they would offer their bodies if needed. But Victor panicked, knowing that they shouldn't be arriving until tomorrow. He told Victor that, unlike his kind, dragons are smart enough to come early when a feast is involved, making Victor ask him if he subtly implied humans were mentally challenged when they usually start with 10 int, more than most species. But he just laughed and opened his menu to see his original intelligence score before he gained levels. But the system showed that his intelligence was 8 points. Victor asked him why he was twitching, but he just angrily asked the menu what his correct score was. Victor told him that he wanted to see it, but he was stunned to see the menu still showed 8 but had a grand background. He furiously told it that there was no way it was his score and asked what his true score was again. Then the system showed him that his score is the square root of 64, making him think it was finally a higher number and told Victor to look at his two-digit genius. But Victor tried hard not to laugh while wondering if Vancure even knew what square roots are. Then they went outside of the horde, and he told Victor that he shall not speak unless addressed by a dragon first, and he will repeat that he was good, smart, and wealthy every time he was mentioned. Victor replied sure and asked him if he could please avoid mentioning classes and the system. But he just asked Victor why wouldn't he brag about rediscovering the dragon made system. And Victor replied that it was because other dragons gaining classes would be bad for their business and everyone else. But he told Victor that being the strongest of his kind means nothing if the rest of his kind are too weak to compare, and asked Victor if anyone boasted about being the best manling. But then he replied no to himself and explained that it was because nobody wants to be the best manling. He also told Victor that everyone wants to be the best dragon because dragons are awesome, and besides, without the system, he wouldn't have been able to cure the vile Furibun's lead poisoning curse, making Furibun ask him if he would never live that down, making Victor laugh. A moment later, they saw a lot of dragons coming their way, and Victor told him that he knew that day would come. But he told Victor that, of course, he knew because he told him. Jolie happily told him, happy bragging day, and he told Jolie that he had grown so big. Then he told Genie Alessheim that it was good to see him too, and Genialisim asked him how he could miss his dear cousin's bragging day. Then Genialisim introduced him to their children as his first cousin, and Genialisim introduced to him his children named Kurajou, Sage, and Fort. The children said money, how much, and gold, making him tell Genialisim that the children already speak their first words and that they have his eyes. Then he asked who is the last of them, then he saw Icefang and asked if he is still unable to breed. But Icefang just asked him back why he is still poor and told him that it's great King Icefang now. He asked Icefang back how he was poor when Icefang's hoard is made of silver. But Icefang told him that wealth knows no limits, and he should pray to the Elder Worm that his hoard is worth bragging about because he will count every coin. And he proudly told Icefang that he will count till the end of time. Then Icefang told him that his messengers told them of the Gold Slayer Furibun and his insane scheme to turn the world's wealth to lead, then asked him where Furibun is. He proudly replied that he defeated Furibun, and his chief of staff Victor sealed Furibun's twisted soul. Then he ordered Victor to show it to them. Victor bent down and showed his side where Furibun's soul was living. Genialisim told Victor that he did Dragonkind a great service by keeping that depraved monster sealed, to which he hesitantly thanked Genialisim. But Furibun told him that he hated them all so much. Jolie asked him if his chief of staff could speak Dragon too and told him that it was brag worthy. He proudly replied that when he found Victor, he was a homeless vagrant. But he taught him well, and Victor told Jolie that it was because his majesty is good, smart, and wealthy, but not necessarily in that order. Icefang told them that it was nothing to brag about because the dragon language is so pure and simple that even lesser species can learn it. Genialisim asked Icefang if he was implying that the noble dragon's speech is on the same level as the manling's primitive language. But then he told them to look at his beautiful castle that he claimed from the lick and pointed to the lava and towers. Jolie told him that it's beautiful and it was brag worthy. But Icefang asked him if it could fly. Still, he bragged to them that he has hundreds of minions, and for those he does not eat, he raises as undead. Jolie asked him if he still eats minion meat, and Victor asked him if minion lives matter. He replied that his niece Jolie is cattletarian, so she only eats non-speaking animals and elves. Jolie told them that manlings and other sentient beings have souls like them, so eating them and abducting their princesses is morally wrong. Then Victor told Jolie that he applauded her stand on not eating his kind and asked why not extend that mercy to elves. But Jolie told Victor that elves are not people because they are elves, and they eat grass like cows and make the best princesses. Hearing it, Vancure asked Jolie if she had released the one he caught for her first bragging day back into the wild, and Jolie proudly replied that she did. Icefang told Jolie that she did well because princesses are endangered in the north due to wanton dragon overhunting. 
Genie Alessheim told Icefing that Blightswamp has been trying to find a way to preserve them by raising them in captivity. But Icefing told Genie Alessheim that princesses only happen in the wild, then asked where the sport is in raising princesses at home, and the hunt is half the fun. He realized that he was losing the spotlight and told them that tomorrow shall be his true bragging day. But since they arrived early, he shall reward them with a sneak peek of his magnificent horde. Genie Alessheim and Icefing looked at him in shock and, laughing, followed him inside the horde while Icefing teasingly told him that it should be fun, and he is sure he can't even bathe in it. But then Victor noticed something in the sky and saw a lot of birds flying in the group. Meanwhile, somewhere, Kia looked at the sky and saw a lot of birds, so he flew toward them to check them while wondering if Brandon Mora died of his wounds or if the dragons scared him away. And she knows that Kevin's reinforcement will arrive first at that rate, but suddenly, her eagle named Twilight stopped flying forward, making him ask if it saw enemies coming. But then she saw it and called the twelve gods in worry because she saw Mora in the plane. Telling his men that they know the usual policy when it comes to villages, they should enslave, pillage, and burn it. Odeus was in the flying horse to catch up with the plane, together with the flying demons, while Mora told them that this time, they'll skip straight to burning it. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the horde, Vankura proudly told them to witness his shining wealth while pointing to his horde. Genie Alisheim told him that it was so warm and golden. Then Jolie told him that it was incredible and it was the biggest horde she had ever seen. But then they noticed something on the side, and Jolie frustratingly asked him if there were two elf princesses and a human. She then told him that trapping human princesses isn't ethical. Icefang told him that they were stuffed and they couldn't sing or dance, so it was not dragon-like. But he just asked Icefang if he could feel the overwhelming weight of his wealth and the perfect mix of jewels, gold, and princesses. Icefang asked him how did he accumulate that much gold when his horde couldn't fill a cave a century ago. He replied that he discovered an ancient secret, a system designed to make dragons even richer. Victor begged the gods to forgive him because he tried to stop Vancouver and continuously apologized to them. Then Vancouver told them that it was a great sorcery that allows him to summon treasure by poking humans to death and giving a payment every month. But Icefing told him that it was nonsense and asked him if he was going to say that the moon is not a planet and death is not a birth defect next. The seal of the door moved while he was telling Icefang that the humans worship the ground he walks on when he does not fly and as the world's greatest adventurer pays him to kill their kind, without them hearing that the door seal broke. Icefang seriously asked him if that plate made him rich while pointing to his V and V necklace, but then he apologized to them for interrupting them. Suddenly, a loud noise appeared, and the gold coins formed into goblins to protect themselves, making Vancouver ask if the sound was the vault's alarm. Then he told them that a thief was after his hoard. Jolie pointed to somewhere and told them that perhaps it was the cause. Victor was shocked to see that the seal breaks, but he wondered how in Chocolatine, and the others had reinforced it. Then someone slowly came out of the door and told Vancouver that his illegal occupation of King Mora's property ends there. Then it showed itself with two large demons while introducing themselves as Mora Hell Corporated, and they shall take back their market share. But then it fearfully stopped when it saw dragons looking at it. Genie Alisheim happily asked if it was a buffet, and Icefing told him that he thought he would be stingy with the food, but he was pleasantly surprised. Then Jolie asked if it was a talking cow and told them that it was grey enough for his cattle-eating ways, so he called dibs on it, making it let go of its weapon on the ground in fear. A moment later, it came back out of hell while panicky shouting. Isabel asked what was happening and why weren't they advancing, but it just crying told them to retreat because it's a trap. But then Jolie ate it before it could say anything else, making Isabel stunned in shock. Icefang told the others to look because there were more behind the door, and Genie Alisheim told them that it was safari time. Then the dragons happily looked at the demons, and Isabel then proceeded to eat them happily. He laughed, praised Victor for his good thinking, and told Victor that it was an excellent idea to bring demon appetizers. Furibon couldn't believe it because he worked decades to weaken the seal. But it ended like that. And Victor fearfully told them that he knew the demons invaded first. But it was a slaughter, so he felt bad for the demons now. Then Victor told him that it was not his doing because the Hellgate seal was sabotaged from their side, which means Mora has agents in Murmurin, and it may be the opening move of a full invasion without them knowing that the demons, Mora, and Odeus were near to their castle. On the other hand, Lucy told Odeus that everything is going well so far, and she sabotaged the Hellgate as she was asked, so their allies should be storming the castle already. Odeus praised her and told her that she may now leave that town because it would do them no good if the prince soldiers mistook her for a local. She told Odeus that she would take her leave and watch from the sideline. On the other hand, the demons arrived near the guild desk. Charlene asked what it was and if it was another dragon, but suddenly, it threw a grenade toward them, and it exploded. 
Then the demons kept throwing grenades everywhere to destroy the village. Red shouted to his comrade to defend the city, which they did right away, and attacked the enemy back. Luckily, Charlene was fine and didn't get hit by the explosion. Vancure heard the explosion outside and furiously asked what the racket was, and Victor told him that it was Mora's army. He angrily told Mora that he would not ruin his big day, then he jumped and flew quickly into the sky, making Victor thrown by the force he left. He met the rackets in the sky, so they exploded there instead of at his castle. Then he used his fire to make the demons go away. He was waiting for the enemy to arrive, but he was shocked to see many rackets aiming at his castle. He quickly flew toward the rackets to burn and smash them down. But Victor was stunned and shocked to see that they were falling down to the castle. Luckily, a barrier protected them. Jules told Victor that he managed to restart the magical shield, so the castle should be safe. But Furibin said that it was just for now because the worm got past it once, and Mora could do the same. Victor asked how many enemies they were facing. Then Kier arrived and told him that Mora brought the entire Ishfanian army, so at least 50,000 troops. Victor couldn't believe that Mora used all his army to destroy a village with fewer than 500 people. But Vancouver told them that the moth was trying to steal his hard-won empire and ruin his bragging day. Kia also told them that Mora brought the Iron Eagle and she tried to rush as fast as she could to warn them, but the scouts had already reached Murmurin. Jules told them that they have to stop them at the village, and if they climb the volcano, their mages will disable the barrier, making Vancouver sweat with worry. A moment later, they arrived at the village and waited for the Iron Eagle and the other enemies. He asked Victor if he would gain a crest once he killed that moth, but Victor replied that if not, he didn't know what it would take. So he told Victor that he would deal with Mora and his silly metal bird personally and ordered Victor to lead the minion charge because he would defeat the moth's soldiers before his guests arrive, defend his village, and protect his horde with his life. To which Victor replied that he would try, but he told Victor that he would not try because he would succeed and asked Victor if he remembered that he entered his service when he tried to steal from his horde. Victor replied that he would never forget, so he told Victor that he must understand how much he trusted his horde's safety to him, and he knew he would succeed because he was his prized chief of staff, the best minion he ever had, and that it was his big day, so he could not fail. Victor confidently agreed with him and told him that he would win it, then he told Victor that so would he and ordered Kia to follow his chief of staff while he cleared the skies. Kia was shocked to hear it and asked him if he was going after Mora alone because it was suicide but he just left while telling her that it was for those who dared to stand in his way. He told Victor to go forth because it was their moment in the spotlight, and none would take it away from them. Then he shouted to the enemy to come and face their doom, then called Mora a moth and ordered him to show himself. Mora appeared and told him that he had slighted him long enough, but that day he would die. But he just launched forward to fight Mora while reminding him that he was the great calamity of that age, and that day, he would show it again. Then he burned the flying demons first and told them to get out of his way. Mora activated his Fina Mule at a power, then the system showed him that his plan was successful so that the enemy's perk could not affect him. But he just told Mora not to use more tricks and used his huge fireball to attack Mora. But Mora avoided it while telling peons to bring him down. The demons used their Winter's Grasp, Ice Storm, and Thunderbolt power to attack them together. The powers attacked him and made a loud explosion, but he just came out of the thick smoke and used his Victory Fist skill to attack back the three demons that attacked him. The demons rolled into the air and were about to fall down, then Mora ordered his people to shoot him down. Then the Iron Eagle let out a lot of rockets to attack him but he simply avoided them all and told Mora that he would bring down that metal bird of his, and he would fry it for dinner. On the other hand, a lot of demons and an army of Moras arrived at the village. Then the demons growled happily while looking at the destroyed village. Then one of the demons noticed something moving on the side, so it opened it and saw Charlene hiding from it. The demon called her a little piggy, making her shake in fear, then it ordered her to squeal and was about to hit her when a huge wolf appeared behind it and slashed the demon into three pieces. The wolf asked her if she was alright, but she just asked the wolf if she was Kwasan. He apologized to her for his look but told her that they needed to get out of there. She told Kwasan that the whole place was surrounded, but thankfully everyone was armed. Tink Ranger used her instrument to make a sound to boost their power while Junior Vancure, and the rangers were busy fighting with the huge demon. On the other side, Malphi and the other demon's businessmen used their power to attack the flying demons and killed them using sharp ice. Pink told them that the big day had come, making them more energetic. Rolo hit one of the demons from behind, making it dizzy and confused. But suddenly, it changed to the sheep, making Chocolatine excitedly ask Rolo if farmers could do that, and Rolo replied yes, at level 51. Then Rolo looked at the other demons, making them shake in fear, and he told them that they would all become his sheep. Victor laughingly told Rolo that it was sheep, not sheeps, then he slashed the demons' heads while riding his huge dog with other people. Then he apologized to them because he was late, but Chocolatine was happy to see him. 
Furibon saw the three demons' souls and asked if it was his roommate because he finally had someone to talk to. But he told Furibon with a pout that he was always there to talk to, but Furibon explained that he meant someone worth talking to without him noticing the demon above him. When it was close, one of the rangers told him that there was a demon behind him. Luckily, Saverus stabbed the demon in time and pinned it down on the ground. He asked Saverus why he hadn't run away, and Saverus replied that he couldn't because they were coming from all directions. Suddenly, Allison told them that they were running away. Kia explained that they had pushed back the scouts, but more would come. Victor asked the rangers what the situation was, and Red replied that most of them were alive, but there were too many of them. Allison worriedly told them that they had to leave, Kia told her that it was too late for it because they had cut off the northern road, and they were surrounded. Allison told Kia that they should try to break the ring by focusing their strength, but Allison told her that if they escape, they'll catch up to them in no time with their horsemen, so they should try to hold out until the help from Gardamagni gets here. But then Victor says the early guests, then he told everyone that he knows what to do and that they can't hope to get away, but they can hold out until Vancure wins. One of them asks if the king has gone to battle, and he said that Vancure has to lead them to win, and Vancure, their king, is fighting for the big pile of gold as they talk, which is his gold, but also them. Then he asks them if they will run away, tails between their legs from people so scared of them that they need to bring a hundred times their numbers to face them, and told them that he says no because they should remember how they won the war of the pile of horde, and they beat them once, and they will do it again for they are V and V, for they are the pile of horde making the people cheer, and feel strong because of his talk and the system showed him that the help for little ones is turned on, so all little ones strength goes up by one step plus five. Then he told Jules to bring back all the dead bodies as undead, Allison to call up flowers as a wall, and Malfi and Meal to shoot down any flying things to which they all said yes and did. Then he tells Chocolatine and the magic users to make everyone strong and heal them, and Quasan to make the elves pay for every bit of land to which they both said yes. Then he tells the rangers to come to him and told them that he feels they are ready to get better jobs. Then he turned pink and black rangers into dracobolds, then turned blue and yellow rangers into coblets. Then the rangers told him that they'll lead the fight and they will keep everyone safe because they are big and sorted by color. Kia told him that they need to face Odeus because she is a farmer, so they can't look past her. Then he told Rolo, Junior Vancouver, and Saverus to come with them because it was time they pulled that fairy wing. But then, the system told him that for showing his bravery leading a bunch of little ones in his dragon master's name, his monster helper job has been made into Monster Knight Red Dragon, and his help for little ones and small promotion job gifts have been made better, so he will be more like his dragon self. He thinks it was nice, but all at once, wings and tail showed up on his back making him shocked. He looked back to see it while Furibin was trying not to laugh, but then Furibin can't stop and laughs loud. He told Furibin to be quiet in an angry way. But Saverus, laughing, asked him if he was okay and Kia asked him if she can touch his tail while laughing too, to which he said no in a mad way. But then, Odeus asked him if he will make an exception for her because once she has killed all his friends, his new scales will make good gloves, then a lot of demons and an army showed up in front of them with Odeus. On the other hand, the Iron Eagle launched a lot of fireballs toward Vancouver, but he just simply avoided them and flew closer to the Iron Eagle. Then he powerfully attacked it using his dragon fire, but suddenly, Mora swung his sword near his neck while asking him why he was so eager to die when he could barely hold his own the last time they battled. But fortunately, he avoided it and told Mora that he was a funny moth because he remembered pounding him into his arena's pavement. The Iron Eagle pointed a lot of sharp arrows toward him and released them while he was telling Mora that he knew now that while he might die, then he dodged the arrows and grabbed one of them when it was near to hit him. Then he snapped it into two while telling Mora that a true dragon doesn't fear death. But Mora told him that he shall fear it, then Mora slashed his shoulder using a sword. Then the system showed him that the Dragon Slayer effect bypassed his defense, but he just used his lesser Demonbane skill to attack Mora while telling Mora that they should see if he can keep up without his enhancements, making Mora shout in pain that it burns. The system showed him that his charisma check was successful, so his exorcism stripped Brandon Mora of his buff, making him proudly tell Mora, who was falling, that his charm is greater than his. But Mora told him that he remembers how he denied him the joy of single combat last time. Then Mora summoned Toro Fiend, and a huge demon came out of the portal. Toro immediately launched to attack him, and he flew toward it to attack too, which made a loud and powerful explosion. He and Toro were fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe when Mora used his Picador skill to make him a little weak, so he got hit by Toro while the system showed him that his chances of avoiding attacks had greatly decreased, and he felt sluggish as if he had eaten one dwarf too many. Toro was shocked to see a large fire coming toward him, and he proudly burned it while shouting to Mora to come and fight his own battles. Suddenly, the Iron Eagle released a hook and tried to grab him. 
but fortunately, he avoided them and caught the one who was near to him. Then he pulled it forcefully, making it destroyed, and throwing the devil controlling it while Mora shouted that it was impossible because that shielding could withstand cannonballs. But he told him that impossible is not for dragons and told him to stop running and be squashed, then threw the huge controller toward him. Mora panicky ordered his devil to launch the missiles to blow Vancure up. The controller marked his target, then let go a missile toward him but he just told Mora that he would burn his toys before they could attack him. But all of a sudden, Toro locked his hands while shouting Brandon forever. He angrily told it to get off him, but it didn't, and Mora used his Mando Bull skill, so his strength and agility were cut by one stage each, negative five, making him see that he couldn't aim with that cow on his back. However, he turned to look at it, knowing he could use Toro as a shield. Toro happily told Mora that he'd be his fan forever, then a big blast hit him with Vancure. Mora happily yelled that Vancure was at last dead and playfully told him to say hello to the ground for him while he was falling to the ground. The system showed him that he had fallen below 20% HP, so he was in critical health. But then he saw something flying in the sky, making him wonder what it was and if it was. On the other hand, in the village, Saverus, Jr., and Rolo were fighting with the demons while Victor noticed it was not going well and they needed to do more if they were going to live through it. Kia was fighting alone with Odeus and he knew that they needed to buy more time. Then he cut the demon's head that was close to him, but then he saw that with all of those new dead bodies, he should at last have enough to fuel a dark magic spell. Then he used his death candle skill to attack Odeus, but she just simply used her crimson lightning and burned the undead candles and hit Victor's direction. Victor noticed that the black beast he spent months on was dead and told his current world that it was cruel. Furibin asked him if his luck finally ran out but he smilingly replied that it was not quite, while the system showed him that he had taken massive damage, so he was in critical health. But he still told Furibin that he felt pretty lucky that day while the dragons were flying above the enemies. One of the dragons told the other that Vancura's servant steered an elf herd for the feast, and the other replied that they saw tasty birds too. Then the dragons right away ate and attacked the elf demon's enemy. Odeus told him that her plans for Gardamagni were ruined because he and Vancura messed up everything. He asked her if it was her all along and told her that she was behind everything like the pineapple, the scorchers, and Mora. He also told her that if he struck her down there, it was all over. But she just calmly told him that he taught Vancouver about the system and now other dragons would learn it, so their quest to retake out Ramon would be harder than ever. But he wouldn't live to see it, then she attacked him with darkest fear, making him shocked. Then the system showed him that his HP and SP were cut to one, and he got terror and fear sickness. Kia right away jumped toward him and Saverus worriedly told him to run. Odeus asked him if he had any last words, but he just asked her if they couldn't talk it out, but she replied that they just did. Then she attacked him with her death spike which went into his chest. When she was done with him, she used her teleport to run away, leaving Victor on his knees on the ground with Furibin stunned with a shocked face. On the other hand, Mora's people asked him in a panic what they should do because the dragons were too many, but he just said that it was a nightmare, a nightmare that he would wake up from. Then Mora, who was looking at the swarm of dragons, used his Bravo Bull skill, so he got back his full strength. Then Mora proudly told his demons to crash the Iron Eagle into the volcano and destroy the dragon's castle and his horde with it, without seeing Vancouver flying behind him. But his demons told him that with all the explosives on board, the volcano would burst on impact and the whole area would be wiped out with their troops. But Mora told his demons that he didn't care because he just wanted those pests and dragons dead. But all of a sudden, the system warned him that Berserk Sickness was put on him, then Vancouver hit him hard, making him see that Vancouver came around him from behind. Mora was pushed inside the Iron Eagle, making Mora feel hurt, but he was still concerned about his face. Vancouver used his five-finger poking style to attack Mora, then he launched his victory fist skills while shouting for Mora to die. Then he punched Mora, breaking the Iron Eagle in the process. Mora crashed on the ground hard because of it, but Mora still managed to stand up while the Iron Eagle was crashing down. He told Mora that he was not so tough without minions to hide behind but Mora told him that he needs nobody to fight his battles. Then Mora dashed closer to him to attack, but he just lifted his feet while telling Mora that he would show him his rightful place and it was under his heel. Then he stomped Mora using his feet, but Mora still told him that it was not over and he still has resources, and friends in low places. Then Mora shoutingly told him that they would come back, but he just used his witch burning fire to burn Mora to death. Then he told Mora that he shouldn't have threatened his minions, then he roared loudly in victory and that he was the best dragon. The system showed him that he had regained his emperor title with style, and his perks had been restored, but he was shocked to see something and wondered what it was. The system explained that for defeating the demon king Brandon Mora, he gained a crest to which he happily shouted that he deserved it. 
then he used the crest, so he can now progress up to level 60 and gain the crested personal perk which means he moved up from ordinary adventurer to folktale hero, and he can now access more prestigious classes. Then he happily called Victor to come there because he has been crested and wanted Victor to look upon his glory. But Victor didn't come, making him call him over and over again and wondering why he isn't showing up. Then he flew toward the village, sure that Victor was fine because he ordered him to win that battle and Victor would never disappoint him. A moment later, he arrived in the village and noticed that his guests are content and the moth's army has been crushed, so he thinks all is good in the world. Then he noticed where Victor was and he supposed they might be celebrating. But then he saw Red Ranger crying, Kia shaking in pain, and Victor who was dead on the ground surrounded by his friends. The Green Dragon told him that his dark elves taste delicious and so soft. But he just angrily looked at Victor while Red asked him how Brandon Mora is. He replied that Mora is dead like his chief of staff and asked who dares to do it. Savarus replied that it was the Farmer Witch and that she killed Victor and teleported before they could catch up. Kia shakingly told him that it was all her fault and she would have seen it coming back in the day, but she had gotten rusty. But he just told her to raise Victor, but she shoutingly replied that she can't cure death, and they don't have any healer powerful enough to revive Victor. He told Jules that he can raise Victor like the kobolds and Jules replied that he would like to, but he cannot because Victor's killer applied necrophobia status to Victor before murdering him. He asked what is necrophobia and Malphi explained to him that necrophobia ailment prevents revival of any kind and even Hapalin can't undo it, and though his angelic competition is petitioning heaven, she can't do any better. Then he told them that he'll lift it himself and use spell purge on Victor, but the system showed that he failed because he could not dispel the necrophobia status. He was angry and told them that it was like the crystal in his vault. Rolo told him to give it up and even he wouldn't have the power to break that kind of curse. Furibon worriedly looked at them and he told them that he refused to accept it because there has to be another way, making the green dragon ask him why all that fuss for a mangling minion when he can get another. But he furiously growled at the green dragon, making it stunned in fear and confused. Then he told the green dragon that Victor is worth more than any minion to him because he was the crown jewel of his horde and his bragging day cannot be complete without him. Charlene told him that she thinks she knows a way to revive Victor because there is someone with the power to do so for a price. Quasin asked him if she can't be considering calling upon her for help, but she just kept silent. Jules agreed while telling them that they can call her, but the sacrifice required will be astronomical. He closed his eyes, looked at his horde behind him, and ordered Charlene to tell him the details, and she just told him that she will do anything to save her manling. Meanwhile, in the limbo between life and death, Mule continuously apologized to him because she can only imagine how hard it must be to hear, but he just asked her what she means and if he can't go to heaven. Then he reminds Meal that she said he would go to heaven if he died in the line of duty against Mora's forces, but now she says he can't. She replied that sadly, he was hit by a necrophobia effect that gave him permadead status, and only the super expensive Heaven Plus plan covers that rare case, and he only took the standard karma insurance plan. He thinks the insurance is okay, and they are quick to take his money, but when they have to pay, nobody's there, making him ask her what about the lower place. But Meal told him that he can't go to hell, but he said that it was happy land, and he was sure Malphi would give him a comfy retirement. Also, he has to go somewhere instead of just sitting there. Then he used his infinite void, but the void word just echoed in the place, and he still pointed down in anger. Neil told him that even if she supported it, the demons can't help him, and they would have taken his soul and turned it into demons, just as they would have turned it into an angelic spirit. But necrophobia stops it. He asks her with no hope if he has no other choice, and she replied that at that point, only divine help can save his soul, but happily, he was claimed by two gods, and they were the Moon Man and Dice, so they could also talk to the undeath goddess Camilla since he helped her undeath real revolution. But he told her that he would rather not deal with Dice, and Camilla is shady, so he asks her if they can call the Moon Man fast, to which Meal happily said yes. Suddenly, a strong wind came, but she told him that it was a direct answer, then the huge octopus man came. But Meal said hi to him and called him Mr. Moon Man. Moon Man asks if it was the meeting and if he was late, then she said who she was, a junior angel insurance helper, and told him that she called him for her client Victor Dalton the prophet of his murmuring cult, but Moon Man was confused and asked if he has a religion. Victor said yes and explained that his spawn Thul Gathar claimed him for him and asked Moon Man if he hears prayers. Moon Man said that he hears voices, but not prayers, but then Moon Man remembered something and told him that cats and dogs rule their earth, but they think they are foes, but really, they have a secret pact and the pets in the president's homes, they are the real bosses, and Kennedy's dog Charlie told them to kill him when he wanted to tell the truth. 
He was puzzled and asked Moon Man what did he say about dogs and cats, and Moon Man said that he should eat them after cuddling with them. Meal whispered to him that Moon Man was the god of madness and he was not all there if he knew what she meant. But out of nowhere, he heard something fall to the desk and when he looked at it, he saw the dice rolling close to him and telling him to roll it. He thinks he has a bad feeling of deja vu making it shy and shouting at him to roll it for his afterlife. He was upset that he can pick between a forgetful plot maker and luck itself making him wonder why the world is so against him, with no other choice. He then threw the dice to roll. The dice told him that he got 19 because of his great roll and he will be born again on earth as a panda making him worry and ask how is it great. Then the dice told him that he will be a star and the world will talk about his love life. He was mad and said bad words while Meal said she was sorry to him and told him that she'll try to call other gods and maybe one of them could save his poor soul. But then Shesha came and told Meal that it won't be needed. Then she said who she was, Shesha, the goddess of trade, snakes, old places, and talked to Victor and told him that it was his lucky day because he had earned a miracle. Then she told him that some people gave her a big church gift to bring him back in an outramon making him shocked and asking what about the necrophobia thing. She said that while his killer is strong, she was a goddess, and if she paid enough, little is impossible for her. Neil told him that it was amazing and nobody has been able to pay for coming back to life since the New Testament. But he just asked Neil and Worry if it was real and she said yes with sureness and told him that he will come back to life with no bad things. Shesha told him that she has to do what she said in the deal so she won't be paid unless he says yes to come back. And if he does, she will give a free good thing to make the deal better making him think that Shesha looks as wanting as Vancouver. Shesha also told him that she was very interested in the tax haven his dragon master is building in Murmurant, and they can discuss her church's investments in his economy after he returns to living. To which he replied, sure. She picked him up while telling him that he chose an excellent choice. Then he closed his eyes and was waiting to return to the Outramond. The system congratulated him for gaining the claim by Shesha personal perk, which means when he levels up, he has an additional 10% chance to gain a charisma, or intelligence point. And merchants, bankers, and entrepreneurs always see him as a trustworthy partner and will give him a 20% discount. Moonman told him that as dragons dance, so do Earth and Outramond, and one day the arrows will fall and brighten the world, so the golden path is paved with fairy blood. Sesha and Victor looked at the Moonman confused. Victor asked the Moon Man what he meant by it, and the Moon Man explained that he said he should return home and do his prophecy work. Then the gods looked at him slowly flying up while Mule shouted at him to have a good journey home but Dice shoutingly ordered somebody to roll him because he couldn't take it anymore. A moment later, his soul came back to his body, and he saw his friend happily waiting for him. Red, cryingly, told him that he was back and was alive again with Chocolatine, but he just asked them if they pooled their money to fund his revival, to which Allison replied, they did, even Saverus. Saverus told him that they call them thieves when Shesh's rates are insane, but Kia told him that their funds were nowhere near enough to satisfy the goddess's greed. Jules also told him that Shesha demanded a price too high, making him ask them who paid for the difference, but he was stunned to realize it. Icefang asked Vancouver how could a dragon do it and why would he, but Vancouver just hopelessly thought about his sweet horde. Victor asked them if they could leave them alone for a moment, to which they replied, sure. Jolie asked Genialisime if his uncle Vancouver would be okay, but Genialisime replied that he didn't know. Icefang sadly looked at Vancouver and turned away, disappointed. Victor asked him why did he do it when it was his bragging day, and he replied that he was the crown jewel of his horde, and that if it hadn't been for him, he would never have gathered it in the first place, so he was worth more, and with him gone, he didn't know if there was anything to brag about, making him stunned and shy. At that moment, he realized that Vancouver cared more than he ever could have realized. Then he told Vancouver that he was a lot more than a master to him because he had become a friend. Vancouver asked him what is a friend, and if it is some kind of minion, and he explained that it means he will stick with him no matter what, and even if he is released from service, he won't ever leave his side. Vancouver smiled upon hearing it and told him that he better do it because he forbade him from living until he had reimbursed his life debt to him, and he would work for at least 12,584 years, but he just simply told Vancouver that he took out a student loan in his last life, so it was nothing unusual. Vancouver told him that they would become gods and ordered that greedy snake goddess to reimburse him in full for her overpriced service, to which he happily replied, sure. Then Vancouver called his name and told him that he hereby promoted him to his first and only friend, so he better prove himself worthy of that honor. He grabbed Vancouver's hand while replying that he will, and thanked Vancouver, to which Vancouver replied that he was welcome. On the other hand, Chocolatine, Jules, and Pink Ranger were peeking on the side in shyness, but Furibin told them that he wanted to puke, and watching it gave him diabetes. A moment later, in the mountain, a group of people were heading toward them. Kevin told the king that it was over there, then Kia appeared above them and immediately jumped down. Then she gracefully welcomed the king to Murmurin. 
The king told her that it was good to see her, then she sweetly said hi to Kevin. But Kevin cleared that his name is Nostradamus and asked her how many times he had told her not to use her earth name in public. But the king told them that it was not the time for pleasantry because he had heard that Mora had sent an army to that location, and they needed to protect civilians, but Kia didn't know what to answer to her King Roland. A moment later, in the village, Chocolatine was happily chopping meats and grilling them for the barbecue while the dragons were happily chatting with each other. They arrived in the town and were stunned to see a lot of dragons while Kia told them that they missed the big battle. Vankura told his guests to enjoy the feast because tonight he shall all feed at his expense, then he ate it while sitting on his throne. Ice Fang asked Kwasan if it was the best he had because the demon appetizers were better, but Kwasan replied that he didn't make the food while Jules happily told Allison that it was so good. The little dragons asked Chocolatine if they were food while looking at the monster cupcakes and Chocolatine replied yes, but told them that they had to beat it into submission first. Then the little dragons proceeded to catch the cupcakes while Chocolatine told them by saying roast the cream so that way they'll get a cream brulee. Blightswamp told Genie Alessime that their children were learning to hunt in a friendly environment. Vankura noticed that the feast was a success so far, but he wondered what he would brag about, then he looked at the princess trapped in the ice while thinking that at least he still had the princess. On the other hand, on the side, the equipment and gold coins were gathered. Savarus told Victor that it was all they could loot from the dead and what treasures they had left. Victor put his scythe on the horde to make Furibin think that treated as a trophy his own life had truly hit rock bottom. He ordered them to add the redeemed gold-eating insect to the pile, so he could still brag about teaching her the dragon way of life, but Rolo told him that he had won all the cattle shows he participated in and he wouldn't stop today. Then he told Savarus that he may go. Savarus asked Victor if he was up for a drink later and told him that Malphi was organizing a beer contest and poker game to which Victor replied later. He told Victor that he vowed in his head, one day he shall cook that cursed fairy and eat her for dinner. But Victor asked him why he was swearing in his head when he had already died twice, but he told Victor that since he wouldn't die ever again, his prophecy shall come to pass. Victor told him that it was his bragging day so he wouldn't contest the logic, but he proudly told Victor that it was why it's called logic and he was so happy that he had been vancurized. Victor asked him what vancurized is and if it is even a verb and he replied that it was an he vancurized that village. They vancurized the world and it goes with everything, as his name should. But Victor just told him that the Gardamagni cavalry arrived, but thinks that if only it had arrived before the battle it would have been much better. Kevin shockingly told them that there were so many dragons and Mora didn't stand a chance while Charlene introduced him to the king of Gardamagni, Roland. King Roland greeted him as the Emperor Vancure and told him that his name preceded him and he did not disappoint. He proudly replied that the great dragon emperor of Murmurin and the Albane Mountains stood before him. Then King Ronald told him that now he was also king of Ishfania as he assured and he had done his country a great service by defeating the demon King Mora. Also, he had rescued his niece too, so he shall recall the bounty on his head at once, so no adventurer would come seeking his head. But he was disappointed to hear it because they were free experience points and treasures. But King Ronald told him that he shall have no quarrel with him so long as he returned his niece, Merve, to him. He told King Ronald that he would release his princess back into the wild that night, but he should promise a boon in return. King Ronald asked him what his desire was, and he shoutingly replied that he wanted a tax exemption because he wanted all of his quests to be robbery exempted forever, like no fee, no taxes, and no nothing. King Ronald asked him if that was all he wanted and told him that he had a deal. Victor said that he should have known it, but Charlene asked King Ronald how she would support her local chapter of the guild without quest fees. Kevin told her not to worry because they would fund her office, and it was in their interest to maintain a good relationship with their neighbors. Then King Ronald told them that with Mora dead, Ishfania was ripe for the taking, and it might be a desert, but it had underground resources that would interest other countries to invade, so it would be chaos. But Vancura told them that he squashed the moth and saved the horde from him, so Mora's belongings were his now. King Ronald agreed and proposed to recognize him as Ishfania's new ruler, so long as their countries formed a friendship treaty, and the Albane Mountains would mark the frontier between their realms. He was surprised to hear it and told King Ronald that he, Vancure Knightsbane, first of his name, the great calamity of that age, defender of the Horde, Emperor of Murmurin, Ishfania, and the Albane Mountains, assented to his plea. Kia called her majesty, but Vancure and King Ronald both replied, Yes. Then Kia told King Ronald that she would like to be permanently transferred to the VNV Empire as an ambassador. Victor was shocked hearing it and asked her if she was sure when even with Mora gone, all they did was get into trouble. 
but Kia replied that it was exactly what she wanted, and the two of them were disaster magnets, and she loved it, and that she hadn't been in an interesting fight for two years. Victor asked Kevin if Kia always liked it, and Kevin replied sadly, yes. King Rommel told Kia that she was a hero to guard a Magni, and he would grant her his blessing if Emperor Vancure accepted her. Then Vancure called Victor to come closer to him for a moment and asked Victor if he had bread yet. Victor was shocked and asked him what that had to do with Kia, but he replied everything and told Kia that he graciously accepted her, so she and his chief of staff would engage in intense minion diplomacy, to which she thanked him and told him that she wouldn't let him down. King Ronald asked Kevin about his niece, and Kevin replied that he believed he could undo the spell because he had the necessary perks. Then Vancouver told Kevin that he should do so after the celebration. But until then, they should feast to their heart's content, making the night cheer for him. Victor asked him if he just tried to set him up with Kia, but he just told Victor that husbandry was a long-honored tradition, and he should breed with sweet chocolate too because he needed to replenish his minion stock. He looked at Happy Chocolatine, who was with the little dragons, and apologized to Vancouver because harems weren't tolerated there. He also told Vancouver that the king shortchanged them, and he dumped the responsibility of cleaning and holding a demon infestation on their lap but Vancouver reminded him that there were no more taxes. Then Vancouver told him to enjoy himself because he had earned it. He thanked Vancouver and told him to just call him if he needed him, and he would answer, to which Vancouver replied that as always. He got himself a glass of alcohol when Kia appeared and asked him if they could talk for a second. He asked Kia if it was about Vancouver blatantly trying to set them up together and told her that she had nothing to worry about, but Kia shyly told him that she just wanted to tell him that she was super impressed by his leadership today, and she was very kind to give her a room there. He asked her what she was trying to tell him, but she didn't answer, so their atmosphere was awkward, making him think that it was getting awkward, so he should say something funny. But then Kia snatched his glass of alcohol and asked him if he was up for a drink. On the other hand, Vancouver looked at the dragons and manlings chatting happily and thought that it was time. Then he roared loudly, so he got his guest's attention, knowing that it was time for him to brag. Then he told his dear guest that it's with great pride that he gathered them, so that they may look at the tasty things of his land, his big wealth, and his three princesses while showing the trapped princesses. But Icefang yelled that the princess isn't dancing, so it was 6 out of 10. But Genialisime told Icefang to be quiet, and Blightswamp says that three princesses in one place make their princess nest bigger. Still, Icefang pointed to Horde and told everyone to look at his small treasure and asked what that gold-eating bug was doing there. Hearing it, the other dragons were scared, thinking that they thought they killed them all and wanted to kill it with fire, but he told them it was an old gold-eating bug because he watched and taught it the dragon way of life. Then Rolo put two gold coins and nails on the ground near the bug, but it ate the nails instead of the gold coins. Genialisime said it was something to talk about, and Jules thought it was amazing. Then he told them that they should move on and that surely they had heard the talk that they got a great golden treasure and gave it away to bring back his top dragon-like helper, but Kia, Victor, and the rangers yelled over and over that he was the best dragon. He thanked them nicely, thinking that there he goes, nothing, then he sighed knowing that if he was unsure, he should be great. Then he told them proudly that those rumors are true and he, Vancure, has grown a treasure so big that he can afford to spend it, so he was so rich that he can buy things. This made the dragons look shocked, but he still told them in a teasing and proud way that he can buy everything with money. Icefang told him that it was wrong because a dragon doesn't spend his treasure, but he told Icefang that it was what a poor dragon would say, but for a rich dragon, a few billion coins are just small change. Then he proudly told Icefang to look around because that place and helpers are his real treasure. And he, Vancure, has built a land on the wise dragon ideas, a place where wanting more is the rule. Also, he killed the Devil Furibun in the first treasure war and the Moth King in the second, and he found the old dragon system and kept their way of life safe from lead lovers. But Icefang told him that it was silly because a system that gives him power and money wasn't true, and if it was easy for him to get it, why hasn't he? But he just told Icefang that it was because he was poor. Kevin was scared, knowing that the only thing needed to take the first level is knowing of the system and meeting the needs for bigger classes. Icefang told Vancouver that if that system is real, then let it show up before him right now. Then suddenly, a system shows up in front of him, making him wonder what it was. Then the system told him that through his strong hate and big dragon ego, he went up a level in the noble class, and he got the old money class thing, which means he had chances of monsters dropping treasure after death. Victor fell to the ground when he saw it and begged the gods not to make another dragon adventurer, but Icefang wondered what noble was when he was High King Icefang. 
but Genie Elisheim just asked if it meant that he can become a wizard if he wants hard enough, and Blightswamp asked if she can become a princess maker. Then a system kept showing up, making the knights look scared. One of the dragons yelled that it worked, and he was a wizard, and the other became what they want, and others want to get princesses, want to be rangers, and a cook so no cow will get away from them. This made the knights can't believe it. Icefang asked him if it was all true, to which he proudly said yes. Then Icefang called King Ronald and ordered him to hand him a plate because he was a dragon and now an adventurer. So it was a great honor for him that a dragon of his level was willing to do his kind's wants, but he would gladly do it for his gold and silver. But Vancouver laughed at Icefang because he wanted silver. Genie Elisheim wondered if the little men can pay him for the chance of him not attacking. And Jules told King Ronald that she too wants to go on an adventure and find a helper that she can love as much as her uncle. King Ronald sighed and called Charlie making her look scared. Then King Ronald told her that she will take care of the paperwork, making her look shocked and cry. King Ronald told Charlene that they have enough would-be demon kings in the world, so dragons are welcome to take care of them. As long as they do not eat the people who give quests, the group will see them as adventurers, making Charlene fall down in shock. Victor laughed to himself, making Kia ask him what was happening. But Victor just laughed like crazy, loud enough that Kia was puzzled. Vancouver also laughed while telling Victor that it was a happy time. But Victor, laughing, told Kia that they are so in trouble and a whole kind of dragons with class levels means that the world doesn't stand a chance. Chocolatine walked closer to him and told him not to be like that because things might change, but it won't be the end of the world, so he should come and they should have fun. She also told him that they are meant to be happy, so he can worry about what will happen later. He sighed with no hope and yelled that he didn't care anymore, so they should drink to forget, and Kia yelled that he was a man after her own heart. On the other hand, while they were happy and talking, Charlene was crying because of so much paperwork, but Kwasan told her that it was okay, and he can help if she wants. Then Charlene talked to Kwasan about the date he offered, making Kwasan look shocked. And so, Vancouver's day of bragging came to an end with memories of Ranger's show, Malphi's good work at the bar, Victor and his friends' drunk times, Charlene and Croissant's love story, and King Ronald laughing at Kia and Kevin's actions. While they are having fun and being happy, Victor sees something in the sky and sees Vancouver flying there. After Vancouver's day of bragging ends, the time of the dragon adventurers began. A moment later, when the sun was about to rise, the dragon started to leave. The green dragon said goodbye to Vancouver and told him that his bragging day was amazing. To which he replied that of course, it was, because it was his. Genie Elisheim told him that it was the best bragging day of the century, and he cannot wait to test his new magical powers. He told Genie Elisheim to just wait for his next bragging day because it would be even better. Blightswap told them that the system's discovery means so much for princess studies, and they could reverse engineer the process of turning ladies into princesses. But Genie Elisheim told his wife that he thinks some of nature's mysteries are best left unanswered, and told him that it was a shame he had to let those three princesses go. Meanwhile, King Ronald, Kevin, the knights, and the princess were heading back to their castle. He told Genie Elisheim that it was not a big deal because he can find new ones. Jolie asked him if she could make her lair nearby because she wants to become a great adventurer like him, and he happily replied, of course. Then he told Jolie that there is a big flying city full of tasty demons that now belongs to him, and he would gladly let her settle there. Then Genie Elisheim and Blightswamp flew away while Jolie happily told him that she would see him soon, to which he told her to come back soon. Suddenly, he was surprised by system pop-ups congratulating him for being recognized as emperor by a powerful head of state, achieving full dominion over Ishvania's monsters, and inspiring newfound respect as a monster lord. Also, he gained a level in Emperor and two levels in Dragon Kaiser. Then he gained Imperial Authority class, which means he reduces the enemy's evasion by 20% in battle, and State Secrecy class, which means the divination magic trying to get information will fail unless the caster has higher charisma than he does. He couldn't understand it and called his minions. Then the rangers, together with Junior, appeared in front of him and asked how they could serve him today. He ordered them to start by cleaning that up and fixing everything. Then by the moon's turn, their capital will have been rebuilt better than before. He asked them where Victor was. Blue replied that he thinks he last saw their chief with a girl. Meanwhile, in Victor's mansion, he felt his head hurt and remembered that he tried to drown yesterday's sadness in alcohol, but he thinks he overdid it. Then he sat up while thinking that he barely even remembers what happened last night. He shakily stared at his side, wondering how he got back to his bed. But then he saw Chocolatine peacefully sleeping at his side, making him shocked. He wondered if they acted under the influence of alcohol, but he noticed that they both had their pajamas on. Still, he couldn't remember anything. But then, he touched someone on his other side and heard a snoring sound. When he looked, he was shocked to see Kia sleeping next to him too, holding a bottle of wine. He jumped out of his bed, panicking and wondering what in Happeland was going on and if they did anything. 
He shivered while looking at the two girls in his bed, telling the gods that he didn't know what to do. Then he remembered Allison telling him that as long as she lives, harems will never be allowed, making him fearfully think that Allison is going to kill him. But then he heard Furubin laughing at him and teasingly asking him if he doesn't remember last night. He panicky asked Furubin what happened, and if he remembers. Furubin replied, of course, I remember. Furubin asked him if he wants to know what happened and if something did. To which he straightaway replied yes and told him to tell him. But Furubin, with other demons, laughingly and teasingly told him that he will never know. He was shocked to hear it and shook Furubin, telling him that he was an evil troll and he should tell him. But Furubin just told him that it was his sweet revenge at last, and he can't wait for the juicy love triangle drama, making him shout in frustration and fear. On the other hand, Vancouver said finally Victor acted, and ordered the rangers that they are in charge while his chief of staff enjoys his only day off of the year, and the rangers happily replied that they live to serve him. Then he ordered Red Ranger to get Charlene to look for new quests because his vaults must overflow with gold again. But Charlene and Quasan were sweetly rebuilding the quest station while Allison carefully and lovingly planted a new life of plants. He ordered Pink Ranger to write a War of the Horde sequel narration of the Moth's defeat and their heroic deeds, and Black Ranger to have corpseling jewels raise the minions who died today as sentient undead. He said, if death will not end Victor's service, then I shall not deny them that pleasure either. On the other hand, Malphi was mad while looking at Meal's Horizon new store and was angrier that someone went to her before him. But Meal just teasingly made a face to tease Malphi, making Malphi explode in anger. Vanker ordered Blue to get the angels and demons to stop feuding because he will welcome both of their coins. Then he ordered Yellow to welcome new minion immigrants who want to become his subjects with Saverus. And lastly, he ordered Junior to patrol his castle and protect his newborn horde. Then he told them that they should make the VNV Empire the greatest in the world and rebuild his golden horde brighter than ever before. To which his minions happily agreed and replied, yes. Meanwhile, somewhere, Lucy reported to Odeus that all of the dragons present at the celebration developed a class of their own. Vancouver had slain Mora, then claimed Ishvania with Gardamagna's blessing. Most of Vancouver's guests followed his example and decided to become adventurers. Mag asked Odeus why didn't she kill the minion chief before the attack, and Lucy replied that it might have blown her cover and she was too busy sabotaging the Hellgate seal. Besides, Dalton's death didn't stick from what she heard. Mag asked Odeus what she had to say about it, and she replied that Vancouver has become an obstacle and the princeling's death is a loss. But the weapon performed beyond her expectations, so she sees the path to victory beyond that disaster, and it will be over Vancouver's corpse. Then Odeus ordered Lucy that she will keep an eye on Victor and that she will require her help in Mel Lintz. The stare of Odeus made Lucy's body flinch in fear. A moment later, Mag asked her daughter Odeus what about her, and if she will visit the other side again. Again. She replied yes and told him that she shall go look for new weapons and tools for their cause in that world called Earth. The next day, on the beach, Vancouver asked where it was because he was told there would be gold, yet he saw nothing but water and sand. Victor told him that they call it the Golden Coast because of the sand's color. Then Victor stabbed his scythe into the sand while Furubin told him that the Mora brat always loved grand titles. Vancouver was pissed and asked Victor why they would call it the Golden Coast if there was no gold to be found, and if they couldn't call it Popper's Bay or the Sand of Homelessness instead. Victor told him that if he wasn't happy with the sight, he had brought sunglasses, then Victor nodded to Red Ranger. Vancouver was surprised to see it and asked what it was and if that glass was made in the heart of the sun. But Victor just told him that it protects his eyes, but he just asked Victor from what it protects his eyes and if it protects his eyes from Icefang's face. Victor nodded while Furubin told him that it was for natural light too, then he wore the heart sunglasses and handsomely asked his minions how he looked while posing from a different angle. The rangers who were his fans replied that he was fabulous and he replied that he knew it, so he should tell him a new flattery. On the other hand, Chocolatine said hello to Victor and sweetly told him that she wanted to know something. Looking at sexy Chocolatine, he blushed in shyness. Chocolatine cleared her throat in shyness and confidently asked him if he was available. But before she could finish her words, Kia smacked Victor back and asked him if he was up for a volleyball match. He looked back and saw sexy Kia holding a volleyball while behind him was Chocolatine who was pissed, and Mancure, who was full of himself. Then the team and match were settled. On the first team, they had Jolie, Junior, Jules, and Kia, who told them that they were recruiting players for a friendly match. And the second team was Rolo, Kwasan, who was being protected by Charlene because of his little sister Chocolatine's anger. Victor noticed that those sides didn't look friendly to him. Then the two girls walked closer to him and asked him together which team he would pick. He fearfully replied that he was not much into volleyball but he would cheer from the sidelines, so fortunately, the two girls walked away disappointed. But then Allison appeared behind him and asked him what did she tell him about harems. He jumped away from her while asking if love triangles count, 
but Allison just told him that perhaps she wasn't clear enough. Then she grabbed his neck and turned it around while telling him to look carefully and telling him that Chocolatine was his future and nothing else. While Victor was being tortured by Allison, Malfi asked Vancure if they could have a moment of his time, but Vancure asked Malfi who was there. Malfi told him that, as he knew, Happeland had been a cornerstone of the Empire's economy since its conception, and it would be perfect if he could let them build a resort in that place, renovate the countryside with bars, casinos, and brothels. But then Neil shoutingly told him that Malfi's fiend wants to despoil that nature reserve and Malfi would replace the sand with cement. But Malfi corrected her that they replaced it with marble, not cement, because they had standards and they kept cement for shoes. But he just told them that he did not have time for minion work, and his friend Victor would deal with it. But Malfi just laughed while opening the case he brought and showed him a lot of shiny diamonds while telling him that a large public donation slipped out of his hand, and it would be a shame if nobody were to pick it up. He panically asked where because he couldn't see anything, but then Saverus jumped towards them while shouting him not to work. Then Saverus snatched the case of diamonds away while telling him that he would launder that public donation for him. But the truth was he seriously couldn't see anything because of his shade while Malfi angrily asked Saverus how dare he steal from Hapalan. But Meal told Saverus that it was alright and his Robin Hood commission would pay for his ticket to heaven. A little moment later, Victor was relaxing on the ground while thinking that it was so good to just rest after so many adventures, and Furibon told him that he wondered what tanned bones looked like. Victor noticed that everyone seemed to have fun too. With one exception, then he saw a pink ranger sitting on a bench, and she noticed him too. He asked her what was up and why she wasn't playing with the others, but she told him that it was silly. Still, he told her that it was okay and he wouldn't judge. Then Pink sadly asked him if he remembered the books she was writing about him in Vancouver, to which he thought, unfortunately, yes. Then she told him that she had a deal with Mimic Printing House for a visual adaptation, and they published the first volume, but it was doubtful the next volume would be adapted. He asked her if it was not making money, and she replied that it was, but it was not as popular as other series. But they were surprised when Vancouver shoutingly asked them and told them that he was a dragon, so humans should line up to worship his image. Victor told Vancouver to forgive his kind for liking themselves too much and that they were terribly ashamed of themselves, to which Vancouver replied that they should be. Then Vancouver asked Pink if she still wrote the books, and she replied yes and explained that Bards also narrated his tales for those who couldn't read. Vancouver told them that his true fans, those with taste, could still read and listen to his next adventures. Also, no picture books could hope to capture his majesty anyway. Victor laughed and told Pink that he still crossed his fingers for a sequel. Then he noticed that Pink was red in shyness and told her not to be bitter if it ended before its time because they had a good- Well guys, that's the end of the video. Hit the bell and like the video. Also subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching and see you next time again.